Genesis Chapter 1 The Beginning In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was on the surface of the deep. God's Spirit was hovering over the surface of the waters. The First Day Light God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw the light and saw that it was good. God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. There was evening and there was morning, one day. The second day, firmament. God said, Let there be an expanse in the middle of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. God made the expanse, and divided the waters which were under the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so. God called the expanse sky. There was evening and there was morning, a second day. The third day, dry ground. God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together to one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. God saw that it was good. God said, Let the earth Put forth grass, herbs yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit after their kind, with its seed in it on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth grass, herbs yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with its seed in it after their kind. And God saw that it was good. There was evening, and there was morning, a third day. The fourth day, sun, moon, stars. God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of sky to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days, and years, and let them be for lights in the expanse of sky, to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the expanse of sky to give light to the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning, a fourth day. The fifth day, fish and birds. God said, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of sky. God created the large sea creatures, and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarmed after their kind and every winged bird after its kind. God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful 
and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. There was evening, and there was morning, a fifth day. The sixth day, creatures on land. God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, livestock, creeping things, and animals of the earth after their kind. And it was so. God made the animals of the earth after their kind, and the livestock after their kind, and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind. God saw that it was good. God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In God's image, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them. God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God said, Behold, I have given you every herb yielding seed, which is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which bears fruit yielding seed. It will be your food. To every animal of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that creeps on the earth, in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and, behold, it was very good. There was evening, and there was morning, a sixth day. Chapter 2 The Seventh Day God Rests The heavens and the earth were finished, and all their vast array. On the seventh day God finished his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because he rested in it from all his work which he had created and made. The Creation of Man This is the history of the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created, in the day that Yahweh God made the earth and the heavens. No plant of the field was yet in the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for Yahweh God had not caused it to rain on the earth. There was not a man to till the ground, but a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Yahweh God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. The Planting of the Garden Yahweh God planted a garden eastward, in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground Yahweh God made every tree to grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the middle of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it was parted, and became four heads. The name of the first is Pishon. This is the one which flows through the whole land of Havilah, 
where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. There is aromatic resin and the onyx stone. The name of the second river is Gihon, the same river that flows through the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Hittakel. This is the one which flows in front of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates. The Forbidden Fruit Yahweh God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Yahweh God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Adam names the animals. Yahweh God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground, Yahweh God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock, and to the birds of the sky, and to every animal of the field. But for man there was not found a helper suitable for him. The Creation of Woman Yahweh God caused a deep sleep to fall on the man. And he slept, and he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh in its place. He made the rib, which Yahweh God had taken from the man, into a woman, and brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man will leave his father and his mother and will join with his wife, and they will be one flesh. They were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Chapter 3 The Serpent's Deception now the serpent was more subtle than any animal of the field which Yahweh God had made. He said to the woman, Has God really said you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, Of the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it lest you die. The serpent said to the woman, You won't surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she gave some to her husband with her, and he ate. The eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. God arraigns Adam and Eve. They heard the voice of Yahweh God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh God among the trees of the garden. Yahweh God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? The man said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. God said, Who told you that you were naked? 
Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. Yahweh God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Yahweh God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed above all livestock and above every animal of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He will bruise your head, and you will bruise his heel. The Punishment of Mankind To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, Because you have listened to your wife's voice, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns also and thistles will it bring forth to you, and you will eat the herb of the field. By the sweat of your face will you eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife Eve, because she was the mother of all living. The Expulsion from Paradise Yahweh God made coats of skins for Adam and for his wife, and clothed them. Yahweh God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now, lest he put forth his hand and also take of the tree of life, and eat and live forever. Therefore, Yahweh God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubs at the east of the Garden of Eden, and the flame of his sword, which turned every way, to guard the way to the tree of life. Chapter 4 Cain and Abel the man knew Eve, his wife. She conceived and gave birth to Cain, and said, I have gotten a man with Yahweh's help. Again she gave birth to Cain's brother, Abel. Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. As time passed, it happened that Cain brought an offering to Yahweh from the fruit of the ground. Abel also brought some of the firstborn of his flock and of its fat. Yahweh respected Abel and his offering, but he didn't respect Cain and his offering. Cain was very angry, and the expression on his face fell. Yahweh said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why has the expression of your face fallen? If you do well, Will it not be lifted up? If you don't do well, sin crouches at the door. Its desire is for you, but you are to rule over it. Cain murders Abel. Cain said to Abel, his brother, Let's go into the field. It happened when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Yahweh said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? He said, I don't know. 
Am I my brother's keeper? Yahweh said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries to me from the ground. Now you are cursed because of the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. From now on, when you till the ground, it won't yield its strength to you. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer in the earth. Cain said to Yahweh, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me out this day from the surface of the ground. I will be hidden from your face, and I will be a fugitive and a wanderer in the earth. It will happen that whoever finds me will kill me. Yahweh said to him, Therefore, whoever slays Cain, Vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. Yahweh appointed a sign for Cain, lest any finding him should strike him. Cain went out from Yahweh's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. The Descendants of Cain Cain knew his wife. She conceived and gave birth to Enoch. He built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad. Irad became the father of Mehujael. Mehujael became the father of Methusael. Methusael became the father of Lamech. Lamech took two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other Zilla. Ada gave birth to Jabal, who was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal, who was the father of all who handled the harp and pipe. Zilla also gave birth to Tubal Cain, the forger of every cutting instrument of brass and iron. Tubal Cain's sister was Naamah. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to my speech, for I have slain a man for wounding me, a young man for bruising me. If Cain will be avenged seven times, truly Lamech seventy-seven times. Seth and Enosh Adam knew his wife again. She gave birth to a son and named him Seth. For God has appointed me another child instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. There was also born a son to Seth, and he named him Enosh. Then men began to call on Yahweh's name. Chapter 5 the Descendants of Adam This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in God's likeness. He created them, male and female, and blessed them, and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. Adam lived 130 years and became the father of a son in his own likeness, after his image, and named him Seth. The days of Adam after he became the father of Seth were eight hundred years, and he became the father of sons and daughters. All the days that Adam lived were nine hundred thirty years, then he died. Seth lived one hundred five years, and became the father of Enosh, Seth lived, after he became the father of Enosh, 807 years, and became the father of sons and daughters. All the days of Seth were 912 years, then he died. Enosh lived 90 years, and became the father of Kenan. Enosh lived, after he became the father of Kenan, 
815 years and became the father of sons and daughters. All the days of Enosh were 905 years. Then he died. Kenan lived 70 years and became the father of Mahalalil. Kenan lived, after he became the father of Mahalalil, 840 years and became the father of sons and daughters. And all the days of Kenan were 910 years. Then he died. Mahalalil lived 65 years and became the father of Jared. Mahalalil lived, after he became the father of Jared, 830 years and became the father of sons and daughters. All the days of Mahalalil were 895 years. Then he died. God takes up Enoch. Jared lived 162 years and became the father of Enoch. Jared lived, after he became the father of Enoch, 800 years and became the father of sons and daughters. All the days of Jared were 962 years. Then he died. Enoch lived 65 years and became the father of Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he became the father of Methuselah 300 years and became the father of sons and daughters. All the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. From Methuselah to Noah Methuselah lived 187 years and became the father of Lamech. Methuselah lived, after he became the father of Lamech, 782 years and became the father of sons and daughters. All the days of Methuselah were 969 years. Then he died. Lamech lived 182 years and became the father of his son. And he named him Noah, saying, This same will comfort us in our work and in the toil of our hands because of the ground which Yahweh has cursed. Lamech lived after he became the father of Noah 595 years and became the father of sons and daughters. All the days of Lamech were 777 years. Then he died. Noah was 500 years old, and Noah became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Chapter 6 The Wickedness of Man It happened when men began to multiply on the surface of the ground and daughters were born to them, that God's sons saw that men's daughters were beautiful, and they took for themselves wives of all that they chose. Yahweh said, My spirit will not strive with men forever, because he also is flesh. Yet will his days be one hundred twenty years. The Nephilim were in the earth in those days, and also after that when God's sons came in to men's daughters. They bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Yahweh saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Yahweh was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him in his heart. Yahweh said, I will destroy man, whom I have created, from the surface of the ground, man, along with animals, creeping things, and birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. Noah's Favor with God But Noah found favor in Yahweh's eyes. 
This is the history of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time. Noah walked with God. Noah became the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. God saw the earth and saw that it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. Noah builds the ark. God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make a ship of gopher wood. You shall make rooms in the ship, and shall seal it inside and outside with pitch. This is how you shall make it. The length of the ship will be three hundred cubits, its breadth, fifty cubits, and its height, thirty cubits. You shall make a roof in the ship, and you shall finish it to a cubit upward. You shall set the door of the ship in its side. You shall make it with lower, second, and third levels. I, even I, do bring the flood of waters on this earth to destroy all flesh having the breath of life from under the sky. Everything that is in the earth will die, but I will establish my covenant with you. You shall come into the ship, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. Of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ship, to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds after their kind, of the livestock after their kind, of every creeping thing of the ground after its kind, two of every sort shall come to you to keep them alive. Take with you of all food that is eaten, and gather it to yourself and it will be for food for you and for them. Thus Noah did. According to all that God commanded him, so he did. Chapter 7 Entering the Ark Yahweh said to Noah, Come with all of your household into the ship. For I have seen your righteousness before me in this generation. You shall take seven pairs of every clean animal with you, the male and his female. Of the animals that are not clean, take two, the male and his female. Also of the birds of the sky, seven and seven, male and female to keep seed alive on the surface of all the earth. In seven days I will cause it to rain on the earth for forty days and forty nights. Every living thing that I have made I will destroy from the surface of the ground. Noah did everything that Yahweh commanded him. The flood waters arrive. Noah was six hundred years old when the flood of waters came on the earth. Noah went into the ship with his sons, his wife, and his sons' wives because of the waters of the flood. Clean animals, animals that are not clean, birds, and everything that creeps on the ground went by pairs to Noah into the ship, male and female, as God commanded Noah. It happened after the seven days that the waters of the flood came on the earth. In the six hundredth year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the seventeenth day of the month, on the same day, all the fountains of the great deep were burst open, and the sky's windows were opened. The rain was on the earth forty days and forty nights. In the same day, 
Noah and Shem, Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them, entered into the ship, they and every animal after its kind, all the livestock after their kind, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, and every bird after its kind, every bird of every sort. They went to Noah into the ship, by pairs of all flesh with the breath of life in them. Those who went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God commanded him, and Yahweh shut him in. The Duration of the Flood The flood was forty days on the earth. The waters increased and lifted up the ship, and it was lifted up above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ship floated on the surface of the waters. The waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth. All the high mountains that were under the whole sky were covered. The waters prevailed fifteen cubits upward, and the mountains were covered. All flesh died that moved on the earth, including birds, livestock, animals, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, of all that was on the dry land, died. Every living thing was destroyed that was on the surface of the ground, including man, livestock, creeping things, and birds of the sky. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah was left, and those who were with him in the ship. The waters prevailed on the earth one hundred fifty days. Chapter 8 The Ark Rests on Ararat God remembered Noah all the animals, and all the livestock that were with him in the ship. And God made a wind to pass over the earth. The waters subsided. The deeps, fountains, and the sky's windows were also stopped, and the rain from the sky was restrained. The waters receded from the earth continually. After the end of 150 days, the waters decreased. The ship rested in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, on Ararat's mountains. The waters receded continually until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. Noah sends a raven and a dove. It happened at the end of forty days that Noah opened the window of the ship which he had made, and he sent forth a raven. It went back and forth until the waters were dried up from the earth. He sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from the surface of the ground. But the dove found no place to rest her foot, and she returned to him into the ship, for the waters were on the surface of the whole earth. He put forth his hand, and took her, and brought her to him into the ship. He stayed yet another seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ship. The dove came back to him at evening, and, behold, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from the earth. He stayed yet another seven days and sent forth the dove, and she didn't return to him any more. Exiting the Ark It happened in the six hundred first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from the earth. Noah removed the covering of the ship and looked. He saw that the surface of the ground was dried, in the second month, on the twenty-seventh day of the month, the earth was dry. 
God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ship, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring forth with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, including birds, livestock, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth, and be fruitful, and multiply on the earth. Noah went forth with his sons, his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every animal, every creeping thing, and every bird, whatever moves on the earth after their families, went out of the ship. Noah Builds an Altar Noah built an altar to Yahweh, and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Yahweh smelled the pleasant aroma. Yahweh said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake because the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike everything living as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Chapter 9 the covenant of the rainbow god blessed noah and his sons and said to them be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth the fear of you and the dread of you will be on every animal of the earth and on every bird of the sky everything that the ground teems with and all the fish of the sea are delivered into your hand. Every moving thing that lives will be food for you. As the green herb, I have given everything to you. But flesh with its life, its blood, you shall not eat. I will surely require your blood of your lives. At the hand of every animal, I will require it at the hand of man, even at the hand of every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, his blood will be shed by man. For God made man in his own image. Be fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply in it. God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, As for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you, and with your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every animal of the earth with you, of all that go out of the ship, even every animal of the earth, I will establish my covenant with you. All flesh will not be cut off any more by the waters of the flood. Neither will there ever again be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it will be for a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. It will happen, when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the rainbow will be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters will no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow will be in the cloud. I will look at it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God 
and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Noah's Sons The sons of Noah who went forth from the ship were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham is the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. Noah's Shame and Canaan's Curse Noah began to be a farmer and planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and got drunk. He was uncovered within his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it on both their shoulders, went in backwards and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were backwards, and they didn't see their father's nakedness. Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him. He said, Canaan is cursed. He will be servant of servants to his brothers. Shem's Blessing and Noah's Death He said, Blessed be Yahweh, the God of Shem. Let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth. Let him dwell in the tents of Shem. Let Canaan be his servant. Noah lived 350 years after the flood. All the days of Noah were 950 years. Then he died. Chapter 10 The Japhethites This is the history of the generations of the sons of Noah and of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tyrus. The sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Riphath, and Togarma. The sons of Javan, Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. Of these were the islands of the nations divided in their lands everyone after his language, after their families, in their nations. The Hamites The sons of Ham Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan The sons of Cush Seba, Havilah, Sapta, Reama and Sapteca, the sons of Reama, Sheba, and Dedan. Cush became the father of Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before Yahweh. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before Yahweh. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalneh, in the land of Shinar. Out of that land he went forth into Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth Ur, Kala, and Rezin, between Nineveh and Kala. The same is the great city. Mizraim became the father of Ludim, Anamim, Lehabim, Naphtuim, Pathrusim, Kazlahim, which the Philistines descended from, and Kaphtorim.
Canaan became the father of Sidon, his firstborn. Heth, the Jebusite, the Amorite, the Girgashite, the Hivite, the Archite, the Sinite, the Arvadite, the Zimmerite, and the Hamathite. Afterward, the families of the Canaanites were spread abroad. The border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as you go toward Gerar to Gaza, as you go toward Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboim to Lasha. These are the sons of Ham, after their families, after their languages, in their lands, in their nations. The Semites. To Shem, the father of all the children of Eber, the elder brother of Japheth, to him also were children born, the sons of Shem, Elam, Asher, Arpachshad, Lud, and Aram, the sons of Aram, Uz, Hul, Gether, and Mash. Arpachshad became the father of Shelah. Shelah became the father of Eber. To Eber were born two sons. The name of the one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided. His brother's name was Joktan. Joktan became the father of Almodad, Sheleph, Hazarmavith, Jira, Hadorim, Uzal, Dikla, Obal, Abimael, Sheba, Ophir, Havilah, and Jobab. All these were the sons of Joktan. Their dwelling was from Mesha, as you go toward Sephar, the mountain of the east. These are the sons of Shem, after their families, after their languages, in their lands, after their nations. These are the families of the sons of Noah, after their generations, in their nations. Of these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. Chapter 11 the Tower of Babel. The whole earth was of one language and of one speech. It happened, as they traveled east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they lived there. They said one to another, Come, let's make bricks and burn them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they used tar for mortar. They said, Come, let's build ourselves a city and a tower whose top reaches to the sky, and let's make ourselves a name, lest we be scattered abroad on the surface of the whole earth. Yahweh came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built. Yahweh said, Behold, they are one people and they have all one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing will be withheld from them, which they intend to do. Come, let's go down, and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So Yahweh scattered them abroad from there, on the surface of all the earth. They stopped building the city, Therefore its name was called Babel, because there Yahweh confused the language of all the earth. From there Yahweh scattered them abroad on the surface of all the earth. Genealogy from Shem to Abram This is the history of the generations of Shem. Shem was 100 years old, 
and became the father of Arpachshad two years after the flood. Shem lived five hundred years after he became the father of Arpachshad and became the father of sons and daughters. Arpachshad lived thirty-five years and became the father of Shelah. Arpachshad lived four hundred three years after he became the father of Shelah and became the father of sons and daughters. Shelah lived thirty years and became the father of Eber. And Shelah lived four hundred three years after he became the father of Eber and became the father of sons and daughters. Eber lived thirty-four years and became the father of Peleg. Eber lived four hundred thirty years after he became the father of Peleg and became the father of sons and daughters. Peleg lived thirty years and became the father of Ru. Peleg lived two hundred nine years after he became the father of Ru and became the father of sons and daughters. Ru lived thirty-two years and became the father of Serug. Ru lived two hundred seven years after he became the father of Serug and became the father of sons and daughters. Serug lived thirty years and became the father of Nahor. Serug lived two hundred years after he became the father of Nahor and became the father of sons and daughters. Nahor lived twenty-nine years and became the father of Terah. Nahor lived one hundred nineteen years after he became the father of Terah and became the father of sons and daughters. Terah lived seventy years and became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Terah's Descendants Now this is the history of the generations of Terah. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran became the father of Lot. Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his birth, in Ur of the Chaldees. Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, who was also the father of Iscah. Sarai was barren. She had no child. Terah took Abram his son, Lot the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. They went forth from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. They came to Haran and lived there. The days of Terah were two hundred five years. Terah died in Haran. Chapter 12 The Calling of Abram Now Yahweh said to Abram, Get out of your country, and from your relatives, and from your father's house, to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. All of the families of the earth will be blessed in you. So Abram went, as Yahweh had spoken to him. Lot went with him. Abram was seventy-five years old when he departed out of Haran. Abram took Sarah his wife, Lot his brother's son, all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls whom they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. Into the land of Canaan they came. Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. The Canaanite was then in the land. 
Yahweh appeared to Abram and said, I will give this land to your seed. He built an altar there to Yahweh, who appeared to him. He left from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west, and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to Yahweh, and called on the name of Yahweh. Abram traveled, going on still toward the south. Abram and Sarai in Egypt There was a famine in the land. Abram went down into Egypt to live as a foreigner there, for the famine was severe in the land. It happened, when he had come near to enter Egypt, that he said to Sarai his wife, See now, I know that you are a beautiful woman to look at. It will happen, when the Egyptians will see you, that they will say, This is his wife. They will kill me, but they will save you alive. Please, say that you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and that my soul may live because of you. It happened that, when Abram had come into Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. The princes of Pharaoh saw her, and praised her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. He dealt well with Abram for her sake. He had sheep cattle, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. Yahweh plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that you have done to me? Why didn't you tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say, She is my sister? so that I took her to be my wife. Now, therefore, see your wife, take her, and go your way. Pharaoh commanded men concerning him, and they brought him on the way with his wife and all that he had. Chapter 13 Abram and Lot Part Ways Abram went up out of Egypt. He his wife, all that he had, and Lot with him, into the south. Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. He went on his journeys from the south, even to Bethel, to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first. There Abram called on the name of Yahweh. Lot also, who went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. The land was not able to bear them, that they might live together, for their substance was great, so that they could not live together. There was a strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock and the Canaanite and the Perizzite lived in the land at that time. Abram said to Lot, Please, let there be no strife between me and you, and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are relatives. Isn't the whole land before you? Please, separate yourself from me. If you go to the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if you go to the right hand, then I will go to the left. Lot pitches toward Sodom. Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the plain of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, before Yahweh destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of Yahweh, like the land of Egypt, as you go to Zoar. So Lot chose the plain of the Jordan for himself. Lot traveled east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, and Lot lived in the cities of the plain, and moved his tent as far as Sodom. 
Now the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinners against Yahweh. God renews the promise to Abram. Yahweh said to Abram, after Lot was separated from him, Now, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which you see, I will give to you and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then your seed may also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in its length and in its breadth, for I will give it to you. Abram moved his tent and came and lived by the oaks of Mamre, which are in Hebron and built an altar there to Yahweh. End of section one. Chapter 14 The War of the Kings It happened in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Elisar, Kederleomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goyim, that they made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, and Shemeber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, the same is Zoar. All these joined together in the valley of Siddim, the same as the Salt Sea. Twelve years they served Kedoleomer, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year Kedoleomer came, and the kings who were with him, and struck the Rephaim in ashtaroth Kernaim, and the Zuzim in Ham, and the Emim, in Sheva Cariathaim, and the Horites in their Mount Seir, to El Paran, which is by the wilderness. They returned and came to En Mishpat, the same is Kadesh, and struck all the country of the Amalekites, and also the Amorites, that lived in Hazazon Tamar. The king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Adma and the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, the same is Zoar, went out, and they set the battle in array against them in the valley of Siddim, against Kedoleomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goyim, and Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Elisar, four kings against the five. Lot seized by the four kings. Now the valley of Siddim was full of tar pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, and they fell there, and those who remained fled to the hills. They took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, and all their food, and went their way. They took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who lived in Sodom, and his goods, and departed. Abram rescues Lot. One who had escaped came and told Abram, the Hebrew. Now he lived by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol, and brother of Honor, and these were allies of Abram. When Abram heard that his relative was taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, three hundred and eighteen, and pursued as far as Dan. He divided himself against them by night, he and his servants, and struck them, and pursued them to Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. He brought back all the goods, and also brought back his relative, Lot, and his goods, and the women also and the people. 
Melchizedek blesses Abram. The king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Keterleomer and the kings who were with him at the valley of Shave, that is, the king's valley. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, and he was priest of God Most High. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Abram gave him a tenth of all. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and take the goods to yourself. Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand to Yahweh, God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread, nor a sandal strap, nor anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. I will accept nothing from you, except that which the young men have eaten, and the portion of the men who went with me, Edner, Eshkol, and Mamre. Let them take their portion. Chapter 15 God's Covenant with Abram After these things, the word of Yahweh came to Abram in a vision, saying, Don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield your exceedingly great reward. Abram said, Lord Yahweh, what will you give me, since I go childless, and he who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? Abram said, Behold, to me you have given no seed, and behold, one born in my house is my heir. Behold, the word of Yahweh came to him, saying, This man will not be your heir, but he who will come forth out of your own body will be your heir. Yahweh brought him outside and said, Look now toward the sky and count the stars, if you are able to count them. He said to Abram, So shall your seed be. He believed in Yahweh, and he reckoned it to him for righteousness. He said to him, I am Yahweh who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to inherit it. God confirms his promise. He said, Lord Yahweh, how will I know that I will inherit it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat, three years old, a ram, three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He brought him all of these, and divided them in the middle, and laid each half opposite the other, but he didn't divide the birds. The birds of prey came down on the carcasses, and Abram drove them away. When the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. Now terror and great darkness fell on him. He said to Abram, Know for sure that your seed will live as foreigners in a land that is not theirs and will serve them. They will afflict them four hundred years. I will also judge that nation whom they will serve. Afterward, they will come out with great wealth, but you will go to your fathers in peace. You will be buried in a good old age. In the fourth generation, they will come here again, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet full. It came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. In that day Yahweh made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your seed I have given this land, from the river of Egypt 
to the great river, the river Euphrates. The Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Chapter 16 Sarah, Hagar, and Ishmael Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bore him no children. She had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. Sarai said to Abram, See now, Yahweh has restrained me from bearing. Please go into my handmaid. It may be that I will obtain children by her. Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her handmaid, after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to Abram, her husband, to be his wife. He went in to Hagar, and she conceived. When she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. Sarai said to Abram, This wrong is your fault. I gave my handmaid into your bosom, and when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. Yahweh judge between me and you. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your maid is in your hand. Do to her whatever is good in your eyes. Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her face. The angel of Yahweh found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. He said, Hagar, Sarai's handmaid, where did you come from? Where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from the face of my mistress, Sarai. The angel of Yahweh said to her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hands. The angel of Yahweh said to her, I will greatly multiply your seed, that they will not be numbered for multitude. The angel of Yahweh said to her, Behold, you are with child and will bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because Yahweh has heard your affliction. He will be like a wild donkey among men. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. He will live opposite all of his brothers. She called the name of Yahweh who spoke to her, you are a God who sees. For she said, Have I even stayed alive after seeing him? Therefore the well was called Ba'er Lahairoi. Behold, it is between Kedesh and Bereth. Hagar bore a son for Abram. Abram called the name of his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was eighty-six years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. Chapter 17 Abram Named Abraham When Abram was ninety-nine years old, Yahweh appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will make my covenant between me and you, and will multiply you exceedingly. Abram fell on his face. God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you. You will be the father of a multitude of nations. Neither will your name any more be called Abram, but your name will be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, 
and I will make nations of you. Kings will come out of you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your seed after you, throughout their generations, for an everlasting covenant, to be a God to you, and to your seed after you. I will give to you, and to your seed after you, the land where you are traveling, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. I will be their God. The Covenant of Circumcision God said to Abraham, As for you, you will keep my covenant you and your seed after you, throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep, between me and you, and your seed after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin. It will be a token of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old will be circumcised among you, every male throughout your generations. He who is born in the house or bought with money from any foreigner who is not of your seed, he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money must be circumcised. My covenant will be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. The uncircumcised male, who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. God said to Abraham, As for Sarai your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but her name will be Sarah. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. Yes, I will bless her, and she will be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face, and laughed, and said in his heart, Will a child be born to him who is one hundred years old? Will Sarah, who is ninety years old, give birth? Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God said, No, but Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son. You shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his seed after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him, and will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. He will become the father of twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this set time next year. When he finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Abraham took Ishmael, his son, all who were born in his house, and all who were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in the same day as God had said to him. Abraham was ninety-nine years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. Ishmael, his son, was thirteen years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. In the same day, both Abraham and Ishmael, his son, were circumcised. All the men of his house, those born in the house, and those bought with money of a foreigner were circumcised with him. Chapter 18 
Abraham's Celestial Visitors Yahweh appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and saw that three men stood opposite him. When he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door, and bowed himself to the earth, and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in your sight, please don't go away from your servant. Now let a little water be fetched, wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. I will get a morsel of bread, so you can refresh your heart. After that you may go your way, now that you have come to your servant. They said, Very well, do as you have said. Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah, and said, Quickly, prepare three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd, and fetched a tender and good calf, and gave it to the servant. He hurried to dress it. He took butter, milk, and the calf which he had dressed, and set it before them. He stood by them under the tree, and they ate. Sarah laughs at the promise. They asked him, Where is Sarah, your wife? He said, See, in the tent. He said, I will certainly return to you when the season comes round. Behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Sarah heard in the tent door, which was behind him, now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age. Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, will I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? Yahweh said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Will I really bear a child, yet I am old? Is anything too hard for Yahweh? At this set time, I will return to you, when the season comes round, and Sarah will have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I didn't laugh, for she was afraid. He said, No, but you did laugh. Abraham begs for Sodom. The men rose up from there and looked toward Sodom. Abraham went with them to see them on their way. Yahweh said, Will I hide from Abraham what I do, since Abraham has surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed in him? For I have known him, to the end that he may command his children and his household after him that they may keep the way of Yahweh, to do righteousness and justice, to the end that Yahweh may bring on Abraham that which he has spoken of him. Yahweh said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether their deeds are as bad as the reports which have come to me. If not, I will know. The men turned from there and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before Yahweh. Abraham drew near and said, Will you consume the righteous with the wicked? What if there are fifty righteous within the city? Will you consume and not spare the place for the fifty righteous who are in it? Be it far from you to do things like that to kill the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be like the wicked. May that be far from you. Shouldn't the judge of all the earth do right? Yahweh said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sake. Abraham answered, See now, I have taken it on myself to speak to the Lord. Who am I but dust and ashes? What if there will lack five of the fifty righteous? Will you destroy all the city for lack of five? He said, I will not destroy it, 
if I find 45 there. He spoke to him yet again and said, What if there are 40 found there? He said, I will not do it for the 40's sake. He said, Oh, don't let the Lord be angry, and I will speak. What if there are 30 found there? He said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. He said, See now, I have taken it on myself to speak to the Lord. What if there are 20 found there? He said, I will not destroy it for the 20's sake. He said, Oh, don't let the Lord be angry, and I will speak just once more. What if ten are found there? He said, I will not destroy it for the ten's sake. Yahweh went his way as soon as he had finished communing with Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. Chapter 19 Lot welcomes the angels. The two angels came to Sodom at evening. Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. Lot saw them and rose up to meet them. He bowed himself with his face to the earth, and he said, See now, my lords, please turn aside into your servant's house. Stay all night, wash your feet, and you can rise up early and go on your way. They said, No, but we will stay in the street all night. He urged them greatly, and they came in with him and entered into his house. He made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, surrounded the house, both young and old, all the people from every quarter, they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came in to you this night? Bring them out to us, that we may have sex with them. Lot went out to them to the door and shut the door after him. He said, Please, my brothers, don't act so wickedly. See now, I have two virgin daughters. Please, let me bring them out to you, and you may do to them what seems good to you. Only don't do anything to these men, because they have come under the shadow of my roof. They said, Stand back. Then they said, This one fellow came in to live as a foreigner, and he appoints himself a judge. Now will we deal worse with you than with them? They pressed hard on the man Lot, and drew near to break the door. But the men put forth their hand, and brought Lot into the house to them and shut the door. They struck the men who were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. Lot flees to Zoar. The men said to Lot, Do you have anybody else here? Sons-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whoever you have in the city, bring them out of the place for we will destroy this place, because the outcry against them has grown great before Yahweh, that Yahweh has sent us to destroy it. Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who were pledged to marry his daughters, and said, Get up, get out of this place, for Yahweh will destroy the city. But he seemed to his sons-in-law to be joking. When the morning came, then the angels hurried Lot, saying, Get up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the iniquity of the city. But he lingered, and the men grabbed his hand, his wife's hand, and his two daughters' hands, Yahweh being merciful to him. And they took him out and set him outside of the city. It came to pass, when they had taken them out, that he said, Escape for your life. Don't look behind you. And don't stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be consumed. Lot said to them, Oh, not so, my lord. See now, your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have magnified your loving kindness, which you have shown to me in saving my life. 
I can't escape to the mountain, lest evil overtake me and I die. See now, this city is near to flee to, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape there. Isn't it a little one? And my soul will live. He said to him, Behold, I have granted your request concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow the city of which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I can't do anything until you get there. Therefore the name of the city was called Zoar. The sun had risen on the earth when Lot came to Zoar. The Destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah Then Yahweh rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from Yahweh out of the sky. He overthrew those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and that which grew on the ground. Lot's wife looks back. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he had stood before Yahweh. He looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah, and toward all the land of the plain, and looked and saw that the smoke of the land went up as the smoke of a furnace. It happened when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the middle of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot lived. Lot and his daughters Lot went up out of Zoar and lived in the mountain, and his two daughters with him, for he was afraid to live in Zoar. He lived in a cave with his two daughters. The firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come in to us in the way of all the earth. Come, let's make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve our father's seed. They made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father. He didn't know when she lay down nor when she arose. It came to pass on the next day that the firstborn said to the younger, Behold, I lay last night with my father. Let us make him drink wine again tonight. You go in and lie with him, that we may preserve our father's seed. They made their father drink wine that night also. The younger went and lay with him. He didn't know when she lay down, nor when she got up. Thus both of Lot's daughters were with child by their father. The firstborn bore a son, and named him Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. The younger also bore a son, and called his name Benami. He is the father of the children of Ammon to this day. Chapter 20 Abraham, Sarah, and Abimelech Abraham traveled from there toward the land of the south and lived between Kedesh and Shur. He lived as a foreigner in Gerar. Abraham said about Sarah, his wife, She is my sister. Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream of the night, and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man, because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. Now Abimelech had not come near her. He said, Lord, will you kill even a righteous nation? Didn't he tell me, she is my sister? She, even she herself, said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hands have I done this. God said to him in the dream, Yes, I know that in the integrity of your heart you have done this, and I also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I didn't allow you to touch her. Now, therefore, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you will live. If you don't restore her, 
know for sure that you will die, you and all who are yours. Abimelech rose early in the morning, and called all his servants, and told all these things in their ear. The men were very scared. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? How have I sinned against you that you have brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? You have done deeds to me that ought not to be done. Abimelech said to Abraham, What did you see that you have done this thing? Abraham said, Because I thought, Surely the fear of God is not in this place. They will kill me for my wife's sake. Besides, she is indeed my sister, the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. It happened, when God caused me to wander from my father's house, that I said to her, This is your kindness which you shall show to me. Everywhere that we go, say of me, He is my brother. Abimelech took sheep and cattle, male servants and female servants, and gave them to Abraham, and restored Sarah his wife to him. Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. To Sarah he said, Behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, it is for you a covering of the eyes to all that are with you. In front of all, you are vindicated. Abraham prayed to God. God healed Abimelech and his wife and his female servants, and they bore children. For Yahweh had closed up tight all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Chapter 21 The Birth of Isaac Yahweh visited Sarah as he had said, and Yahweh did to Sarah as he had spoken. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at this set time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was one hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has made me laugh. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. She said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? for I have borne him a son in his old age. The child grew and was weaned. Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. Sarah turns against Hagar. Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, mocking. Therefore she said to Abraham, Cast out this handmaid and her son, for the son of this handmaid will not be heir with my son, Isaac. The thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight on account of his son. God said to Abraham, Don't let it be grievous in your sight because of the boy and because of your handmaid. In all that Sarah says to you, Listen to her voice, for from Isaac will your seed be called. I will also make a nation of the son of the handmaid, because he is your seed. Abraham rose up early in the morning, and took bread and a bottle of water, and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder, and gave her the child, and sent her away. She departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. The water in the bottle was spent, and she cast the child under one of the shrubs. She went and sat down opposite him, a good way off, about a bowshot away. For she said, Don't let me see the death of the child. She sat over against him, and lifted up her voice, and wept. 
God heard the voice of the boy. The angel of God called to Hagar out of the sky and said to her, What ails you, Hagar? Don't be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Get up, lift up the boy, and hold him in your hand, for I will make him a great nation. God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went, filled the bottle with water, and gave the boy drink. God was with the boy, and he grew. He lived in the wilderness, and became, as he grew up, an archer. He lived in the wilderness of Paran. His mother took a wife for him out of the land of Egypt. THE COVENANT AT Beersheba. It happened at that time that Abimelech and Phicol, the captain of his army, spoke to Abraham, saying, God is with you in all that you do. Now, therefore, swear to me, here by God, that you will not deal falsely with me, nor with my son, nor with my son's son, but according to the kindness that I have done to you, you shall do to me, and to the land in which you have lived as a foreigner. Abraham said, I will swear. Abraham complained to Abimelech because of a water well, which Abimelech's servants had violently taken away. Abimelech said, I don't know who has done this thing. Neither did you tell me, neither did I hear of it, until today. Abraham took sheep and cattle and gave them to Abimelech. Those two made a covenant. Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. Abimelech said to Abraham, What do these seven ewe lambs which you have set by themselves mean? He said, You shall take these seven ewe lambs from my hand, that it may be a witness to me that I have dug this well. Therefore he called that place Beersheba, because they both swore there. So they made a covenant at Beersheba. Abimelech rose up with Phicol, the captain of his army, and they returned into the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and called there on the name of Yahweh, the everlasting God. Abraham lived as a foreigner in the land of the Philistines many days. Chapter 22 The Offering of Isaac It happened after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, he said, Here I am. He said, Now take your son, your only son, whom you love, even Isaac, and go into the land of Moriah. Offer him there for a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will tell you of. Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. He split the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place far off. Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go yonder. We will worship and come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. He took in his hand the fire and the knife. They both went together. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Here is the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they both went together. They came to the place which God had told him of. Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order, bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar, 
on the wood. Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to kill his son. The Sacrifice Averted The angel of Yahweh called to him out of the sky and said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, Here I am. He said, Don't lay your hand on the boy, neither do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and saw that behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son. Abraham called the name of that place Yahweh will provide. As it is said to this day, on Yahweh's mountain it will be provided. The angel of Yahweh called to Abraham a second time out of the sky and said, I have sworn by myself, says Yahweh, because you have done this thing, and have not withheld your son, your only son, that I will bless you greatly, and I will multiply your seed greatly, like the stars of the heavens, and like the sand which is on the seashore. Your seed will possess the gate of his enemies. In your seed will all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba. Abraham lived at Beersheba. Nahor's Sons It happened after these things that it was told Abraham, saying, Behold, Milcah, she also has borne children to your brother Nahor, Uz, his firstborn, Buz, his brother, Kimuel, the father of Aram, Kesit, Hazo, Pildash, Jidlaf, and Bethuel. Bethuel became the father of Rebekah. These eight Milcah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother. His concubine, whose name was Ruma, also bore Theba, Gaim, Tahash, and Ma'aka. Chapter 23 The Death and Burial of Sarah Sarah lived 127 years. This was the length of Sarah's life. Sarah died in Kiriath Arbor, the same is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Abraham rose up from before his dead and spoke to the children of Heth, saying, I am a stranger and a foreigner living with you. Give me a possession of a burying place with you, that I may bury my dead out of my sight. The children of Heth answered Abraham, saying to him, Hear us, my lord. You are a prince of God among us. Bury your dead in the best of our tombs. None of us will withhold from you his tomb. Bury your dead. Abraham rose up and bowed himself to the people of the land, even to the children of Heth. He talked with them, saying, If it be your mind that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me to Ephron, the son of Zohar that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he has, which is in the end of his field. For the full price, let him give it to me among you for a possession of a burying place. Now Ephron was sitting in the middle of the children of Heth. Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the hearing of the children of Heth, even of all who went in at the gate of his city, saying, No, my lord, hear me. I give you the field, and I give you the cave that is in it. In the presence of the children of my people, I give it to you. Bury your dead. Abraham bowed himself down before the people of the land. He spoke to Ephron in the audience of the people of the land, saying, 
But if you will, please hear me. I will give the price of the field. Take it from me, and I will bury my dead there. Ephron answered Abraham, saying to him, My Lord, listen to me. What is a piece of land worth four hundred shekels of silver between me and you? Therefore, bury your dead. Abraham listened to Ephron. Abraham weighed to Ephron the silver which he had named in the audience of the children of Heth, four hundred shekels of silver, according to the current merchant's standard. So the field of Ephron, which was in Machpelah, which was before Mamre, the field, the cave which was in it, and all the trees that were in the field, that were in all of its borders, were deeded to Abraham for a possession in the presence of the children of Heth, before all who went in at the gate of his city. After this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah, before Mamre, that is, Hebron, in the land of Canaan. The field and the cave that is in it were deeded to Abraham for a possession of a burying place by the children of Heth. Chapter 24 A Wife for Isaac Abraham was old and well stricken in age. Yahweh had blessed Abraham in all things. Abraham said to his servant, the elder of his house, who ruled over all that he had, Please put your hand under my thigh. I will make you swear by Yahweh, the God of heaven, and the God of the earth, that you shall not take a wife for my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I live. But you shall go to my country and to my relatives and take a wife for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, What if the woman isn't willing to follow me to this land? Must I bring your son again to the land you came from? Abraham said to him, Beware that you don't bring my son there again. Yahweh, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my birth, who spoke to me and who swore to me, saying, I will give this land to your seed. He will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. If the woman isn't willing to follow you, then you shall be clear from this my oath. Only you shall not bring my son there again. The servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. The servant took ten camels of his master's camels and departed, having a variety of good things of his master's with him. He arose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. He made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at the time of evening, the time that women go out to draw water. He said, Yahweh, the God of my master Abraham, please give me success this day and show kindness to my master Abraham. Behold, I am standing by the spring of water. The daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Let it happen that the young lady to whom I will say, Please let down your pitcher that I may drink, and she will say, Drink, and I will also give your camels a drink. Let her be the one you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Rebecca is chosen. It happened, before he had finished speaking, that, behold, Rebekah came out, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, with her pitcher on her shoulder. The young lady was very beautiful to look at, a virgin, neither had any man known her. She went down to the spring, filled her pitcher, and came up. The servant ran to meet her and said, Please, give me a drink, a little water from your pitcher. She said, drink, my lord. She hurried and let down her pitcher on her hand and gave him drink. When she had done giving him drink, she said, I will also draw for your camels 
until they have done drinking. She hurried and emptied her pitcher into the trough, and ran again to the well to draw, and drew for all his camels. The man looked steadfastly at her, remaining silent, to know whether Yahweh had made his journey prosperous or not. It happened, as the camels had done drinking, that the man took a golden ring of half a shekel weight, and two bracelets for her hands of ten shekels weight of gold, and said, Whose daughter are you? Please tell me. Is there room in your father's house for us to lodge in? She said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. She said moreover to him, We have both straw and provender enough, and room to lodge in. The man bowed his head and worshipped Yahweh. He said, Blessed be Yahweh, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his loving kindness and his truth toward my master. As for me, Yahweh has led me in the way to the house of my master's relatives. The young lady ran and told her mother's house about these words. Rebekah had a brother, and his name was Laban. Laban ran out to the man, to the spring. It happened, when he saw the ring and the bracelets on his sister's hands, and when he heard the words of Rebekah, his sister, saying, This is what the man said to me, that he came to the man. Behold, he was standing by the camels at the spring. He said, Come in, you blessed of Yahweh. Why do you stand outside? For I have prepared the house and room for the camels. The man came into the house, and he unloaded the camels. He gave straw and provender for the camels, and water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were with him. Food was set before him to eat, but he said, I will not eat until I have told my message. He said, Speak on. He said, I am Abraham's servant. Yahweh has blessed my master greatly. He has become great. He has given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male servants and female servants, and camels and donkeys. Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old. He has given all that he has to him. My master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife for my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I live, but you shall go to my father's house and to my relatives, and take a wife for my son. I asked my master, What if the woman will not follow me? He said to me, Yahweh, before whom I walk, will send his angel with you, and prosper your way. You shall take a wife for my son of my relatives, and of my father's house. Then will you be clear from my oath, when you come to my relatives. If they don't give her to you, you shall be clear from my oath. I came this day to the spring, and said, Yahweh, the God of my master Abraham, if now you do prosper my way which I go, behold, I am standing by this spring of water. Let it happen that the maiden who comes forth to draw, to whom I will say, Please give me a little water from your pitcher to drink, and she will tell me, Drink, and I will also draw for your camels. Let her be the woman whom Yahweh has appointed for my master's son. Before I had finished speaking in my heart, behold, Rebekah came forth with her pitcher on her shoulder. She went down to the spring and drew. I said to her, Please, give me a drink. She hurried and let down her pitcher from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will also give your camels a drink. So I drank, and she also gave the camels a drink. I asked her, and said, Whose daughter are you? She said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore to him. I put the ring on her nose, and the bracelets on her hands. I bowed my head, and worshipped Yahweh, and blessed Yahweh, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me in the right way to take my master's brother's daughter for his son. Now, if you will deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me. If not, tell me, that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. Then Laban and Bethuel answered, The thing proceeds from Yahweh. 
we can't speak to you bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before you. Take her and go, and let her be your master's son's wife, as Yahweh has spoken. It happened that when Abraham's servant heard their words, he bowed himself down to the earth to Yahweh. The servant brought forth jewels of silver and jewels of gold and clothing and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave precious things to her brother and her mother. They ate and drank, he and the men who were with him, and stayed all night. They rose up in the morning, and he said, Send me away to my master. Her brother and her mother said, Let the young lady stay with us a few days, at least ten. After that she will go. He said to them, Don't hinder me, since Yahweh has prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. They said, We will call the young lady and ask her. They called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? She said, I will go. They sent away Rebekah, their sister, with her nurse, Abraham's servant, and his men. They blessed Rebekah and said to her, Our sister, may you be the mother of thousands of ten thousands, and let your seed possess the gate of those who hate them. Rebekah arose with her ladies. They rode on the camels and followed the man. The servant took Rebekah and went his way. Isaac marries Rebekah. Isaac came from the way of Barlah Hiroi, for he lived in the land of the south. Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the evening. He lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, there were camels coming. Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel. She said to the servant, Who is the man who is walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. She took her veil and covered herself. The servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah, and she became his wife. He loved her. Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Chapter 25 Abraham and Keturah Abraham took another wife, and her name was Keturah. She bore him Zimran, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshan became the father of Sheba and Dedan. The sons of Dedan were Ashurim, Letushim, and Leomim. The sons of Midian, Ephah, Epher, Hanak, Abida, and Eldaah. All these were the children of Keturah. Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac. But to the sons of Abraham's concubines, Abraham gave gifts. He sent them away from Isaac, his son, while he yet lived, eastward to the east country. The Death of Abraham These are the days of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived, 175 years. Abraham gave up the spirit and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. Isaac and Ishmael, his sons, buried him in the cave of Machpelah, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hittite, which is before Mamre, the field which Abraham purchased of the children of Heth. Abraham was buried there with Sarah, his wife. It happened after the death of Abraham that God blessed Isaac, his son. Isaac lived by Bayerlah Hiroi. The Descendants of Ishmael Now this is the history of the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's handmaid, bore to Abraham. These are the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names, 
according to the order of their birth. The firstborn of Ishmael, Nebaioth, then Kedar, Adbiel, Mibsam, Mishma, Duma, Massa, Hedat, Tima, Jeter, Nafish, and Kedema. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names, by their villages, and by their encampments. Twelve princes, according to their nations. These are the years of the life of Ishmael, one hundred thirty-seven years. He gave up the spirit, and died, and was gathered to his people. They lived from Havilah to Shur, that is, before Egypt, as you go toward Assyria. He lived opposite all his relatives. Jacob and Esau this is the history of the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham became the father of Isaac. Isaac was forty years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Paddan Aram, the sister of Laban the Syrian, to be his wife. Isaac entreated Yahweh for his wife, because she was barren. Yahweh was entreated by him and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The children struggled together within her. She said, If it be so, why do I live? She went to inquire of Yahweh. Yahweh said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples will be separated from your body. The one people will be stronger than the other people. The elder will serve the younger. When her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red all over, like a hairy garment. They named him Esau. After that, his brother came out, and his hand had hold on Esau's heel. He was named Jacob. Isaac was sixty years old when she bore them. The boys grew. Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field. Jacob was a quiet man, living in tents. Now Isaac loved Esau because he ate his venison. Rebekah loved Jacob. Esau sells his birthright. Jacob boiled stew. Esau came in from the field, and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with that same red stew, for I am famished. Therefore his name was called Edom. Jacob said, First, sell me your birthright. Esau said, Behold, I am about to die. What good is the birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me first. He swore to him. He sold his birthright to Jacob. Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. He ate and drank, rose up, and went his way. So Esau despised his birthright. End of Section 2 Chapter 26 God's Promise to Isaac There was a famine in the land, besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, to Gerar. Yahweh appeared to him and said, Don't go down into Egypt. Live in the land I will tell you about. Live in this land, and I will be with you, and will bless you. For to you and to your seed I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. I will multiply your seed as the stars of the sky, and will give to your seed all these lands. 
In your seed will all the nations of the earth be blessed, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my requirements, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Isaac deceives Abimelech. Isaac lived in Gerar. The men of the place asked him about his wife. He said, She is my sister, for he was afraid to say, My wife, lest he thought, The men of the place might kill me for Rebekah, because she is beautiful to look at. It happened, when he had been there a long time, that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out at a window, and saw, and, behold, Isaac was caressing Rebekah, his wife. Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, surely she is your wife. Why did you say she is my sister? Isaac said to him, Because I said, Lest I die because of her. Abimelech said, What is this you have done to us? One of the people might easily have lain with your wife and you would have brought guilt on us. Abimelech commanded all the people, saying, He who touches this man or his wife will surely be put to death. Isaac's Prosperity Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year one hundred times what he planted. Yahweh blessed him. The man grew great and grew more and more until he became very great. He had possessions of flocks, possessions of herds, and a great household. The Philistines envied him. Now all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father, the Philistines had stopped and filled with earth. Abimelech said to Isaac, Go from us, for you are much mightier than we. Isaac departed from there, encamped in the valley of Gerar, and lived there. Isaac dug again the wells of water, which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father, for the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. He called their names after the names by which his father had called them. Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found there a well of springing water. The herdsmen of Gerar argued with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water is ours. He called the name of the well Esek, because they contended with him. They dug another well, and they argued over that also. He called its name Sitna. He left that place and dug another well. They didn't argue over that one. He called it Rehoboth. He said, for now Yahweh has made room for us, and we will be fruitful in the land. He went up from there to Beersheba. Yahweh appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham, your father. Don't be afraid, for I am with you and will bless you, and multiply your seed for my servant Abraham's sake. He built an altar there and called on the name of Yahweh, and pitched his tent there. There Isaac's servants dug a well. Isaac's Covenant with Abimelech Then Abimelech went to him from Gerar, and Ahuzath his friend, and Phicol the captain of his army. Isaac said to them, Why have you come to me, since you hate me, and have sent me away from you? They said, we saw plainly that Yahweh was with you. We said, Let there now be an oath between us, even between us and you, and let us make a covenant with you, that you will do us no harm, as we have not touched you, and as we have done to you nothing but good, and have sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of Yahweh. He made them a feast, and they ate and drank. They rose up some time in the morning and swore one to another. Isaac sent them away, and they departed from him in peace. It happened the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him concerning the well which they had dug 
and said to him, We have found water. He called it Sheba. Therefore, the name of the city is Beersheba to this day. Esau's Wives When Esau was forty years old, he took as wife Judith, the daughter of Baeri, the Hittite, and Basimoth, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. They grieved Isaac's and Rebekah's spirits. Chapter 27 Jacob's Deception It happened that when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his elder son, and said to him, My son, he said to him, Here I am, he said. See now, I am old. I don't know the day of my death. Now, therefore, please, take your weapons, your quiver and your bow, and go out to the field, and take me venison. Make me savory food, such as I love, and bring it to me, that I may eat, and that my soul may bless you before I die. Rebekah heard when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son. Esau went to the field to hunt for venison and to bring it. Rebekah spoke to Jacob, her son, saying, Behold, I heard your father speak to Esau, your brother, saying, Bring me venison and make me savory food that I may eat and bless you before Yahweh, before my death. Now, therefore, my son, Obey my voice according to that which I command you. Go now to the flock, and get me from there two good young goats. I will make them savory food for your father, such as he loves. You shall bring it to your father, that he may eat, so that he may bless you before his death. Jacob said to Rebekah his mother, Behold, Esau my brother is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. What if my father touches me? I will seem to him as a deceiver and would bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. His mother said to him, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go get them for me. He went and got them and brought them to his mother. His mother made savory food, such as his father loved. Rebekah took the good clothes of Esau, her elder son, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. She put the skins of the young goats on his hands and on the smooth of his neck. She gave the savory food and the bread, which she had prepared, into the hand of her son Jacob. He came to his father and said, My father, he said, Here I am. Who are you? My son, Isaac blesses Jacob. Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done what you asked me to do. Please arise, sit and eat of my venison, that your soul may bless me. Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? He said, because Yahweh, your God, gave me success. Isaac said to Jacob, Please, come near, that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son Esau or not. Jacob went near to Isaac, his father. He felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He didn't recognize him because his hands were hairy, like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. He said, Are you really my son, Esau? He said, I am. He said, Bring it near to me, and I will eat of my son's venison, that my soul may bless you. He brought it near to him, and he ate. He brought him wine, and he drank. His father Isaac said to him, Come near now, 
and kiss me, my son. He came near and kissed him. He smelled the smell of his clothing and blessed him and said, Behold, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field which Yahweh has blessed. God give you of the dew of the sky, of the fatness of the earth, and plenty of grain and new wine. Let peoples serve you, and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers. Let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you. Blessed be everyone who blesses you. The Stolen Blessing It happened as soon as Isaac had made an end of blessing Jacob, and Jacob had just gone out from the presence of Isaac his father, that Esau his brother came in from his hunting. He also made savory food and brought it to his father. He said to his father, let my father arise and eat of his son's venison, that your soul may bless me. Isaac his father said to him, Who are you? He said, I am your son, your firstborn, Esau. Isaac trembled violently and said, Who then is he who has taken venison and brought it me? And I have eaten of all before you came and have blessed him. Yes, he will be blessed. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with an exceeding great and bitter cry, and said to his father, Bless me, even me also, my father. He said, Your brother came with deceit, and has taken away your blessing. He said, Isn't he rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright. See, now he has taken away my blessing. He said, Haven't you reserved a blessing for me? Isaac answered Esau, Behold, I have made him your lord, and all his brothers have I given to him for servants. With grain and new wine have I sustained him. What then will I do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, Have you but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, my father. Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Isaac, his father, answered him, Behold, of the fatness of the earth will be your dwelling, and of the dew of the sky from above. By your sword will you live, and you will serve your brother. It will happen when you will break loose that you shall shake his yoke from off your neck. Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then I will kill my brother, Jacob. The words of Esau, her elder son, were told to Rebekah. She sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, Behold, your brother Esau comforts himself about you by planning to kill you. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee to Laban, my brother, in Haran. Stay with him a few days until your brother's fury turns away until your brother's anger turn away from you, and he forgets what you have done to him. Then I will send and get you from there. Why should I be bereaved of you both in one day? Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob takes a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these, of the daughters of the land, what good will my life do me? Chapter 28 Jacob Flees to Laban Isaac called Jacob, blessed him, and commanded him, You shall not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise, 
Go to Paddan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father. Take a wife from there, from the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may be a company of peoples and give you the blessing of Abraham to you and to your seed with you, that you may inherit the land where you travel, which God gave to Abraham. Isaac sent Jacob away. He went to Paddan Aram to Laban, son of Bethuel the Syrian, Rebekah's brother, Jacob's and Esau's mother. Esau marries Mahalath. Now Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Paddan Aram to take him a wife from there, and that as he blessed him, he gave him a command, saying, You shall not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan, and that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother, and was gone to Paddan Aram. Esau saw that the daughters of Canaan didn't please Isaac, his father. Esau went to Ishmael, and took, besides the wives that he had, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebaioth, to be his wife. Jacob's Ladder Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there all night, because the sun had set. He took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. He dreamed. Behold, a stairway set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven. Behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Behold, Yahweh stood above it and said, I am Yahweh, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereon you lie, to you will I give it and to your seed. Your seed will be as the dust of the earth, and you will spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. In you and in your seed will all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you, and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you again into this land. For I will not leave you until I have done that which I have spoken of to you. Jacob awakened out of his sleep, and he said, Surely Yahweh is in this place, and I didn't know it. He was afraid, and said, How dreadful is this place! This is none other than God's house, and this is the gate of heaven. THE STONE OF BETHEL Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on its top. He called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at the first. Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, and Yahweh will be my God, then this stone which I have set up for a pillar will be God's house. Of all that you will give me, I will surely give the tenth to you. Chapter 29 Jacob Meets Rachel then Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the children of the east. He looked, and behold, a well in the field, and behold, three flocks of sheep lying there by it, for out of that well they watered the flocks. The stone on the well's mouth was large. There all the flocks were gathered. They rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the sheep and put the stone again on the well's mouth in its place. Jacob said to them, 
My relatives, where are you from? They said, We are from Haran. He said to them, Do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? They said, We know him. He said to them, Is it well with him? They said, It is well. See, Rachel, his daughter, is coming with the sheep. He said, Behold, it is still the middle of the day, not time to gather the livestock together. Water the sheep and go and feed them. They said, We can't until all the flocks are gathered together, and they roll the stone from the well's mouth. Then we water the sheep. While he was yet speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she kept them. It happened, when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth, and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Jacob kissed Rachel, and lifted up his voice, and wept. Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's brother, and that he was Rebekah's son. She ran and told her father. It happened, when Laban heard the news of Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet Jacob, and embraced him, and kissed him, and brought him to his house. Jacob told Laban all these things. Jacob marries Leah and Rachel. Laban said to him, Surely you are my bone and my flesh. He lived with him for a month. Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my brother, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what will your wages be? Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and attractive. Jacob loved Rachel. He said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to another man. Stay with me. Jacob served seven years for Rachel. They seemed to him but a few days for the love he had for her. Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go in to her. Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. It happened in the evening that he took Leah his daughter and brought her to him. He went in to her. Laban gave Zilpah his handmaid, to his daughter Leah for a handmaid. It happened in the morning that, behold, it was Leah. He said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Didn't I serve with you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, It is not done so in our place to give the younger before the firstborn. Fulfill the week of this one, and we will give you the other also for the service which you will serve with me yet seven other years. Jacob did so, and fulfilled her week. He gave him Rachel his daughter as wife. Laban gave to Rachel his daughter Bilhah his handmaid to be her handmaid. He went in also to Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah, and served with him yet seven other years. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Yahweh saw that Leah was hated, and he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Leah conceived and bore a son, and she named him Reuben. For she said, Because Yahweh has looked at my affliction, for now my husband will love me. She conceived again and bore a son, and said, Because Yahweh has heard that I am hated, he has therefore given me this son also. She named him Simeon. She conceived again and bore a son, said, Now this time will my husband be joined to me, because I have borne him three sons. Therefore was his name called Levi. She conceived again and bore a son. She said, 
This time will I praise Yahweh. Therefore she named him Judah. Then she stopped bearing. Chapter 30 Dan and Naphtali When Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister. She said to Jacob, Give me children, or else I will die. Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel, and he said, Am I in God's place, who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? She said, Behold, my maid Bilhah, go into her, that she may bear on my knees, and I also may obtain children by her. She gave him Bilhah, her handmaid, as wife, and Jacob went in to her. Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Rachel said, God has judged me and has also heard my voice and has given me a son. Therefore called she his name Dan. Bilhah, Rachel's handmaid, conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Rachel said, With mighty wrestlings have I wrestled with my sister and have prevailed. She named him Naphtali. Gad and Asher When Leah saw that she had finished bearing, she took Zilpah, her handmaid, and gave her to Jacob as a wife. Zilpah, Leah's handmaid, bore Jacob a son. Leah said, How fortunate! She named him Gad. Zilpah, Leah's handmaid, bore Jacob a second son. Leah said, Happy am I, for the daughters will call me happy. She named him Asher. Reuben went in the days of wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother, Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, Please give me some of your son's mandrakes. She said to her, Is it a small matter that you have taken away my husband? Would you take away my son's mandrakes also? Rachel said, Therefore he will lie with you tonight for your son's mandrakes. Jacob came from the field in the evening, and Leah went out to meet him, and said, You must come in to me, for I have surely hired you with my son's mandrakes. He lay with her that night. Issachar, Zebulun, and Dinah God listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. Leah said, God has given me my hire because I gave my handmaid to my husband. She named him Issachar. Leah conceived again and bore a sixth son to Jacob. Leah said, God has endowed me with a good dowry. Now my husband will live with me because I have borne him six sons. She named him Zebulun. Afterwards, she bore a daughter and named her Dinah. The Birth of Joseph God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb. She conceived, bore a son, and said, God has taken away my reproach. She named him Joseph, saying, May Yahweh add another son to me. Jacob Prospers It happened, when Rachel had borne Joseph, that Jacob said to Laban, Send me away, that I may go to my own place and to my country. Give me my wives and my children, for whom I have served you, and let me go, for you know my service with which I have served you. Laban said to him, If now I have found favor in your eyes, stay here for I have divined that Yahweh has blessed me for your sake. He said, Appoint me your wages, and I will give it. He said to him, You know how I have served you, and how your livestock have fared with me, for it was little which you had before I came, and it has increased to a multitude. Yahweh has blessed you wherever I turned. Now when will I provide for my own house also? He said, what shall I give you? Jacob said, 
you shall not give me anything. If you will do this thing for me, I will again feed your flock and keep it. I will pass through all your flock today, removing from there every speckled and spotted one, and every black one among the sheep, and the spotted and speckled among the goats. This will be my hire. So my righteousness will answer for me hereafter. When you come concerning my hire that is before you, every one that is not speckled and spotted among the goats, and black among the sheep that might be with me, will be counted stolen. Laban said, Behold, let it be according to your word. That day he removed the male goats that were streaked and spotted, and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, every one that had white in it, and all the black ones among the sheep, and gave them into the hand of his sons. He set three days' journey between himself and Jacob, and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. Jacob took to himself rods of fresh poplar, almond, plane tree, peeled white streaks in them, and made the white appear which was in the rods. He set the rods, which he had peeled, opposite the flocks, in the gutters, in the watering troughs where the flocks came to drink. They conceived when they came to drink. The flocks conceived before the rods, and the flocks brought forth streaked, speckled, and spotted. Jacob separated the lambs and set the faces of the flocks toward the streaked and all the black in the flock of Laban. And he put his own droves apart and didn't put them into Laban's flock. It happened, whenever the stronger of the flock conceived, that Jacob laid the rods before the eyes of the flock in the gutters that they might conceive among the rods. But when the flock were feeble, he didn't put them in. So the feebler were Laban's, and the stronger Jacob's. The man increased exceedingly, and had large flocks, female servants and male servants, and camels and donkeys. Chapter 31 Jacob Flees from Laban He heard the words of Laban's sons, saying, Jacob has taken away all that was our father's. From that which was our father's has he gotten all this wealth. Jacob saw the expression on Laban's face, and behold, it was not toward him as before. Yahweh said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field, to his flock, and said to them, I see the expression on your father's face, that it is not toward me as before, but the God of my father has been with me. You know that I have served your father with all of my strength. Your father has deceived me and changed my wages ten times, but God didn't allow him to hurt me. If he said this, the speckled will be your wages, then all the flock bore speckled. If he said this, the streaked will be your wages, then all the flock bore streaked. Thus God has taken away your father's livestock and given them to me. It happened during mating season that I lifted up my eyes and saw in a dream, and behold, the male goats which leaped on the flock were streaked, speckled, and grizzled. The angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, and I said, here I am. He said, Now lift up your eyes, and behold, all the male goats which leap on the flock are streaked, speckled, and grizzled, for I have seen all that Laban does to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar, where you vowed a vow to me. Now arise, get out from this land, and return to the land of your birth. Rachel and Leah answered him, is there yet any portion or inheritance for us in our father's house? Aren't we accounted by him as foreigners? For he has sold us, and has also quite devoured our money. For all the riches which God has taken away from our father, that is ours and our children's. Now then, whatever God has said to you, do. Then Jacob rose up and set his sons and his wives on the camels, and he took away all his livestock and all his possessions which he had gathered, 
including the livestock which he had gained in Paddan Aram, to go to Isaac his father, to the land of Canaan. Now Laban had gone to shear his sheep, and Rachel stole the teraphim that were her father's. Jacob deceived Laban the Syrian, in that he didn't tell him that he was running away. So he fled with all that he had. He rose up, passed over the river, and set his face toward the mountain of Gilead. Laban Pursues Jacob Laban was told on the third day that Jacob had fled. He took his relatives with him and pursued after him seven days' journey. He overtook him in the mountain of Gilead. God came to Laban, the Syrian, in a dream of the night, and said to him, Take heed to yourself that you don't speak to Jacob, either good or bad. Laban caught up with Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the mountain, and Laban, with his relatives, encamped in the mountain of Gilead. Laban said to Jacob, What have you done, that you have deceived me, and carried away my daughters like captives of the sword? Why did you flee secretly, and deceive me, and didn't tell me? that I might have sent you away with mirth and with songs, with tambourine and with harp, and didn't allow me to kiss my sons and my daughters. Now have you done foolishly. It is in the power of my hand to hurt you, but the God of your father spoke to me last night, saying, Take heed to yourself that you don't speak to Jacob, either good or bad. Now you want to be gone, because you greatly longed for your father's house. But why have you stolen my gods? Jacob answered Laban, Because I was afraid, for I said, Lest you should take your daughters from me by force. Anyone you find your gods with shall not live. Before our relatives, discern what is yours with me, and take it. For Jacob didn't know that Rachel had stolen them. Laban went into Jacob's tent into Leah's tent, and into the tent of the two female servants. But he didn't find them. He went out of Leah's tent and entered into Rachel's tent. Now Rachel had taken the teraphim, put them in the camel's saddle, and sat on them. Laban felt about all the tent, but didn't find them. She said to her father, Don't let my lord be angry that I can't rise up before you, for I'm having my period. He searched, but didn't find the teraphim. Jacob was angry and argued with Laban. Jacob answered Laban, What is my trespass? What is my sin that you have hotly pursued after me? Now that you have felt around in all my stuff, what have you found of all your household stuff? Set it here before my relatives and your relatives, that they may judge between us two. These twenty years I have been with you, your ewes and your female goats have not cast their young, and I haven't eaten the rams of your flocks. That which was torn of animals I didn't bring to you. I bore its loss. Of my hand you required it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. This was my situation. In the day the drought consumed me, and the frost by night, and my sleep fled from my eyes. These twenty years I have been in your house, I served you fourteen years for your two daughters, and six years for your flock, and you have changed my wages ten times. Unless the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me, surely now you would have sent me away empty. God has seen my affliction and the labor of my hands, and rebuked you last night. Jacob's Covenant with Laban Laban answered Jacob, The daughters are my daughters, the children are my children, the flocks are my flocks, and all that you see is mine. And what can I do this day to these my daughters, or to their children whom they have borne? Now come, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be for a witness between me and you. Jacob took a stone and set it up for a pillar. Jacob said to his relatives, Gather stones. 
they took stones and made a heap. They ate there by the heap. Laban called it Jiga Sahadutha, but Jacob called it Galead. Laban said, This heap is witness between me and you this day. Therefore it was named Galead and Mizpah, for he said, Yahweh watch between me and you when we are absent one from another. If you afflict my daughters, or if you take wives besides my daughters, no man is with us. Behold, God is witness between me and you. Laban said to Jacob, See this heap, and see this pillar which I have set between me and you. May this heap be a witness, and the pillar be a witness, that I will not pass over this heap to you, and that you will not pass over this heap and this pillar to me for harm. The God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge between us. Then Jacob swore by the fear of his father, Isaac. Jacob offered a sacrifice in the mountain and called his relatives to eat bread. They ate bread and stayed all night in the mountain. Early in the morning, Laban rose up and kissed his sons and his daughters and blessed them. Laban departed and returned to his place. Chapter 32 Jacob's Fear of Esau Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. When he saw them, Jacob said, This is God's army. He called the name of that place Mahanaim. Jacob sent messengers in front of him to Esau, his brother, to the land of Seir, the field of Edom. He commanded them, saying, This is what you shall tell my lord Esau. This is what your servant Jacob says. I have lived as a foreigner with Laban and stayed until now. I have cattle, donkeys, flocks, male servants, and female servants. I have sent to tell my lord that I may find favor in your sight. The messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to your brother Esau. Not only that, but he comes to meet you, and four hundred men with him. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and was distressed. He divided the people who were with him, and the flocks and the herds and the camels, into two companies. And he said, If Esau comes to the one company and strikes it, then the company which is left will escape. Jacob said, God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, Yahweh, who said to me, Return to your country and to your relatives, and I will do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all the loving kindnesses and of all the truth which you have shown to your servant. For with just my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I have become two companies. Please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and strike me, and the mothers with the children. You said, I will surely do you good, and make your seed as the sand of the sea, which can't be numbered because there are so many. He lodged there that night, and took from that which he had with him a present for Esau, his brother, two hundred female goats and twenty male goats, two hundred ewes and twenty rams, thirty milk camels and their colts, forty cows, ten bulls, twenty female donkeys and ten foals. He delivered them into the hands of his servants, every herd by itself, and said to his servants, Pass over before me, and put a space between herd and herd. He commanded the foremost, saying, When Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you, saying, Whose are you? Where are you going? Whose are these before you? Then you shall say, They are your servant Jacob's. It is a present sent to my lord Esau. Behold, he also is behind us. He commanded also the second, 
and the third, and all that followed the herds, saying, This is how you shall speak to Esau when you find him. You shall say, Not only that, but behold, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goes before me, and afterward I will see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So the present passed over before him, and he himself lodged that night in the camp. Jacob wrestles with God. He rose up that night and took his two wives and his two handmaids and his eleven sons and passed over the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them over the stream and sent over that which he had. Jacob was left alone and wrestled with the man there until the breaking of the day. When he saw that he didn't prevail against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was strained as he wrestled. The man said, Let me go, for the day breaks. Jacob said, I won't let you go unless you bless me, he said to him. What is your name? He said, Jacob, he said, your name will no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have fought with God and with men and have prevailed. Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. He said, why is it that you ask what my name is? He blessed him there. Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. For, he said, I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. The sun rose on him as he passed over Peniel, and he limped because of his thigh. Therefore the children of Israel don't eat the sinew of the hip, which is on the hollow of the thigh, to this day, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the sinew of the hip. Chapter 33 Jacob Meets Esau Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau was coming, and with him four hundred men. He divided the children between Leah, Rachel, and the two handmaids. He put the handmaids and their children in front, Leah and her children after and Rachel and Joseph at the rear. He himself passed over in front of them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. Esau ran to meet him, embraced him, fell on his neck, kissed him, and they wept. He lifted up his eyes and saw the women and the children and said, Who are these with you? He said, the children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the handmaids came near with their children, and they bowed themselves. Leah also and her children came near, and bowed themselves. After them, Joseph came near with Rachel, and they bowed themselves. Esau said, What do you mean by all this company which I met? Jacob said, to find favor in the sight of my Lord. Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Let that which you have be yours. Jacob said, Please, no. If I have now found favor in your sight, then receive my present at my hand, because I have seen your face as one sees the face of God, and you were pleased with me. Please take the gift that I brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. He urged him, and he took it. Esau said, Let us take our journey, and let us go, and I will go before you. Jacob said to him, My Lord knows that the children are tender, and that the flocks and herds with me have their young, and if they overdrive them one day, all the flocks will die. Please let my Lord pass over before his servant, and I will lead on gently 
according to the pace of the livestock that are before me, and according to the pace of the children, until I come to my lord to seer. Esau said, Let me now leave with you some of the folk who are with me. He said, Why? Let me find favor in the sight of my lord. So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir. Jacob traveled to Succoth, built himself a house, and made shelters for his livestock. Therefore the name of the place is called Succoth. Jacob settles in Shechem. Jacob came in peace to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Paddan Aram and encamped before the city. He bought the parcel of ground where he had spread his tent, at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for one hundred pieces of money. He erected an altar there, and called it El Elohe Israel. Chapter 34 The Defiling of Dinah Dinah the daughter of Leah, whom she bore to Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. Shechem, the son of Hamor the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her. He took her, lay with her, and humbled her. His soul joined to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the young lady, and spoke kindly to the young lady. Shechem spoke to his father, Hamor, saying, Get me this young lady as a wife. Now Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter, and his sons were with his livestock in the field. Jacob held his peace until they came. Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to talk with him. The sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it. The men were grieved, and they were very angry because he had done folly in Israel in lying with Jacob's daughter, a thing which ought not to be done. Hamor talked with them, saying, The soul of my son, Shechem, longs for your daughter. Please give her to him as a wife. Make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us, and take our daughters for yourselves. You shall dwell with us, and the land will be before you. Live and trade in it, and get possessions in it. Shechem said to her father and to her brothers, Let me find favor in your eyes, and whatever you will tell me I will give. Ask me a great amount for a dowry, and I will give whatever you ask of me, but give me the young lady as a wife. The Revenge of Dinah's Brothers the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamor his father with deceit, and spoke, because he had defiled Dinah their sister, and said to them, We can't do this thing, to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that is a reproach to us. Only on this condition will we consent to you. If you will be as we are, that every male of you be circumcised, then will we give our daughters to you, and we will take your daughters to us, and we will dwell with you, and we will become one people. But if you will not listen to us to be circumcised, then we will take our sister, and we will be gone. Their words pleased Hamor and Shechem, Hamor's son. The young man didn't wait to do this thing, because he had delight in Jacob's daughter and he was honored above all the house of his father. Hamor and Shechem, his son, came to the gate of their city, and talked with the men of their city, saying, These men are peaceful with us. Therefore let them live in the land, and trade in it. For, behold, the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters to us for wives, and let us give them our daughters. Only on this condition will the men consent to us to live with us, to become one people, if every male among us is circumcised as they are circumcised. Won't their livestock and their possessions and all their animals be ours? 
Only let us give our consent to them, and they will dwell with us. All who went out of the gate of his city listened to Hamor and to Shechem his son, and every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of his city. It happened on the third day when they were sore that two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, each took his sword, came upon the unsuspecting city, and killed all the males. They killed Hamor and Shechem his son with the edge of the sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went away. Jacob's sons came on the dead and plundered the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their flocks, their herds, their donkeys, that which was in the city, that which was in the field, and all their wealth. They took captive all their little ones and their wives, and took as plunder everything that was in the house. Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have troubled me to make me odious to the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. I am few in number. They will gather themselves together against me and strike me, and I will be destroyed, I and my house. They said, Should he deal with our sister as with a prostitute? Chapter 35 Jacob Returns to Bethel God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and live there. Make there an altar to God, who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau your brother. Then Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves. Change your garments. Let us arise and go up to Bethel. I will make there an altar to God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and was with me in the way which I went. They gave to Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands, and the rings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. They traveled, and a terror of God was on the cities that were around them, and they didn't pursue the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, that is, Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. He built an altar there and called the place El Bethel, because there God was revealed to him when he fled from the face of his brother. Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried below Bethel under the oak, and its name was called Alan Bakuth. Jacob is named Israel. God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Paddan Aram and blessed him. God said to him, Your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be Jacob any more, but your name will be Israel. He named him Israel. God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations will be from you, and kings will come out of your body. The land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac I will give it to you, and to your seed after you will I give the land. God went up from him in the place where he spoke with him. Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he spoke with him, a pillar of stone. He poured out a drink offering on it, and poured oil on it. Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him Bethel. Benjamin is born. Rachel dies. They traveled from Bethel. There was still some distance to come to Ephrath, and Rachel travailed. She had hard labor. When she was in hard labor, the midwife said to her, Don't be afraid, for now you will have another son. It happened, as her soul was departing, 
for she died, that she named him Benoni, but his father named him Benjamin. Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrath. The same is Bethlehem. Jacob set up a pillar on her grave. The same is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. Israel traveled and spread his tent beyond the tower of Eder. The Sons of Jacob It happened, while Israel lived in that land, that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. Now the sons of Jacob were twelve, the sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, the sons of Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin, the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's handmaid, Dan and Naphtali, the sons of Zilpah, Leah's handmaid, Gad and Asher. These are the sons of Jacob, who were born to him in Paddan Aram. The Death of Isaac Jacob came to Isaac his father, to Mamre, to Kiriath Arbor, which is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac lived as foreigners. The days of Isaac were one hundred eighty years. Isaac gave up the spirit and died, and was gathered to his people, old and full of days. Esau and Jacob, his sons, buried him. End of Section 3「Chapter 36 Esau's Descendants」Now this is the history of the generations of Esau, that is, Edom. Esau took his wives from the daughters of Canaan, Ada, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and Oholibama, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion, the Hivite, and Basimath, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nebaioth. Ada bore to Esau Eliphaz. Basimath bore Ruel. Oholibama bore Jeush, Jalam, and Korah. These are the sons of Esau, who were born to him in the land of Canaan. Esau took his wives, his sons, his daughters, and all the members of his household, with his livestock, all his animals, and all his possessions which he had gathered in the land of Canaan, and went into a land away from his brother Jacob. For their substance was too great for them to dwell together, and the land of their travels couldn't bear them because of their livestock. Esau lived in the hill country of Seir. Esau is Edom. This is the history of the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in the hill country of Seir. These are the names of Esau's sons. Eliphaz, the son of Ada, the wife of Esau, and Ruel, the son of Basimath, the wife of Esau. The sons of Eliphaz were Theman, Omar, Zepho, and Gadam and Kenaz. Timnah was concubine to Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she bore to Eliphaz Amalek. These are the sons of Ada, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Ruel, Nahath, Zerah, Shammah, and Mizah. These were the sons of Basimath, Esau's wife. These were the sons of Oholibama, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion, Esau's wife. She bore to Esau Jeush, Jalam, and Korah. The Chiefs of Edom 
These are the chiefs of the sons of Esau, the sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn of Esau, chief Theman, chief Omar, chief Zepho, chief Kenaz, chief Korah, chief Gadam, chief Amalek. These are the chiefs who came of Eliphaz in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Ada. These are the sons of Ruel, Esau's son, Chief Nahath, Chief Zerah, Chief Shammah, Chief Mizah. These are the chiefs who came of Ruel in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Basimath, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Aholibama, Esau's wife, Chief Jeush, Chief Jalam, Chief Korah. These are the chiefs who came of Aholibama, the daughter of Anna, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Esau, that is, Edom, and these are their chiefs. These are the sons of Seir, the Horite, the inhabitants of the land, Lotan, Shobal, Zibion, Anna, Dishan, Ezer, and Dishan. These are the chiefs who came of the Horites, the children of Seir in the land of Edom. The children of Lotan were Horai and Heman. Lotan's sister was Timnah. These are the children of Shobal, Alvan, Manahath, Ebal, Shepho, and Onam. These are the children of Zibion, Aya, and Anna. This is Anna who found the hot springs in the wilderness as he fed the donkeys of Zibion, his father. These are the children of Anna, Dishan and Oholibama, the daughter of Anna. These are the children of Dishan, Hemdan, Eshban, Ithran, and Keran. These are the children of Ezer, Bilhan, Zaavan, and Ekan. These are the children of Dishan, Uz, and Aran. These are the chiefs who came of the Horites, Chief Lotan, Chief Shobal, Chief Zibion, Chief Anna, Chief Dishan, Chief Ezer, and Chief Dishan. These are the chiefs who came of the Horites, according to their chiefs in the land of Seir. The Kings of Edom These are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the children of Israel. Bela, the son of Beor, reigned in Edom. The name of his city was Din Haba. Bela died, and Jobab, the son of Zerah of Bozrah, reigned in his place. Jobab died, and Husham of the land of the Themanites reigned in his place. Husham died, and Hadad, the son of Bedad, who struck Midian in the field of Moab, reigned in his place. The name of his city was Avith. Hadad died, and Samla of Masrika reigned in his place. Samla died, and Shaul of Rehoboth by the river reigned in his place. Shaul died. And Baal Hanan, the son of Akbor, reigned in his place. Baal Hanan, the son of Akbor, died, and Hedar reigned in his place. The name of his city was Pau. His wife's name was Mehetabel, the daughter of Matred, the daughter of Mezahab. These are the names of the chiefs who came from Esau according to their families, after their places, and by their names.
Chief Timna, Chief Alva, Chief Jeteth, Chief Oholibama, Chief Ela, Chief Pinan, Chief Kinez, Chief Theman, Chief Mibsar, Chief Magdiel, and Chief Iram. These are the chiefs of Edom, according to their habitations in the land of their possession. This is Esau, the father of the Edomites. Chapter 37 Joseph's Dreams Jacob lived in the land of his father's travels, in the land of Canaan. This is the history of the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being seventeen years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. Joseph brought an evil report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat of many colors. His brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, and they hated him and couldn't speak peaceably to him. Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him all the more. He said to them, Please hear this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose, and also stood upright, and behold, your sheaves came around, and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Will you indeed reign over us, or will you indeed have dominion over us? They hated him all the more for his dreams and for his words. He dreamed yet another dream, and told it to his brothers, and said, Behold, I have dreamed yet another dream. And behold, the sun and the moon and eleven stars bowed down to me. He told it to his father and to his brothers. His father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Will I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves down to you to the earth? His brothers envied him. But his father kept this saying in mind. Joseph sold by his brothers. His brothers went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. Israel said to Joseph, Aren't your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send you to them. He said to him, Here I am. He said to him, Go now. See whether it is well with your brothers, and well with the flock, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. A certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. The man asked him, What are you looking for? He said, I am looking for my brothers. Tell me, please, where they are feeding the flock. The man said, they have left here, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. They saw him afar off, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said one to another, Behold, this dreamer comes. Come now, therefore, and let's kill him and cast him into one of the pits, and we will say, an evil animal has devoured him. We will see what will become of his dreams. Reuben heard it, and delivered him out of their hand, and said, Let's not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit that is in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might deliver him out of their hand, to restore him to his father. It happened, when Joseph came to his brothers, that they stripped Joseph of his coat, the coat of many colors that was on him, and they took him and threw him into the pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. 
they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked, and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites was coming from Gilead, with their camels bearing spices and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, and let's sell him to the Ishmaelites, and not let our hand be on him, for he is our brother, our flesh. His brothers listened to him. Midianites, who were merchants, passed by, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit, and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for twenty pieces of silver. They brought Joseph into Egypt. Reuben returned to the pit, and saw that Joseph wasn't in the pit, and he tore his clothes. He returned to his brothers and said, The child is no more, and I, where will I go? Jacob mourns Joseph. They took Joseph's coat and killed a male goat and dipped the coat in the blood. They took the coat of many colors and they brought it to their father and said, we have found this. Examine it now, whether it is your son's coat or not. He recognized it and said, It is my son's coat. An evil animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn in pieces. Jacob tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his waist and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. He said, For I will go down to Sheol to my son, mourning. His father wept for him. The Midianites sold him into Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's, the captain of the guard. Chapter 38 Judah and Tamar It happened at that time that Judah went down from his brothers and visited a certain Adulamite, whose name was Hira. Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite, whose name was Shua. He took her and went in to her. She conceived and bore a son, and he named him Ur. She conceived again, and bore a son, and she named him Onan. She yet again bore a son, and named him Shelah. And he was at Kezib when she bore him. Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of Yahweh. Yahweh killed him. Judah said to Onan, Go in to your brother's wife, and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her, and raise up seed to your brother. Onan knew that the seed wouldn't be his, and it happened, when he went in to his brother's wife, that he spilled it on the ground, lest he should give seed to his brother. The thing which he did was evil in the sight of Yahweh, and he killed him also. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow in your father's house until Shelah, my son, is grown up. For he said, Lest he also die like his brothers. Tamar went and lived in her father's house. After many days, Shua's daughter, the wife of Judah, died. Judah was comforted and went up to his sheep shearers to Timnah, he and his friend Hira the Adulamite. It was told Tamar, saying, Behold, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. She took off of her the garments of her widowhood, and covered herself with her veil, and wrapped herself, and sat in the gate of Enaim, which is by the way to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah was grown up, and she wasn't given to him as a wife. When Judah saw her, he thought that she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. He turned to her by the way and said, Please come, 
let me come in to you, for he didn't know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, What will you give me, that you may come in to me? He said, I will send you a young goat from the flock. She said, Will you give me a pledge until you send it? He said, What pledge will I give you? She said, Your signet and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. He gave them to her and came in to her, and she conceived by him. She arose and went away and put off her veil from her face and put on the garments of her widowhood. Judah sent the young goat by the hand of his friend, the Adulamite, to receive the pledge from the woman's hand, but he didn't find her. Then he asked the men of her place, saying, Where's the prostitute that was at Enaim by the road? They said, There's been no prostitute here. He returned to Judah and said, I haven't found her. And also the men of the place said, There has been no prostitute here. Judah said, Let her keep it, lest we be shamed. Behold, I sent this young goat, and you haven't found her. It happened about three months later that it was told Judah, saying, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has played the prostitute, and moreover, behold, she is with child by prostitution. Judah said, Bring her forth, and let her be burnt. When she was brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, By the man whose these are, I am with child. She also said, Please discern whose are these, the signet, and the cords, and the staff. Judah acknowledged them, and said, She is more righteous than I, because I didn't give her to Sheila, my son. He knew her again no more. The Birth of Perez and Zerah It happened in the time of her travail that, behold, twins were in her womb. When she travailed, one put out a hand, and the midwife took and tied a scarlet thread on his hand, saying, This came out first. It happened, as he drew back his hand, that, behold, his brother came out, and she said, Why have you made a breach for yourself? Therefore his name was called Perez. Afterward his brother came out, that had the scarlet thread on his hand, and his name was called Zira. Chapter 39 Joseph and Potiphar's Wife Joseph was brought down to Egypt. Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the hand of the Ishmaelites that had brought him down there. Yahweh was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. He was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. His master saw that Yahweh was with him, and that Yahweh made all that he did prosper in his hand. Joseph found favor in his sight. He ministered to him, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had he put into his hand. It happened from the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had that Yahweh blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of Yahweh was on all that he had, in the house and in the field. He left all that he had in Joseph's hand. He didn't concern himself with anything except for the food which he ate. Joseph was well built and handsome. It happened after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, my master doesn't know what is with me in the house, and he has put all that he has into my hand. He isn't greater in this house than I, neither has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? As she spoke to Joseph day by day, he didn't listen to her, to lie by her, or to be with her. About this time, 
he went into the house to do his work, and there were none of the men of the house inside. She caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. He left his garment in her hand and ran outside. Joseph falsely imprisoned. When she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had run outside, she called to the men of her house and spoke to them, saying, Behold, he has brought in a Hebrew to us to mock us. He came in to me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. It happened when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment by me and ran outside. She laid up his garment by her until his master came home. She spoke to him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you have brought to us came in to me to mock me, and it happened as I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment by me and ran outside. It happened when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spoke to him, saying, This is what your servant did to me, that his wrath was kindled. Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in custody. But Yahweh was with Joseph and showed kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. The keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, he was responsible for it. The keeper of the prison didn't look after anything that was under his hand, because Yahweh was with him, and that which he did, Yahweh made it prosper. Chapter 40 The Cupbearer and the Baker It happened after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker offended their lord, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. He put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, into the prison, the place where Joseph was bound. The captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, and he took care of them. They stayed in prison many days. They both dreamed a dream, each man his dream, in one night each man according to the interpretation of his dream, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were bound in the prison. Joseph came in to them in the morning and saw them, and saw that they were sad. He asked Pharaoh's officers, who were with him in custody in his master's house, saying, Why do you look so sad today? They said to him, We have dreamed a dream and there's no one who can interpret it. Joseph said to them, Don't interpretations belong to God? Please tell it to me. The chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream, behold, a vine was in front of me, and in the vine were three branches. It was as though it budded, its blossoms shot forth, and its clusters brought forth ripe grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. Joseph said to him, This is its interpretation. The three branches are three days. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office. You will give Pharaoh's cup into his hand, the way you did when you were his cupbearer. But remember me when it will be well with you, and please show kindness to me, and make mention of me to Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. For indeed, I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also have I done nothing that they should put me into the dungeon. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said to Joseph, I also was in my dream, and behold, Three baskets of white bread were on my head. In the uppermost basket there was all kinds of baked food for Pharaoh, and the birds ate them out of the basket on my head. Joseph answered, This is its interpretation. The three baskets 
are three days. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from off you and will hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat your flesh from off you. It happened the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast for all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position again, and he gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker, as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer didn't remember Joseph, but forgot him. Chapter 41 The Dreams of Pharaoh it happened at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed. And behold, he stood by the river. Behold, there came up out of the river seven cattle, sleek and fat, and they fed in the marsh grass. Behold, seven other cattle came up after them out of the river, ugly and thin, and stood by the other cattle on the brink of the river. The ugly and thin cattle ate up the seven sleek and fat cattle. So Pharaoh awoke. He slept and dreamed a second time. And behold, seven heads of grain came up on one stalk, healthy and good. Behold, seven heads of grain, thin and blasted with the east wind, sprung up after them. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven healthy and full ears. Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. It happened in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all of Egypt's magicians and wise men. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them to Pharaoh. Then the chief cupbearer spoke to Pharaoh, saying, I remember my faults today. Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, me and the chief baker. We dreamed a dream in one night, I and he. We dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. There was with us there a young man, a Hebrew, servant to the captain of the guard, and we told him, and he interpreted to us our dreams. To each man, according to his dream, he interpreted. It happened as he interpreted to us, so it was. He restored me to my office, and he hanged him. Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dreams. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon. He shaved himself changed his clothing, and came in to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It isn't in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Pharaoh spoke to Joseph, In my dream, Behold, I stood on the brink of the river, and behold, there came up out of the river seven cattle, fat and sleek. They fed in the marsh grass, and behold, seven other cattle came up after them, poor and very ugly and thin, such as I never saw in all the land of Egypt for ugliness. The thin and ugly cattle ate up the first seven fat cattle, and when they had eaten them up, it couldn't be known that they had eaten them, but they were still ugly, as at the beginning. So I awoke. I saw in my dream, and behold, seven heads of grain came up on one stalk, full and good, and behold, seven heads of grain, withered, thin and blasted with the east wind, sprung up after them. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven good heads of grain. I told it to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. Joseph said to Pharaoh, The dream of Pharaoh is one. 
what God is about to do, he has declared to Pharaoh. The seven good cattle are seven years, and the seven good heads of grain are seven years. The dream is one. The seven thin and ugly cattle that came up after them are seven years, and also the seven empty heads of grain blasted with the east wind. They will be seven years of famine. That is the thing which I spoke to Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he has shown to Pharaoh. Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. There will arise after them seven years of famine, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will consume the land, and the plenty will not be known in the land by reason of that famine which follows, for it will be very grievous. The dream was doubled to Pharaoh, because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh look for a discreet and wise man, and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this, and let him appoint overseers for the land, and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt's produce in the seven plenteous years. Let them gather all the food of these good years that come, and lay up grain under the hand of Pharaoh for food in the cities, and let them keep it. The food will be for a store to the land against the seven years of famine which will be in the land of Egypt, that the land not perish through the famine. Joseph given charge of Egypt. The thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the Spirit of God? Pharaoh said to Joseph, Because God has shown you all of this, there is none so discreet and wise as you. You shall be over my house, and according to your word will all my people be ruled. Only in the throne I will be greater than you. Pharaoh said to Joseph, Behold, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh took off his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and arrayed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had. They cried before him, Bow the knee! He set him over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without you shall no man lift up his hand or his foot in all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh called Joseph's name zaphnath paneah and he gave him Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, as a wife. Joseph went out over the land of Egypt. The Seven Years of Plenty Joseph was thirty years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. In the seven plenteous years, the earth brought forth abundantly. He gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt and laid up the food in the cities. The food of the field which was around every city he laid up in the same. Joseph laid up grain as the sand of the sea, very much, until he stopped counting, for it was without number. The Sons of Joseph To Joseph were born two sons before the year of famine came, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, bore to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. The name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. The Famine Begins The seven years of plenty which were in the land of Egypt came to an end. 
the seven years of famine began to come, just as Joseph had said. There was famine in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. When all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, Go to Joseph. What he says to you, do. The famine was over all the surface of the earth. Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. The famine was severe in the land of Egypt. All countries came into Egypt to Joseph to buy grain because the famine was severe in all the earth. Chapter 42 Joseph's Brothers Sent to Egypt Now Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, and Jacob said to his sons, Why do you look at one another? He said, Behold, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy for us from there, so that we may live and not die. Joseph's ten brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob didn't send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with his brothers, for he said, Lest perhaps harm happen to him. The sons of Israel came to buy among those who came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. Joseph was the governor over the land. It was he who sold to all the people of the land. Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves down to him with their faces to the earth. Joseph saw his brothers and he recognized them, but acted like a stranger to them and spoke roughly with them. He said to them, Where did you come from? They said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. Joseph recognized his brothers, but they didn't recognize him. Joseph remembered the dreams which he dreamed about them, and said to them, You are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. They said to him, No, my lord, but your servants have come to buy food. We are all one man's sons. We are honest men. Your servants are not spies. He said to them, No. But you have come to see the nakedness of the land. They said, We, your servants, are twelve brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is this day with our father, and one is no more. Joseph said to them, It is like I told you, saying, You are spies. By this you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not go forth from here unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you and let him get your brother, and you shall be bound that your words may be tested whether there is truth in you, or else by the life of Pharaoh surely you are spies. He put them all together into custody for three days. Joseph said to them the third day, Do this and live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, then let one of your brothers be bound in your prison. But you go, carry grain for the famine of your houses, bring your youngest brother to me. So will your words be verified, and you won't die. They did so. They said one to another, We are certainly guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us, and we wouldn't listen. Therefore this distress has come upon us. Reuben answered them, saying, Didn't I tell you, saying, Don't sin against the child, and you wouldn't listen? Therefore also, behold, his blood is required. They didn't know that Joseph understood them, for there was an interpreter between them. He turned himself away from them and wept. Then he returned to them and spoke to them and took Simeon from among them, and bound him before their eyes. Joseph's brothers returned to Canaan. Then Joseph gave a command to fill their bags with grain, 
and to restore each man's money into his sack, and to give them food for the way. So it was done to them. They loaded their donkeys with their grain, and departed from there. As one of them opened his sack to give his donkey food in the lodging place, he saw his money. Behold, it was in the mouth of his sack. He said to his brothers, My money is restored. Behold, it is in my sack. Their hearts failed them, and they turned, trembling one to another, saying, What is this that God has done to us? They came to Jacob their father, to the land of Canaan, and told him all that had happened to them, saying, The man, the lord of the land, spoke roughly with us, and took us for spies of the country. We said to him, We are honest men, we are no spies. We are twelve brothers, sons of our father. One is no more, and the youngest is this day with our father in the land of Canaan. The man, the lord of the land, said to us, by this I will know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers with me, and take grain for the famine of your houses, and go your way. Bring your youngest brother to me. Then I will know that you are not spies, but that you are honest men. So I will deliver your brother to you, and you shall trade in the land. It happened, as they emptied their sacks, that, behold, each man's bundle of money was in his sack. When they and their father saw their bundles of money, they were afraid. Jacob, their father, said to them, You have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And you want to take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. Reuben spoke to his father, saying, Kill my two sons if I don't bring him to you. Entrust him to my care, and I will bring him to you again. He said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he only is left. If harm happens to him along the way in which you go, then you will bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to Sheol. Chapter 43 the return to Egypt with Benjamin. The famine was severe in the land. It happened, when they had eaten up the grain which they had brought out of Egypt, their father said to them, Go again, buy us a little more food. Judah spoke to him, saying, The man solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you'll send our brother with us, we'll go down and buy you food. But if you'll not send him, we'll not go down. For the man said to us, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. Israel said, Why did you treat me so badly, telling the man that you had another brother? They said, The man asked directly concerning ourselves and concerning our relatives saying, Is your father still alive? Have you another brother? We just answered his questions. Is there any way we could know that he would say, Bring your brother down? Judah said to Israel his father, Send the boy with me, and we'll get up and go, so that we may live and not die, both we and you, and also our little ones. I'll be collateral for him. From my hand will you require him, if I don't bring him to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. For if we hadn't delayed, surely we would have returned a second time by now. Their father, Israel, said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take from the choice fruits of the land in your bags and carry down a present for the man, a little balm, a little honey, spices, and myrrh, nuts and almonds and take double money in your hand and take back the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks perhaps it was an oversight take your brother also get up and return to the man may god almighty give you mercy before the man 
that he may release to you your other brother and Benjamin. If I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. The men took that present, and they took double money in their hand, and Benjamin, and got up, went down to Egypt, and stood before Joseph. Joseph's Hospitality to His Brothers When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, Bring the men into the house, and butcher an animal, and prepare, for the men will dine with me at noon. The man did as Joseph commanded, and the man brought the men to Joseph's house. The men were afraid, because they were brought to Joseph's house, and they said, because of the money that was returned in our sacks at the first time, we are brought in, that he may seek occasion against us, attack us, and seize us as slaves along with our donkeys. They came near to the steward of Joseph's house, and they spoke to him at the door of the house, and said, O oh, my lord, we indeed came down the first time to buy food. When we came to the lodging place, we opened our sacks, and behold, each man's money was in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight. We have brought it back in our hand. We have brought down other money in our hand to buy food. We don't know who put our money in our sacks. He said, Peace be to you. Don't be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I received your money. He brought Simeon out to them. The man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water, and they washed their feet. He gave their donkeys fodder. They prepared the present for Joseph's coming at noon, for they heard that they should eat bread there. When Joseph came home, they brought him the present which was in their hand into the house, and bowed themselves down to him to the earth. He asked them of their welfare, and said, is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? Is he yet alive? They said, Your servant, our father, is well. He is still alive. They bowed the head and did homage. He lifted up his eyes and saw Benjamin, his brother, his mother's son, and said, Is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? He said, God be gracious to you, my son. Joseph hurried, for his heart yearned over his brother, and he sought a place to weep. He entered into his room and wept there. He washed his face and came out. He controlled himself and said, Serve the meal. They served him by himself and them by themselves, and the Egyptians that ate with him by themselves because the Egyptians don't eat bread with the Hebrews, for that is an abomination to the Egyptians. They sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth, and the men marveled one with another. He sent portions to them from before him, but Benjamin's portion was five times as much as any of theirs. They drank and were merry with him. Chapter 44 Benjamin and the Silver Cup He commanded the steward of his house, saying, Fill the men's sacks with food, as much as they can carry, and put each man's money in his sack's mouth. Put my cup, the silver cup, in the sack's mouth of the youngest, with his grain money. He did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. As soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away, they and their donkeys. When they had gone out of the city and were not yet far off, Joseph said to his steward, Up, follow after the men. When you overtake them, ask them, Why have you rewarded evil for good? Isn't this that from which my Lord drinks, and by which he indeed divines? You have done evil in so doing. He overtook them, and he spoke these words to them. They said to him, Why does my Lord speak such words as these? Far be it from your servants that they should do such a thing. Behold, 
the money which we found in our sacks' mouths, we brought again to you out of the land of Canaan. How then should we steal silver or gold out of your Lord's house? With whoever of your servants it be found, let him die, and we also will be my Lord's bond servants. He said, Now also let it be according to your words. He with whom it is found will be my bond servant, and you will be blameless. Then they hurried, and each man took his sack down to the ground, and each man opened his sack. He searched, beginning with the eldest, and ending at the youngest. The cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they tore their clothes, and each man loaded his donkey and returned to the city. Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, and he was still there. They fell on the ground before him. Joseph said to them, What deed is this that you have done? Don't you know that such a man as I can indeed divine? Judah said, What will we tell, my lord? What will we speak? Or how will we clear ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of your servants. Behold, we are my lord's bondservants, both we and he also in whose hand the cup is found. He said, Far be it from me that I should do so. The man in whose hand the cup is found, he will be my bondservant. But as for you, go up in peace to your father. Judah pleads for Benjamin. Then Judah came near to him and said, Oh, my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's ears, and don't let your anger burn against your servant, for you are even as Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servants, saying, Have you a father or a brother? We said to my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age, a little one. And his brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother and his father loves him. You said to your servants, Bring him down to me, that I may set my eyes on him. We said to my Lord, The boy can't leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. You said to your servants, Unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you will see my face no more. It happened when we came up to your servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. Our father said, Go again, buy us a little food. We said, We can't go down. If our youngest brother is with us, then we will go down, for we may not see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Your servant, my father, said to us, You know that my wife bore me two sons, and the one went out from me, and I said, Surely he is torn in pieces, and I haven't seen him since. If you take this one also from me, and harm happens to him, you will bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to Sheol. Now, therefore, when I come to your servant, my father, and the boy is not with us, since his life is bound up in the boy's life, it will happen when he sees that the boy is no more, that he will die. Your servants will bring down the gray hairs of your servant, our father, with sorrow to Sheol. For your servant became collateral for the boy to my father, saying, If I don't bring him to you, then I will bear the blame to my father forever. Now, therefore, please let your servant stay instead of the boy, a bondservant to my lord, and let the boy go up with his brothers, for how will I go up to my father if the boy isn't with me, lest I see the evil that will come on my father? Chapter 45 Joseph Reveals His Identity Then Joseph couldn't control himself before all those who stood before him, and he cried, Cause everyone to go out from me! No one else stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. He wept aloud. The Egyptians heard, and the house of Pharaoh heard. 
Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? His brothers couldn't answer him, for they were terrified at his presence. Joseph said to his brothers, Come near to me, please. They came near. He said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now don't be grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years the famine has been in the land, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to save you alive by a great deliverance. So now it wasn't you who sent me here, but God, and he has made me a father to Pharaoh, lord of all his house, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Joseph sends for his father. Hurry and go up to my father and tell him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Don't wait. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you will be near to me. You, your children, your children's children, your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. There I will nourish you, for there are yet five years of famine, lest you come to poverty, you and your household, and all that you have. Behold, your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin, that it is my mouth that speaks to you. You shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt, and of all that you have seen. You shall hurry and bring my father down here. He fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept on his neck. He kissed all his brothers and wept on them. After that, his brothers talked with him. Pharaoh invites Jacob to Egypt. The report of it was heard in Pharaoh's house, saying, Joseph's brothers have come. It pleased Pharaoh well and his servants. Pharaoh said to Joseph, Tell your brothers, do this, load your animals and go, travel to the land of Canaan. Take your father and your households, and come to me, and I will give you the good of the land of Egypt, and you will eat the fat of the land. Now you are commanded, do this. Take wagons out of the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives, and bring your father and come. Also, don't concern yourselves about your belongings, for the good of all of the land of Egypt is yours. The sons of Israel did so. Joseph gave them wagons according to the commandment of Pharaoh and gave them provision for the way. He gave each one of them changes of clothing, but to Benjamin he gave three hundred pieces of silver and five changes of clothing. He sent the following to his father, ten donkeys loaded with the good things of Egypt and ten female donkeys loaded with grain and bread and provision for his father by the way. So he sent his brothers away, and they departed. He said to them, See that you don't quarrel on the way. The Revival of Jacob They went up out of Egypt and came into the land of Canaan to Jacob their father. They told him, saying, Joseph is still alive, and he is ruler over all the land of Egypt. His heart fainted, for he didn't believe them. They told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said to them. When he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. Israel said, It is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. Chapter 46 Jacob's Journey to Egypt Israel traveled with all that he had 
and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. God spoke to Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob, he said, Here I am. He said, I am God, the God of your father. Don't be afraid to go down into Egypt, for there I will make of you a great nation. I will go down with you into Egypt. I will also surely bring you up again. Joseph will close your eyes. Jacob rose up from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried Jacob, their father, their little ones, and their wives, in the wagons which Pharaoh had sent to carry him. They took their livestock and their goods, which they had gotten in the land of Canaan, and came into Egypt, Jacob and all his seed with him, his sons and his sons' sons with him, his daughters and his sons' daughters. And he brought all his seed with him into Egypt. Those who went into Egypt. These are the names of the children of Israel who came into Egypt. Jacob and his sons. Reuben, Jacob's firstborn. The sons of Reuben. Hanok, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi. The sons of Simeon. Jemuel. Jamin, Ohad, Jekin, Zohar, and Shaul, the son of a Canaanite woman, the sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari, the sons of Judah, Ur, Onan, Shelah, Perez, and Zerah. But Ur and Onan died in the land of Canaan. The sons of Perez were Hezron and Hamul. The sons of Issachar, Tola, Puva, Job, and Shimron. The sons of Zebulun, Sered, Elon, and Jaliel. These are the sons of Leah whom she bore to Jacob in Paddan Aram with his daughter Dinah. All the souls of his sons and his daughters were thirty-three. The sons of Gad, Ziphion, Haggai, Shunai, Esbon, Uri, Arodi, and Arili. The sons of Asher, Imna, Ishva, Ishvi, Bariah, and Surah, their sister. The sons of Bariah, Heber, and Malkiel. These are the sons of Zilpah, whom Laban gave to Leah, his daughter, and these she bore to Jacob, even sixteen souls. The sons of Rachel, Jacob's wife, Joseph, and Benjamin. To Joseph in the land of Egypt were born Manasseh and Ephraim, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On, bore to him. The sons of Benjamin, Bela, Becher, Ashbel, Jira, Naaman, Ehi, Rosh, Mupim, Huppim, and Ard. These are the sons of Rachel who were born to Jacob. All the souls were fourteen. The son of Dan, Hushim. The sons of Naphtali, Jaziel, Gunai, Jezer, and Shillam. These are the sons of Bilhah, whom Laban gave to Rachel, his daughter, 
and these she bore to Jacob. All the souls were seven. All the souls who came with Jacob into Egypt, who were his direct descendants, besides Jacob's sons' wives, all the souls were sixty-six. The sons of Joseph, who were born to him in Egypt, were two souls. All the souls of the house of Jacob, who came into Egypt, were seventy. Joseph meets Jacob. He sent Judah before him to Joseph, to show the way before him to Goshen. And they came into the land of Goshen. Joseph prepared his chariot, and went up to meet Israel his father in Goshen. He presented himself to him, and fell on his neck, and wept on his neck a good while. Israel said to Joseph, now let me die, since I have seen your face, that you are still alive. Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's house, I will go up and speak with Pharaoh, and will tell him, My brothers and my father's house, who were in the land of Canaan, have come to me. These men are shepherds, for they have been keepers of livestock, and they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. It will happen when Pharaoh summons you and will say, What is your occupation? That you shall say, Your servants have been keepers of livestock from our youth even until now, both we and our fathers, that you may dwell in the land of Goshen. For every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. End of section four. Chapter 47 Jacob Settles in Goshen Then Joseph went in and told Pharaoh, and said, My father and my brothers, with their flocks, their herds, and all that they own have come out of the land of Canaan, and behold, they are in the land of Goshen. From among his brothers he took five men and presented them to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to his brothers, What is your occupation? They said to Pharaoh, Your servants are shepherds, both we and our fathers. They said to Pharaoh, We have come to live as foreigners in the land, for there is no pasture for your servants' flocks, for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. Now, therefore, please let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen. Pharaoh spoke to Joseph, saying, Your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Make your father and your brothers dwell in the best of the land. Let them dwell in the land of Goshen. If you know any able men among them, then put them in charge of my livestock. Joseph brought in Jacob, his father, and set him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Jacob, How many are the days of the years of your life? Jacob said to Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are one hundred thirty years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life, and they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from the presence of Pharaoh. Joseph placed his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had commanded. Joseph nourished his father, his brothers, and all of his father's household with bread, according to their families. Joseph's Leadership in Famine There was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very severe, so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan fainted by reason of the famine. 
Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the grain which they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. When the money was all spent in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in your presence? For our money fails. Joseph said, Give me your livestock, and I will give you food for your livestock, if your money is gone. They brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for the horses, and for the flocks, and for the herds, and for the donkeys. And he fed them with bread in exchange for all their livestock for that year. When that year was ended, they came to him the second year, and said to him, we will not hide from my lord how our money is all spent and the herds of livestock are my lord's there is nothing left in the sight of my lord but our bodies and our lands why should we die before your eyes both we and our land buy us and our land for bread and we and our land will be servants to pharaoh give us seed that we may live and not die and that the land won't be desolate. So Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for every man of the Egyptians sold his field, because the famine was severe on them, and the land became Pharaoh's. As for the people, he moved them to the cities, from one end of the border of Egypt even to the other end of it. Only he didn't buy the land of the priests, for the priests had a portion from Pharaoh, and ate their portion which Pharaoh gave them. That is why they didn't sell their land. Then Joseph said to the people, Behold, I have bought you and your land today for Pharaoh. Behold, here is seed for you, and you shall sow the land. It will happen at the harvests that you shall give a fifth to Pharaoh, and four parts will be your own, for seed of the field, for your food, for them of your households, and for food for your little ones. They said, You have saved our lives. Let us find favor in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. Joseph made it a statute concerning the land of Egypt to this day, that Pharaoh should have the fifth. Only the land of the priests alone didn't become Pharaoh's. Israel lived in the land of Egypt, in the land of Goshen, and they got themselves possessions therein, and were fruitful, and multiplied exceedingly. Jacob lived in the land of Egypt seventeen years. So the days of Jacob, the years of his life, were one hundred forty-seven years. The time drew near that Israel must die, and he called his son Joseph, and said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, please put your hand under my thigh, and deal kindly and truly with me. Please don't bury me in Egypt, but when I sleep with my fathers, you shall carry me out of Egypt, and bury me in their burying place. He said, I will do as you have said. He said, Swear to me. And he swore to him. Israel bowed himself on the bed's head. Chapter 48 Jacob blesses Ephraim and Manasseh. It happened after these things that someone said to Joseph, Behold, your father is sick. He took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Someone told Jacob and said, Behold, your son Joseph comes to you. And Israel strengthened himself and sat on the bed. Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you, 
and will make of you a company of peoples, and will give this land to your seed after you for an everlasting possession. Now your two sons, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you into Egypt, are mine, Ephraim and Manasseh, even as Reuben and Simeon will be mine. Your issue, who you become the father of after them, will be yours. They will be called after the name of their brothers in their inheritance. As for me, when I came from Paddan, Rachel died by me in the land of Canaan in the way, when there was still some distance to come to Ephrath, and I buried her there in the way to Ephrath. The same is Bethlehem. Israel saw Joseph's sons and said, Who are these? Joseph said to his father, They are my sons, whom God has given me here. He said, Please bring them to me, and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim for age, so that he couldn't see. He brought them near to him. And he kissed them, and embraced them. Israel said to Joseph, I didn't think I would see your face. And behold, God has let me see your seed also. Joseph brought them out from between his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand, toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near to him. Israel stretched out his right hand, and laid it on Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, guiding his hands knowingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. He blessed Joseph, and said, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God who has fed me all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, and let my name be named on them, and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac. Let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. When Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. He held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. Joseph said to his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. His father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He also will become a people, and he also will be great. However, his younger brother will be greater than he, and his seed will become a multitude of nations. He blessed them that day, saying, in you will Israel bless, saying, God make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. He set Ephraim before Manasseh. Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I am dying, but God will be with you and bring you again to the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to you one portion above your brothers, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. Chapter 49 Jacob Blesses His Sons Jacob called to his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which will happen to you in the days to come. Assemble yourselves, 
and hear, you sons of Jacob. Listen to Israel, your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, excelling in dignity and excelling in power. Boiling over as water, you shall not excel, because you went up to your father's bed, then defiled it. He went up to my couch. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are weapons of violence. My soul don't come into their counsel. My glory don't be united to their assembly, for in their anger they killed men. In their self-will they hamstrung cattle. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion, as a lioness. Who will rouse him up? The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs. To him will the obedience of the peoples be. Binding his foal to the vine, his donkey's coat to the choice vine. He has washed his garments in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes will be red with wine, his teeth white with milk. Zebulun will dwell at the haven of the sea. He will be for a haven of ships. His border will be on Sidon. Issachar is a strong donkey lying down between the saddlebags. He saw a resting place that it was good, the land that it was pleasant. He bows his shoulder to the burden and becomes a servant doing forced labor. Dan will judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan will be a serpent in the way, an adder in the path that bites the horse's heels so that his rider falls backward. I have waited for your salvation, Yahweh. A troop will press on Gad but he will press on their heel. Asher's food will be rich. He will yield royal dainties. Naphtali is a doe set free who bears beautiful fawns. Joseph is a fruitful vine, a fruitful vine by a spring. His branches run over the wall. The archers have severely grieved him, shot at him, and persecuted him. But his bow remained strong. The arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the Mighty One of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Even by the God of your Father, who will help you, by the Almighty, who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies below, 
blessings of the breasts and of the womb. The blessings of your father have prevailed above the blessings of your ancestors, above the boundaries of the ancient hills. They will be on the head of Joseph, on the crown of the head of him who is separated from his brothers. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning, he will devour the prey. At evening, he will divide the spoil. All these are the twelve tribes of Israel, and this is what their father spoke to them and blessed them. He blessed everyone according to his blessing. The Death of Jacob He instructed them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephron the Hittite as a burial place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. And there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is therein, which was purchased from the children of Heth. When Jacob made an end of charging his sons, he gathered up his feet into the bed and yielded up the spirit and was gathered to his people. Chapter 50 Mourning and Burial of Jacob Joseph fell on his father's face, wept on him, and kissed him. Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father, and the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were fulfilled for him, for that is how many days it takes to embalm. The Egyptians wept for him for seventy days. When the days of weeping for him were past, Joseph spoke to the house of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found favor in your eyes, please speak in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, Behold, I am dying. Bury me in my grave which I have dug for myself in the land of Canaan. Now, therefore, please let me go up and bury my father, and I will come again. Pharaoh said, Go up and bury your father, just like he made you swear. Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house, all the elders of the land of Egypt, all the house of Joseph, his brothers, and his father's house, only their little ones, their flocks, and their herds, they left in the land of Goshen. There went up with him both chariots and horsemen. It was a very great company. They came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, and there they lamented with a very great and severe lamentation. He mourned for his father seven days. When the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning in the floor of Atad, they said, This is a grievous mourning by the Egyptians. Therefore its name was called Abel Mizraim, which is beyond the Jordan. His sons did to him just as he commanded them, for his sons carried him into the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah, which Abraham bought with the field for a possession of a burial site from Ephron the Hittite before Mamre. Joseph returned into Egypt, he and his brothers, and all that went up with him to bury his father after he had buried his father. Joseph comforts his brothers. 
When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and will fully pay us back for all of the evil which we did to him. They sent a message to Joseph, saying, Your father commanded before he died, saying, You shall tell Joseph, Now please forgive the disobedience of your brothers and their sin, because they did evil to you. Now please forgive the disobedience of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we are your servants. Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save many people alive. Now, therefore, don't be afraid. I will nourish you and your little ones. He comforted them and spoke kindly to them. The Death of Joseph Joseph lived in Egypt, he and his father's house. Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw Ephraim's children to the third generation. The children also of Maker, the son of Manasseh, were born on Joseph's knees. Joseph said to his brothers, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Exodus Chapter 1 The Israelites Multiply in Egypt Now these are the names of the sons of Israel, who came into Egypt. Every man and his household came with Jacob. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the souls who came out of Jacob's body were seventy souls, and Joseph was in Egypt already. Joseph died, as did all his brothers, and all that generation. The children of Israel were fruitful, and increased abundantly, and multiplied, and grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Oppression by a New Pharaoh Now there arose a new king over Egypt, who didn't know Joseph. He said to his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply, and it happen that, when any war breaks out, they also join themselves to our enemies, and fight against us, and escape out of the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them, to afflict them with their burdens. They built storage cities for Pharaoh, Python, and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread out. They were grieved because of the children of Israel. The Egyptians ruthlessly made the children of Israel serve, and they made their lives bitter with hard service, in mortar and in brick, and in all kinds of service in the field. All their service in which they ruthlessly made them serve. Pharaoh orders male children killed. The king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of the one was Shifra, and the name of the other Pua. And he said, 
When you perform the duty of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, then you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and didn't do what the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the baby boys alive. The king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing and have saved the boys alive? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women aren't like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very mighty. It happened because the midwives feared God that he gave them families. Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, You shall cast every son who is born into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. Chapter 2 The Birth of Moses A man of the house of Levi went and took a daughter of Levi as his wife. The woman conceived and bore a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. When she could no longer hide him, she took a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and with pitch. She put the child in it and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. His sister stood far off to see what would be done to him. Pharaoh's Daughter Rescues Moses Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe at the river. Her maidens walked along by the riverside. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her handmaid to get it. She opened it and saw the child, and behold, the baby cried. She had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Should I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. The maiden went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. The woman took the child and nursed it. The child grew and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, and said, Because I drew him out of the water. Moses Kills an Egyptian It happened in those days, when Moses had grown up, that he went out to his brothers, and looked at their burdens. He saw an Egyptian striking a Hebrew, one of his brothers. He looked this way and that way, and when he saw that there was no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. He went out the second day, and behold, two men of the Hebrews were fighting with each other. He said to him who did the wrong, Why do you strike your fellow? He said, Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you plan to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Moses was afraid and said, Surely this thing is known. Moses flees to Midian. Now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and lived in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters. They came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. The shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. When they came to Ruel, their father, he said, How is it that you have returned so early today? They said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds, and moreover he drew water for us and watered the flock. He said to his daughters, Where is he? Why is it that you have left the man? Call him, that he may eat bread. 
Moses was content to dwell with the man. He gave Moses Zipporah, his daughter. She bore a son, and he named him Gershom, for he said, I have lived as a foreigner in a foreign land. God hears the Israelites cry. It happened in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed because of the bondage, and they cried, and their cry came up to God because of the bondage. God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the children of Israel, and God was concerned about them. Chapter 3 Moses at the Burning Bush Now Moses was keeping the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the wilderness and came to God's mountain, to Horeb. The angel of Yahweh appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Moses said, I will turn aside now and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. When Yahweh saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. He said, Here I am. He said, Don't come close. Take your sandals off of your feet, for the place you are standing on is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Yahweh said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Now behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me. Moreover, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Moses said to God, Who am I, that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, Certainly I will be with you. This will be the token to you that I have sent you. When you have brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Behold, when I come to the children of Israel and tell them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What should I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, You shall tell the children of Israel this, I am has sent me to you. God said moreover to Moses, You shall tell the children of Israel this, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. Go 
and gather the elders of Israel together, and tell them, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, I have surely visited you, and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, to a land flowing with milk and honey. They will listen to your voice, and you shall come, you and the elders of Israel, to the king of Egypt, and you shall tell him, Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Now, please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to Yahweh, our God, I know that the king of Egypt won't give you permission to go. No, not by a mighty hand. I will put forth my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders which I will do in its midst. And after that, he will let you go. I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it will happen that when you go, you shall not go empty-handed, but every woman shall ask of her neighbor, and of her who visits her house, jewels of silver, jewels of gold, and clothing, and you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters. You shall plunder the Egyptians. Chapter 4 Moses' staff. Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me, nor listen to my voice. For they will say, Yahweh has not appeared to you. Yahweh said to him, What is that in your hand? He said, A rod. He said, Throw it on the ground. He threw it on the ground and it became a snake, and Moses ran away from it. Yahweh said to Moses, Put forth your hand, and take it by the tail. He put forth his hand and laid hold of it, and it became a rod in his hand. That they may believe that Yahweh, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Moses' hand. Yahweh said furthermore to him, Now put your hand inside your cloak. He put his hand inside his cloak, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous, as white as snow. He said, Put your hand inside your cloak again. He put his hand inside his cloak again, and when he took it out of his cloak, Behold, it had turned again as his other flesh. It will happen, if they will neither believe you, nor listen to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. It will happen, if they will not believe even these two signs, neither listen to your voice, that you shall take of the water of the river, and pour it on the dry land. The water which you take out of the river will become blood on the dry land. The Appointment of Aaron Moses said to Yahweh, O Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before now nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Yahweh said to him, who made man's mouth, or who makes one mute, or deaf, or seeing, or blind? Isn't it I, Yahweh? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth, and teach you what you shall speak. 
he said. Oh, Lord, please send someone else. The anger of Yahweh was kindled against Moses, and he said, What about Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Also, behold, he comes forth to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and will teach you what you shall do. He will be your spokesman to the people, and it will happen that he will be to you a mouth, and you will be to him as God. You shall take this rod in your hand, with which you shall do the signs. Moses Leaves for Egypt Moses went and returned to Jethro his father-in-law, and said to him, Please, let me go and return to my brothers who are in Egypt and see whether they are still alive. Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. Yahweh said to Moses in Midian, Go, return into Egypt, for all the men who sought your life are dead. Moses took his wife and his sons and set them on a donkey, and he returned to the land of Egypt. Moses took God's rod in his hand. Yahweh said to Moses, When you go back into Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the wonders which I have put in your hand. But I will harden his heart, and he will not let the people go. You shall tell Pharaoh, Thus says Yahweh, Israel is my son, my firstborn, and I have said to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. And you have refused to let him go. Behold, I will kill your son, your firstborn. It happened on the way, at a lodging place, that Yahweh met Moses and wanted to kill him. Then Zipporah took a flint and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet, and she said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. Then she said, You are a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. The people believe Moses and Aaron. Yahweh said to Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. He went and met him on God's mountain, and kissed him. Moses told Aaron all the words of Yahweh with which he had sent him, and all the signs with which he had instructed him. Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. Aaron spoke all the words which Yahweh had spoken to Moses, and did the signs in the sight of the people. The people believed. And when they heard that Yahweh had visited the children of Israel, and that he had seen their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshipped. Chapter 5 Pharaoh's First Refusal Afterward Moses and Aaron came and said to Pharaoh, This is what Yahweh, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, Who is Yahweh, that I should listen to his voice to let Israel go? I don't know Yahweh, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. They said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please, let us go three days' journey into the wilderness, and sacrifice to Yahweh, our God, lest he fall on us with pestilence or with the sword. The king of Egypt said to them, Why do you, Moses and Aaron, take the people from their work? Get back to your burdens, Pharaoh said. Behold, the people of the land are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens. 
bricks, and straw. The same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, You shall no longer give the people straw to make brick as before. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. The number of the bricks which they made before you require from them. You shall not diminish anything of it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let heavier work be laid on the men, that they may labor therein, and don't let them pay any attention to lying words. The taskmasters of the people went out, and their officers, and they spoke to the people, saying, This is what Pharaoh says, I will not give you straw. Go yourselves, get straw where you can find it, for nothing of your work shall be diminished. So the people were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. The taskmasters were urgent, saying, Fulfill your work quota daily, as when there was straw. The officers of the children of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and demanded, Why haven't you fulfilled your quota, both yesterday and today, in making brick as before? THE ISRAELITES CRY Then the officers of the children of Israel came and cried to Pharaoh, saying, Why do you deal this way with your servants? No straw is given to your servants, and they tell us, Make brick, and behold, your servants are beaten, but the fault is in your own people. But he said, You are idle, you are idle. Therefore you say, Let us go and sacrifice to Yahweh. Go therefore now and work, for no straw shall be given to you, yet you shall deliver the same number of bricks. The officers of the children of Israel saw that they were in trouble, when it was said, You shall not diminish anything from your daily quota of bricks. They met Moses and Aaron, who stood in the way as they came forth from Pharaoh, and they said to them, May Yahweh look at you and judge, because you have made us a stench to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servants, to put his sword in their hand, to kill us. Moses returned to Yahweh and said, Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? Why is it that you have sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble on this people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. Chapter 6 God Promises Deliverance Yahweh said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for by a strong hand he shall let them go, and by a strong hand he shall drive them out of his land. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am Yahweh, and I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name Yahweh I was not known to them. I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their travels, in which they lived as aliens. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, tell the children of Israel, I am Yahweh, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments, and I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God, and you shall know that I am Yahweh, your God, who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, 
and I will give it to you for a heritage. I am Yahweh. Moses spoke to the children of Israel, but they didn't listen to Moses for anguish of spirit and for cruel bondage. Moses and Aaron sent to Pharaoh. Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Go in, speak to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, that he let the children of Israel go out of his land. Moses spoke before Yahweh, saying, Behold, the children of Israel haven't listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me, who am of uncircumcised lips? Genealogies of Moses and Aaron Yahweh spoke to Moses and to Aaron, and gave them a command to the children of Israel and to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. These are the heads of their fathers' houses, the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, Hanuk and Palu, Hezron and Carmi. These are the families of Reuben, the sons of Simeon, Jemuel and Jamin and Ohad, and Jekin, and Zohar, and Shaul, the son of a Canaanite woman. These are the families of Simeon. These are the names of the sons of Levi, according to their generations, Gershon, and Kohath, and Merari. And the years of the life of Levi were 137 years, the sons of Gershon, Libni, and Shimei, according to their families. The sons of Kohath, Amram, and Izhar, and Hebron, and Uziel. And the years of the life of Kohath were 133 years. The sons of Merari, Malai, and Mushai. These are the families of the Levites, according to their generations. Amram took Jochebed, his father's sister, to himself as wife, and she bore him Aaron and Moses. And the years of the life of Amram were a hundred and thirty-seven years. The sons of Izhar, Korah, and Nepheg, and Zikri, the sons of Uziel, Mishael, and Elzaphan, and Sithri. Aaron took Elisheba, the daughter of Amenadab, the sister of Nashon, as his wife. And she bore him Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar, the sons of Korah, Asir, and Elkanah, and Abiasaph. These are the families of the Korahites. Eleazar, Aaron's son, took one of the daughters of Putiel as his wife, and she bore him Phinehas. These are the heads of the fathers' houses of the Levites, according to their families. Moses and Aaron's Story Recounted These are that Aaron and Moses, to whom Yahweh said, Bring out the children of Israel from the land of Egypt according to their armies. These are those who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring out the children of Israel from Egypt. These are that Moses and Aaron. It happened on the day that Yahweh spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, that Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, I am Yahweh. Speak to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I speak to you. Moses said before Yahweh, Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips, and how shall Pharaoh listen to me? Chapter 7 I will stretch out my hand. Yahweh said to Moses, Behold, 
I have made you as God to Pharaoh, and Aaron your brother shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and Aaron your brother shall speak to Pharaoh, that he let the children of Israel go out of his land. I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh will not listen to you, and I will lay my hand on Egypt, and bring forth my armies, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. The Egyptians shall know that I am Yahweh, when I stretch forth my hand on Egypt, and bring out the children of Israel from among them. Moses and Aaron did so. As Yahweh commanded them, so they did. Moses was eighty years old, and Aaron eighty-three years old, when they spoke to Pharaoh. Aaron's staff becomes a serpent. Yahweh spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, when Pharaoh speaks to you, saying, Perform a miracle, then you shall tell Aaron, Take your rod, and cast it down before Pharaoh, that it become a serpent. Moses and Aaron went in to Pharaoh, and they did so, as Yahweh had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh, and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called for the wise men and the sorcerers. They also, the magicians of Egypt, did the same thing with their enchantments. For they each cast down their rods, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he didn't listen to them, as Yahweh had spoken. THE FIRST PLAGUE BLOOD Yahweh said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is stubborn. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning. Behold, he goes out to the water, and you shall stand by the river's bank to meet him. And the rod which was turned to a serpent you shall take in your hand. You shall tell him, Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to you, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. And behold, until now you haven't listened. Thus says Yahweh, In this you shall know that I am Yahweh. Behold, I will strike with the rod that is in my hand on the waters which are in the river, and they shall be turned to blood. The fish that are in the river shall die, and the river shall become foul, and the Egyptians shall loathe to drink water from the river. Yahweh said to Moses, Tell Aaron, Take your rod, and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers, over their streams, and over their pools, and over all their ponds of water, that they may become blood. And there shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. Moses and Aaron did so, as Yahweh commanded. And he lifted up the rod and struck the waters that were in the river, in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants. And all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. The fish that were in the river died, and the river became foul. And the Egyptians couldn't drink water from the river, and the blood was throughout all the land of Egypt. The magicians of Egypt did the same thing with their enchantments, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he didn't listen to them as Yahweh had spoken. Pharaoh turned and went into his house, neither did he lay even this to heart. All the Egyptians dug around the river for water to drink, for they couldn't drink of the water of the river. 
Seven days were fulfilled after Yahweh had struck the river. Chapter 8 The Second Plague Frogs Yahweh spoke to Moses, Go in to Pharaoh and tell him, This is what Yahweh says, Let my people go, that they may serve me. If you refuse to let them go, behold, I will plague all your borders with frogs, and the river shall swarm with frogs, which shall go up and come into your house, and into your bedroom, and on your bed, and into the house of your servants, and on your people, and into your ovens, and into your kneading troughs. And the frogs shall come up both on you, and on your people, and on all your servants. Yahweh said to Moses, Tell Aaron, Stretch forth your hand with your rod over the rivers, over the streams, and over the pools, and cause frogs to come up on the land of Egypt. Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. The magicians did the same thing with their enchantments and brought up frogs on the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat Yahweh that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go, that they may sacrifice to Yahweh. Moses said to Pharaoh, I give you the honor of setting the time that I should pray for you and for your servants and for your people, that the frogs be destroyed from you and your houses and remain in the river only. He said, Tomorrow. He said, Be it according to your word, that you may know that there is none like Yahweh our God. The frogs shall depart from you and from your houses and from your servants and from your people. They shall remain in the river only. Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses cried to Yahweh concerning the frogs which he had brought on Pharaoh. Yahweh did according to the word of Moses, and the frogs died out of the houses, out of the courts, and out of the fields. They gathered them together in heaps, and the land stank. But when Pharaoh saw that there was a respite, he hardened his heart and didn't listen to them, as Yahweh had spoken. The Third Plague Lice Yahweh said to Moses, Tell Aaron, Stretch out your rod and strike the dust of the earth, that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. They did so, and Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and struck the dust of the earth, and there were lice on man and on animal. All the dust of the earth became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. The magicians tried with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they couldn't. There were lice on man and on animal. Then the magicians said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he didn't listen to them, as Yahweh had spoken. The fourth plague, flies. Yahweh said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh. Behold, he comes forth to the water and tell him, this is what Yahweh says. Let my people go, that they may serve me. Else, if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you, and on your servants, and on your people, and into your houses, and the houses of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies, and also the ground whereon they are. I will set apart in that day the land of Goshen 
in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there. To the end you may know that I am Yahweh in the midst of the earth. I will put a division between my people and your people. By tomorrow shall this sign be. Yahweh did so, and there came grievous swarms of flies into the house of Pharaoh, and into his servants' houses, and in all the land of Egypt. The land was corrupted by reason of the swarms of flies. Pharaoh's heart hardened. Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron, and said, Go, sacrifice to your God in the land. Moses said, It isn't appropriate to do so, for we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to Yahweh our God. Behold, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes, and won't they stone us? We will go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to Yahweh our God, as he shall command us. Pharaoh said, I will let you go, that you may sacrifice to Yahweh your God in the wilderness. Only you shall not go very far away. Pray for me. Moses said, Behold, I go out from you, and I will pray to Yahweh that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people, tomorrow. Only don't let Pharaoh deal deceitfully any more in not letting the people go to sacrifice to Yahweh. Moses went out from Pharaoh and prayed to Yahweh. Yahweh did according to the word of Moses, and he removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people. There remained not one. Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also, and he didn't let the people go. End of Section 5 Chapter 9 The Fifth Plague, Livestock then Yahweh said to Moses, Go in to Pharaoh and tell him, This is what Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, says, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and hold them still, behold, the hand of Yahweh is on your livestock, which are in the field, on the horses, on the donkeys, on the camels, on the herds, and on the flocks with a very grievous pestilence. Yahweh will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, and nothing shall die of all that belongs to the children of Israel. Yahweh appointed a set time, saying, Tomorrow, Yahweh shall do this thing in the land. Yahweh did that thing on the next day, and all the livestock of Egypt died. But of the livestock of the children of Israel, not one died. Pharaoh sent, and behold, there was not so much as one of the livestock of the Israelites dead. But the heart of Pharaoh was stubborn, and he didn't let the people go. The Sixth Plague Boils Yahweh said to Moses and to Aaron, Take to you handfuls of ashes of the furnace, and let Moses sprinkle it toward the sky in the sight of Pharaoh. It shall become small dust over all the land of Egypt, and shall be a boil breaking forth with boils on man and on animal, throughout all the land of Egypt. They took ashes of the furnace and stood before Pharaoh, and Moses sprinkled it up toward the sky, and it became a boil, breaking forth with boils on man and on animal. 
The magicians couldn't stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils were on the magicians and on all the Egyptians. Yahweh hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he didn't listen to them, as Yahweh had spoken to Moses. The Seventh Plague, Hell Yahweh said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and tell him, This is what Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, says. Let my people go, that they may serve me. For this time I will send all my plagues against your heart, against your officials, and against your people, that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. For now I would have put forth my hand, and struck you and your people with pestilence, and you would have been cut off from the earth. But indeed, for this cause I have made you stand, to show you my power, and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth, as you still exalt yourself against my people, that you won't let them go. Behold, tomorrow about this time, I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail, such as has not been in Egypt since the day it was founded, even until now. Now, therefore, command all of your livestock and all that you have in the field be brought into shelter. Every man and animal that is found in the field and isn't brought home, the hail shall come down on them, and they shall die. Those who feared the word of Yahweh among the servants of Pharaoh made their servants and their livestock flee into the houses. Whoever didn't respect the word of Yahweh left his servants and his livestock in the field. Yahweh said to Moses, Stretch forth your hand toward the sky, that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, on man and on animal, and on every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. Moses stretched forth his rod toward the heavens, and Yahweh sent thunder, hail, and lightning flashed down to the earth. Yahweh rained hail on the land of Egypt. So there was very severe hail, and lightning mixed with the hail, such as had not been in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. The hail struck throughout all the land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and animal. And the hail struck every herb of the field and broke every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, there was no hail. Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said to them, I have sinned this time. Yahweh is righteous, and I and my people are wicked. Pray to Yahweh, for there has been enough of mighty thunderings and hell. I will let you go, and you shall stay no longer. Moses said to him, As soon as I have gone out of the city, I will spread abroad my hands to Yahweh. The thunders shall cease, neither shall there be any more hell, that you may know that the earth is Yahweh's. But as for you and your servants, I know that you don't yet fear Yahweh God. The flax and the barley were struck, for the barley was in the ear, and the flax was in bloom. But the wheat and the spelt were not struck, for they had not grown up. Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh, and spread abroad his hands to Yahweh, and the thunders and hail ceased, and the rain was not poured on the earth. When Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunders were ceased, he sinned yet more and hardened his heart, he and his servants. The heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he didn't let the children of Israel go, just as Yahweh had spoken through Moses. Chapter 10 The Eighth Plague, Locusts Yahweh said to Moses, Go in to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart, 
and the heart of his servants, that I may show these my signs in the midst of them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and of your son's son what things I have done to Egypt, and my signs which I have done among them, that you may know that I am Yahweh. Moses and Aaron went in to Pharaoh and said to him, This is what Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, says. How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go, that they may serve me. Or else, if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your country, and they shall cover the surface of the earth, so that one won't be able to see the earth. They shall eat the residue of that which has escaped, which remains to you from the hail, and shall eat every tree which grows for you out of the field. Your houses shall be filled, and the houses of all your servants, and the houses of all the Egyptians, as neither your fathers nor your fathers' fathers have seen, since the day that they were on the earth to this day. He turned and went out from Pharaoh. Pharaoh's servants said to him, how long will this man be a snare to us? Let the men go, that they may serve Yahweh, their God. Don't you yet know that Egypt is destroyed? Moses and Aaron were brought again to Pharaoh, and he said to them, Go, serve Yahweh, your God. But who are those who will go? Moses said, We will go with our young and with our old with our sons and with our daughters, with our flocks and with our herds will we go, for we must hold a feast to Yahweh. He said to them, Yahweh be with you if I will let you go with your little ones. See, evil is clearly before your faces. Not so. Go now, you who are men, and serve Yahweh, for that is what you desire. They were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. Yahweh said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, that they may come up on the land of Egypt and eat every herb of the land, even all that the hail has left. Moses stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt, and Yahweh brought an east wind on the land all that day and all the night, and when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. The locusts went up over all the land of Egypt and rested in all the borders of Egypt. They were very grievous. Before them there were no such locusts as they, neither after them shall be such. For they covered the surface of the whole earth so that the land was darkened, and they ate every herb of the land and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left. There remained nothing green, either tree or herb of the field, through all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste, and he said, I have sinned against Yahweh your God and against you. Now, therefore, please forgive my sin again and pray to Yahweh your God that he may also take away from me this death. He went out from Pharaoh and prayed to Yahweh. Yahweh turned an exceeding strong west wind, which took up the locusts and drove them into the Red Sea. There remained not one locust in all the borders of Egypt. But Yahweh hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he didn't let the children of Israel go. The Ninth Plague, Darkness Yahweh said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward the sky, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. Moses stretched forth his hand toward the sky, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They didn't see one another, neither did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwelling. Pharaoh called to Moses and said, Go, serve Yahweh, 
Only let your flocks and your herds stay behind. Let your little ones also go with you. Moses said, You must also give into our hand sacrifices and burnt offerings, that we may sacrifice to Yahweh our God. Our livestock also shall go with us. Not a hoof shall be left behind, for of it we must take to serve Yahweh our God. And we don't know with what we must serve Yahweh until we come there. But Yahweh hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he wouldn't let them go. Pharaoh said to him, Get away from me. Be careful to see my face no more. For in the day you see my face, you shall die. Moses said, You have spoken well. I will see your face again no more. Chapter 11 The Plague on the Firstborn Foretold Yahweh said to Moses, Yet one plague more will I bring on Pharaoh and on Egypt. Afterwards, he will let you go. When he lets you go, he will surely thrust you out altogether. Speak now in the ears of the people, and let them ask every man of his neighbor, and every woman of her neighbor, jewels of silver, and jewels of gold. Yahweh gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of the people. Moses said, This is what Yahweh says, About midnight I will go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the female servant who is behind the meal, and all the firstborn of livestock. There shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there has not been, nor shall be any more. But against any of the children of Israel, a dog won't even bark or move its tongue against man or animal that you may know that Yahweh makes a distinction between the Egyptians and Israel. All these your servants shall come down to me and bow down themselves to me, saying, Get out with all the people who follow you. And after that I will go out. He went out from Pharaoh in hot anger. Yahweh said to Moses, Pharaoh won't listen to you that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and Yahweh hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he didn't let the children of Israel go out of his land. Chapter 12 The First Passover Yahweh spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be to you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household, and if the household is too little for a lamb, then he and his neighbor next to his house shall take one according to the number of the souls. According to what everyone can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You shall take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at evening. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel, on the houses in which they shall eat it. They shall eat the flesh in that night, roasted with fire and unleavened bread. 
They shall eat it with bitter herbs. Don't eat it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but roast it with fire, with its head, its legs, and its inner parts. You shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, but that which remains of it until the morning you shall burn with fire. This is how you shall eat it, with your belt on your waist, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is Yahweh's Passover. For I will go through the land of Egypt in that night, and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and animal. Against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am Yahweh. The blood shall be to you for a token on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and there shall no plague be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. The Feast of Unleavened Bread This day shall be to you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to Yahweh. Throughout your generations you shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Even the first day you shall put away yeast out of your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. In the first day there shall be to you a holy convocation, and in the seventh day a holy convocation. No kind of work shall be done in them, except that which every man must eat. That only may be done by you. You shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For in this same day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations by an ordinance forever. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month, at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread, until the twenty-first day of the month, at evening. Seven days shall there be no yeast found in your houses, for whoever eats that which is leavened, that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he be a foreigner or one who is born in the land. You shall eat nothing leavened. In all your habitations you shall eat unleavened bread. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel, and said to them, Draw out, and take lambs according to your families, and kill the Passover. You shall take a bunch of hyssop, and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lentil, and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin, and none of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. For Yahweh will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lentil and on the two doorposts, Yahweh will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. You shall observe this thing for an ordinance to you and to your sons forever. It shall happen when you have come to the land which Yahweh will give you, according as he has promised, that you shall keep this service. It will happen when your children ask you, What do you mean by this service? That you shall say, It is the sacrifice of Yahweh's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt, when he struck the Egyptians and spared our houses. The people bowed their heads and worshipped. The children of Israel went and did so, as Yahweh had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. The Tenth Plague, Death of Firstborn It happened at midnight that Yahweh struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, 
from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of livestock. Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. The Exodus Begins He called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up, get out from among my people, both you and the children of Israel, and go, serve Yahweh as you have said. Take both your flocks and your herds, as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also. The Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste, for they said, We are all dead men. The people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes on their shoulders. The children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and they asked of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and clothing. Yahweh gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they let them have what they asked. They despoiled the Egyptians. The children of Israel traveled from Ramesses to Succoth, about 600,000 on foot who were men, besides children. A mixed multitude went up also with them, with flocks, herds, and even very much livestock. They baked unleavened cakes of the dough which they brought forth out of Egypt, for it wasn't leavened, because they were thrust out of Egypt and couldn't wait, neither had they prepared for themselves any food. Now the time that the children of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. It happened at the end of 430 years, even the same day it happened, that all the armies of Yahweh went out from the land of Egypt. It is a night to be much observed to Yahweh for bringing them out from the land of Egypt. This is that night of Yahweh, to be much observed of all the children of Israel throughout their generations. Instructions for the Passover Yahweh said to Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat of it, but every man's servant who is bought for money, when you have circumcised him, then shall he eat of it. A foreigner and a hired servant shall not eat of it. In one house shall it be eaten, you shall not carry forth anything of the flesh abroad out of the house, neither shall you break a bone of it. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. When a stranger shall live as a foreigner with you, and will keep the Passover to Yahweh, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as one who is born in the land, but no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. One law shall be to him who is born at home and to the stranger who lives as a foreigner among you. All the children of Israel did so, as Yahweh commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. It happened the same day that Yahweh brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their armies. Chapter 13 Dedication of the Firstborn Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Sanctify to me all of the firstborn. Whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of animal, it is mine. Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage. For by strength of hand, Yahweh brought you out from this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. This day you go forth in the month Ibib. It shall be when Yahweh shall bring you into the land of the Canaanite 
and the Hittite, and the Amorite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite, which he swore to your fathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, that you shall keep this service in this month. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and in the seventh day shall be a feast to Yahweh. Unleavened bread shall be eaten throughout the seven days, and no leavened bread shall be seen with you, neither shall there be yeast seen with you in all your borders. You shall tell your son in that day, saying, It is because of that which Yahweh did for me when I came forth out of Egypt. It shall be for a sign to you on your hand, and for a memorial between your eyes, that the law of Yahweh may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand Yahweh has brought you out of Egypt. You shall, therefore, keep this ordinance in its season from year to year. It shall be when Yahweh shall bring you into the land of the Canaanite, as he swore to you and to your fathers, and shall give it to you, that you shall set apart to Yahweh all that opens the womb, and every firstborn which you have that comes from an animal. The males shall be Yahweh's. Every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb, and if you will not redeem it, then you shall break its neck, and you shall redeem all the firstborn of man among your sons. It shall be when your son asks you in time to come, saying, What is this that you shall tell him? By strength of hand Yahweh brought us out from Egypt, from the house of bondage. And it happened, when Pharaoh would hardly let us go, that Yahweh killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of animal. Therefore I sacrifice to Yahweh all that opens the womb, being males. But all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. It shall be for a sign on your hand, and for symbols between your eyes, for by strength of hand Yahweh brought us forth out of Egypt. The Pillars of Cloud and Fire It happened, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God didn't lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, Lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war, and they return to Egypt. But God led the people around by the way of the wilderness, by the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up armed out of the land of Egypt. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had made the children of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones away from here with you. They took their journey from Succoth, and encamped in Etham, in the edge of the wilderness. Yahweh went before them, by day in a pillar of cloud, to lead them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire, to give them light, that they might go by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day, and the pillar of fire by night, didn't depart from before the people. Chapter 14 Pharaoh Pursues the Israelites Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they turn back and encamp before Piahiroth, between Migdal and the sea, before baal Zephon. You shall encamp opposite it by the sea. Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, They are entangled in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will follow after them, and I will get honor over Pharaoh and over all his armies, and the Egyptians shall know that I am Yahweh. They did so. It was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was changed towards the people. And they said, What is this we have done? that we have let Israel go from serving us. He prepared his chariot and took his army with him. 
and he took six hundred chosen chariots, and all the chariots of Egypt, and captains over all of them. Yahweh hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. For the children of Israel went out with a high hand. The Egyptians pursued after them. All the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen, and his army, and overtook them in camping by the sea, beside Pyahiroth before Baal Zephon. When Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they were very afraid. The children of Israel cried out to Yahweh. They said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you treated us this way, to bring us forth out of Egypt? Isn't this the word we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, Leave us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it were better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Moses said to the people, Don't be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of Yahweh which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall never see them again. Yahweh will fight for you, and you shall be still. Parting the Red Sea Yahweh said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Speak to the children of Israel, that they go forward. Lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea, and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go into the midst of the sea on dry ground. I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall go in after them. And I will get myself honor over Pharaoh, and over all his armies, over his chariots, and over his horsemen. The Egyptians shall know that I am Yahweh when I have gotten myself honor over Pharaoh, over his chariots, and over his horsemen. The angel of God, who went before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. It came between the camp of Egypt and the camp of Israel, and there was the cloud and the darkness yet gave it light by night, and the one didn't come near the other all the night. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and Yahweh caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all the night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. The children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all of Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. It happened in the morning watch that Yahweh looked out on the Egyptian army through the pillar of fire and of cloud and confused the Egyptian army. He took off their chariot wheels and they drove them heavily, so that the Egyptians said, Let's flee from the face of Israel, for Yahweh fights for them against the Egyptians. Yahweh said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come again on the Egyptians, on their chariots, and on their horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its strength when the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it. Yahweh overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen, even all Pharaoh's army that went in after them into the sea. There remained not so much as one of them. But the children of Israel walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus Yahweh saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. 
and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work which Yahweh did to the Egyptians, and the people feared Yahweh, and they believed in Yahweh and in his servant Moses. Chapter 15 Moses' Song of Deliverance then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to Yahweh, and said, I will sing to Yahweh, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. Yahweh is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my father's God, and I will exalt him. Yahweh is a man of war. Yahweh is his name. He has cast Pharaoh's chariots and his army into the sea. His chosen captains are sunk in the Red Sea. The deeps cover them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, Yahweh, is glorious in power. Your right hand, Yahweh, dashes the enemy in pieces. In the greatness of your excellency, you overthrow those who rise up against you. You send forth your wrath. It consumes them as stubble. With the blast of your nostrils, the waters were piled up. The floods stood upright as a heap. The deeps were congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue. I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My desire shall be satisfied on them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind. The sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, Yahweh, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. You, in your loving kindness, have led the people that you have redeemed. You have guided them in your strength to your holy habitation. The peoples have heard. They tremble. Pangs have taken hold on the inhabitants of Philistia. Then the chiefs of Edom were dismayed. Trembling takes hold of the mighty men of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan are melted away. Terror and dread falls on them. By the greatness of your arm, they are as steel as a stone. Until your people pass over, Yahweh, until the people pass over who you have purchased, you shall bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, the place Yahweh, which you have made for yourself to dwell in, the sanctuary, Lord, which your hands have established. Yahweh shall reign forever and ever. For the horses of Pharaoh went in with his chariots and with his horsemen into the sea, and Yahweh brought back the waters of the sea on them. But the children of Israel walked on dry land in the midst of the sea. Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and with dances. Miriam answered them, Sing to Yahweh, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Waters of Mara. Moses led Israel onward from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness, and found no water. When they came to Marah, they couldn't drink from the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore its name was called Marah. The people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Then he cried to Yahweh, Yahweh showed him a tree, and he threw it into the waters, and the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. And he said, 
if you will diligently listen to the voice of Yahweh your God, and will do that which is right in his eyes, and will pay attention to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have put on the Egyptians, for I am Yahweh who heals you. They came to Elam, where there were twelve springs of water, and seventy palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. Chapter 16 Manna and Quail from Heaven They took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. The whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, We wish that we had died by the hand of Yahweh in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots, when we ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from the sky for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them, whether they will walk in my law or not. It shall come to pass on the sixth day that they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. Moses and Aaron said to all the children of Israel, At evening, then you shall know that Yahweh has brought you out from the land of Egypt, and in the morning, then you shall see the glory of Yahweh, because he hears your murmurings against Yahweh. Who are we that you murmur against us? Moses said, Now Yahweh shall give you meat to eat in the evening, and in the morning bread to satisfy you, because Yahweh hears your murmurings which you murmur against him. And who are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against Yahweh. Moses said to Aaron, Tell all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before Yahweh, for he has heard your murmurings. It happened, as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of Yahweh appeared in the cloud. Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak to them, saying, At evening you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am Yahweh your God. It happened at evening that quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay around the camp. When the dew that lay had gone, behold, on the surface of the wilderness was a small round thing, small as the frost on the ground. When the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, What is it? For they didn't know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread which Yahweh has given you to eat. This is the thing which Yahweh has commanded. Gather of it every one according to his eating, and omer a head. According to the number of your persons, you shall take it, every man for those who are in his tent. The children of Israel did so, and gathered, some more, some less. When they measured it with an omer, he who gathered much had nothing over, and he who gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to his eating. Moses said to them, Let no one leave of it until the morning. Notwithstanding, they didn't listen to Moses but some of them left of it until the morning, and it bred worms, and became foul, 
and Moses was angry with them. They gathered it morning by morning, everyone according to his eating. When the sun grew hot, it melted. The Sabbath Observed It happened that on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each one, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. He said to them, This is that which Yahweh has spoken. Tomorrow is a solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to Yahweh. Bake that which you want to bake, and boil that which you want to boil, and all that remains over lay up for yourselves to be kept until the morning. They laid it up until the morning, as Moses asked, and it didn't become foul neither was there any worm in it. Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath to Yahweh. Today you shall not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath. In it there shall be none. It happened on the seventh day that some of the people went out to gather, and they found none. Yahweh said to Moses, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? Behold, because Yahweh has given you the Sabbath, therefore he gives you on the sixth day the bread of two days. Everyone stay in his place. Let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. The house of Israel called its name manna, and it was like coriander seed, white, and its taste was like wafers with honey. Moses said, This is the thing which Yahweh has commanded. Let an omer full of it be kept throughout your generations, that they may see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness, when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. Moses said to Aaron, Take a pot, and put an omer full of manna in it, and lay it up before Yahweh, to be kept throughout your generations. As Yahweh commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony, to be kept. The children of Israel ate the manna forty years, until they came to an inhabited land. They ate the manna until they came to the borders of the land of Canaan. Now an omer is the tenth part of an ephah. Chapter 17 Water from the Rock All the congregation of the children of Israel traveled from the wilderness of sin by their journeys according to Yahweh's commandment and encamped in Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test Yahweh? The people were thirsty for water there, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to kill us, our children and our livestock, with thirst? Moses cried to Yahweh, saying, What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. Yahweh said to Moses, Walk on before the people, and take the elders of Israel with you, and take the rod in your hand, with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because the children of Israel quarreled, and because they tested Yahweh, saying, Is Yahweh among us or not? THE DEFEAT OF THE AMALEKITES Then Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, 
choose men for us, and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with God's rod in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had told him, and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. It happened, when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. His hands were steady until sunset. Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Yahweh said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under the sky. Moses built an altar and called its name Yahweh our banner. He said, Yahweh has sworn, Yahweh will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Chapter 18 The Visit of Jethro Now Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, how that Yahweh had brought Israel out of Egypt. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, received Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her away and her two sons. The name of one son was Gershom, for Moses said, I have lived as a foreigner in a foreign land. The name of the other was Eliezer, for he said, My father's God was my help and delivered me from Pharaoh's sword. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses into the wilderness where he was encamped at the mountain of God. He said to Moses, I, your father-in-law Jethro, have come to you with your wife, and her two sons with her. Moses went out to meet his father-in-law, and bowed and kissed him. They asked each other of their welfare, and they came into the tent. Moses told his father-in-law all that Yahweh had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardships that had come on them on the way, and how Yahweh delivered them. Jethro rejoiced for all the goodness which Yahweh had done to Israel, in that he had delivered them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Jethro said, Blessed be Yahweh, who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh, who has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that Yahweh is greater than all gods, because of the thing in which they dealt arrogantly against them. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and sacrifices for God. Aaron came with all of the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. Jethro advises Moses. It happened on the next day that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood around Moses from the morning to the evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said, What is this thing that you do for the people? Why do you sit alone, and all the people stand around you from morning to evening? Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God, when they have a matter, they come to me, and I judge between a man and his neighbor, and I make them know the statutes of God and his laws. Moses' father-in-law said to him, The thing that you do is not good. You will surely wear away both you and this people that is with you, for the thing is too heavy for you. 
you are not able to perform it yourself alone. Listen now to my voice. I will give you counsel, and God be with you. You represent the people before God and bring the causes to God. You shall teach them the statutes and the laws and shall show them the way in which they must walk and the work that they must do. Moreover, you shall provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating unjust gain, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. Let them judge the people at all times. It shall be that every great matter they shall bring to you, but every small matter they shall judge themselves. So shall it be easier for you, and they shall share the load with you. If you will do this thing, and God commands you so, then you will be able to endure, and all of these people also will go to their place in peace. So Moses listened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. They judged the people at all times. They brought the hard causes to Moses, but every small matter they judged themselves. Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went his way into his own land. Chapter 19 Israel at Mount Sinai in the third month after the children of Israel had gone forth out of the land of Egypt, on that same day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. When they had departed from Rephidim and had come to the wilderness of Sinai, they encamped in the wilderness. And there Israel encamped before the mountain. Moses went up to God, and Yahweh called to him out of the mountain, saying, this is what you shall tell the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession from among all peoples for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Moses came and called for the elders of the people and set before them all these words which Yahweh commanded him. All the people answered together and said, all that Yahweh has spoken, we will do. Moses reported the words of the people to Yahweh. Yahweh said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with you, and may also believe you forever. Moses told the words of the people to Yahweh. Yahweh said to Moses, Go to the people, and sanctify them, today and tomorrow, and let them wash their garments, and be ready against the third day. For on the third day Yahweh will come down in the sight of all the people on Mount Sinai. You shall set bounds to the people all around, saying, Be careful that you don't go up onto the mountain, or touch its border. Whoever touches the mountain shall be surely put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether it is animal or man, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come up to the mountain. Moses went down from the mountain to the people, 
and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. He said to the people, Be ready by the third day. Don't have sexual relations with a woman. It happened on the third day, when it was morning, that there were thunders and lightnings, and a thick cloud on the mountain, and the sound of an exceedingly loud trumpet, and all the people who were in the camp trembled. Moses led the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the lower part of the mountain. The Lord Visits Sinai Mount Sinai, all of it, smoked, because Yahweh descended on it in fire, and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him by a voice. Yahweh came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. Yahweh called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Yahweh said to Moses, Go down, warn the people lest they break through to Yahweh to gaze, and many of them perish. Let the priests also, who come near to Yahweh, sanctify themselves, lest Yahweh break forth on them. Moses said to Yahweh, The people can't come up to Mount Sinai, for you warned us, saying, Set bounds around the mountain and sanctify it. Yahweh said to him, Go down, and you shall bring Aaron up with you. But don't let the priests and the people break through to come up to Yahweh, lest he break forth on them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. Chapter 20 The Ten Commandments God spoke all these words, saying, I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves an idol, nor any image of anything that is in the heavens above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow yourself down to them, nor serve them. For I, Yahweh your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and on the fourth generation of those who hate me, and showing loving kindness to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of Yahweh your God in vain, for Yahweh will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You shall labor six days and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to Yahweh your God. You shall not do any work in it, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your livestock, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days Yahweh made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land which Yahweh your God gives you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, 
nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Moses comforts the people. All the people perceived the thunderings, the lightnings, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. When the people saw it, they trembled and stayed at a distance. They said to Moses, Speak with us yourself, and we will listen. But don't let God speak with us, lest we die. Moses said to the people, Don't be afraid, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, that you won't sin. The people stayed at a distance, and Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. Idolatry Forbidden Yahweh said to Moses, This is what you shall tell the children of Israel. You yourselves have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall most certainly not make alongside of me gods of silver or gods of gold for yourselves. The Altar of Sacrifice You shall make an altar of earth for me, and shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your cattle. In every place where I record my name, I will come to you, and I will bless you. If you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it of cut stones, for if you lift up your tool on it, you have polluted it. Neither shall you go up by steps to my altar, that your nakedness may not be exposed to it. End of section six. Chapter 21 Laws for Servants Now these are the ordinances which you shall set before them. If you buy a Hebrew servant, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh he shall go out free without paying anything. If he comes in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he is married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master gives him a wife, and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. But if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him to God, and shall bring him to the door or to the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. If a man sells his daughter to be a female servant, she shall not go out as the male servants do. If she doesn't please her master, who has married her to himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. He shall have no right to sell her to a foreign people, since he has dealt deceitfully with her. If he marries her to his son, he shall deal with her as a daughter. If he takes another wife to himself, he shall not diminish her food, her clothing, and her marital rights. If he doesn't do these three things for her, she may go free without paying any money. Personal Injury Laws One who strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death, but not if it is unintentional, but God allows it to happen. Then I will appoint you a place where he shall flee. If a man schemes and comes presumptuously on his neighbor to kill him, you shall take him from my altar that he may die. 
Anyone who attacks his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. Anyone who kidnaps someone and sells him, or if he is found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. Anyone who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. If men quarrel and one strikes the other with a stone or with his fist, and he doesn't die, but is confined to bed, if he rises again and walks around with his staff, then he who struck him shall be cleared. Only he shall pay for the loss of his time, and shall provide for his healing until he is thoroughly healed. If a man strikes his servant or his maid with a rod, and he dies under his hand, he shall surely be punished. Notwithstanding, if he gets up after a day or two, he shall not be punished, for he is his property. If men fight and hurt a pregnant woman, so that she gives birth prematurely, and yet no harm follows, he shall be surely fined as much as the woman's husband demands, and the judges allow. But if any harm follows, then you must take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, and bruise for bruise. If a man strikes his servant's eye, or his maid's eye, and destroys it, he shall let him go free for his eye's sake. If he strikes out his male servant's tooth, or his female servant's tooth, he shall let him go free for his tooth's sake. If a bull gores a man or a woman to death, the bull shall surely be stoned, and its flesh shall not be eaten. But the owner of the bull shall not be held responsible. But if the bull had a habit of goring in the past, and it has been testified to its owner, and he has not kept it in, but it has killed a man or a woman, the bull shall be stoned, and its owner shall also be put to death. If a ransom is laid on him, then he shall give for the redemption of his life whatever is laid on him. Whether it has gored a son or has gored a daughter, according to this judgment, it shall be done to him. If the bull gores a male servant or a female servant, thirty shekels of silver shall be given to their master, and the ox shall be stoned. Laws About Restitution If a man opens a pit, or if a man digs a pit and doesn't cover it, and a bull or a donkey falls into it, the owner of the pit shall make it good. He shall give money to its owner, and the dead animal shall be his. If one man's bull injures another's, so that it dies, then they shall sell the live bull and divide its price, and they shall also divide the dead animal. Or if it is known that the bull was in the habit of goring in the past, and its owner has not kept it in, he shall surely pay bull for bull, and the dead animal shall be his own. Chapter 22 Property Laws if a man steals an ox or a sheep and kills it or sells it, he shall pay five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. If the thief is found breaking in and is struck so that he dies, there shall be no guilt of bloodshed for him. If the sun has risen on him, guilt of bloodshed shall be for him he shall make restitution. If he has nothing, 
then he shall be sold for his theft. If the stolen property is found in his hand alive, whether it is ox, donkey, or sheep, he shall pay double. If a man causes a field or vineyard to be eaten, and lets his animal loose, and it grazes in another man's field, he shall make restitution from the best of his own field, and from the best of his own vineyard. If fire breaks out and catches in thorns, so that the shocks of grain, or the standing grain, or the field are consumed, he who kindled the fire shall surely make restitution. If a man delivers to his neighbor money or stuff to keep, and it is stolen out of the man's house, if the thief is found, he shall pay double. If the thief isn't found, then the master of the house shall come near to God to find out if he hasn't put his hand to his neighbor's goods. For every matter of trespass, whether it be for ox, for donkey, for sheep, for clothing, or for any kind of lost thing about which one says, This is mine, the cause of both parties shall come before God. He whom God condemns shall pay double to his neighbor. If a man delivers to his neighbor a donkey, an ox, a sheep, or any animal to keep, and it dies, or is injured, or driven away, no man seeing it. The oath of Yahweh shall be between them both. Whether he hasn't put his hand to his neighbor's goods, and its owner shall accept it, and he shall not make restitution. But if it is stolen from him, he shall make restitution to its owner. If it is torn in pieces, let him bring it for evidence. He shall not make good that which was torn. If a man borrows anything of his neighbors, and it is injured or dies, its owner not being with it, he shall surely make restitution. If its owner is with it, he shall not make it good. If it is a least thing, it came for its least. Laws of Social Responsibility If a man entices a virgin who isn't pledged to be married and lies with her, he shall surely pay dowry for her to be his wife. If her father utterly refuses to give her to him, he shall pay money according to the dowry of virgins. You shall not allow a sorceress to live. Whoever has sex with an animal shall surely be put to death. He who sacrifices to any god except to Yahweh only shall be utterly destroyed. You shall not wrong an alien, neither shall you oppress him, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. You shall not take advantage of any widow or fatherless child. If you take advantage of them at all, and they cry out at all to me, I will surely hear their cry, and my wrath will grow hot, and I will kill you with the sword, and your wives shall be widows, and your children fatherless. If you lend money to any of my people with you who is poor, you shall not be to him as a creditor neither shall you charge him interest. If you take your neighbor's garment as collateral, you shall restore it to him before the sun goes down, for that is his only covering. It is his garment for his skin. What would he sleep in? It will happen when he cries to me that I will hear, for I am gracious. You shall not blaspheme God, nor curse a ruler of your people. You shall not delay to offer from your harvest and from the outflow of your presses. You shall give the firstborn of your sons to me. 
you shall do likewise with your cattle and with your sheep. Seven days it shall be with its mother, then on the eighth day you shall give it to me. You shall be holy men to me, therefore you shall not eat any flesh that is torn by animals in the field. You shall cast it to the dogs. Chapter 23 Justice and Mercy You shall not spread a false report. Don't join your hand with the wicked to be a malicious witness. You shall not follow a crowd to do evil. Neither shall you testify in court to side with a multitude to pervert justice. Neither shall you favor a poor man in his cause. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall surely bring it back to him again. If you see the donkey of him who hates you fallen down under his burden, don't leave him. You shall surely help him with it. You shall not deny justice to your poor people in their lawsuits. Keep far from a false charge, and don't kill the innocent and righteous, for I will not justify the wicked. You shall take no bribe, for a bribe blinds those who have sight, and perverts the words of the righteous. You shall not oppress an alien, for you know the heart of an alien since you were aliens in the land of Egypt. Sabbath Laws For six years you shall sow your land, and shall gather in its increase. But the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, that the poor of your people may eat, and what they leave the animal of the field shall eat. In the same way, you shall deal with your vineyard and with your olive grove. Six days you shall do your work, and on the seventh day you shall rest, that your ox and your donkey may have rest, and the son of your handmaid and the alien may be refreshed. Be careful to do all things that I have said to you, and don't invoke the name of other gods, neither let them be heard out of your mouth. Three Yearly Feasts You shall observe a feast to me three times a year. You shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, as I commanded you, at the time appointed in the month I bib, for in it you came out from Egypt and no one shall appear before me empty. And the feast of harvest, the first fruits of your labors, which you sow in the field, and the feast of harvest at the end of the year, when you gather in your labors out of the field. Three times in the year all your males shall appear before the Lord Yahweh. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread, neither shall the fat of my feast remain all night until the morning. The first of the first fruits of your ground you shall bring into the house of Yahweh your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. God's Angel to Lead Behold, I send an angel before you, to keep you by the way, and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Pay attention to him, and listen to his voice. Don't provoke him, for he will not pardon your disobedience, for my name is in him. But if you indeed listen to his voice, and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to your enemies, and an adversary to your adversaries. For my angel shall go before you, and bring you in to the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Canaanite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, 
and I will cut them off. You shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor follow their practices, but you shall utterly overthrow them, and demolish their pillars. You shall serve Yahweh your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness away from your midst. No one will miscarry or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. I will send my terror before you, and will confuse all the people to whom you come, and I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. I will send the hornet before you, which will drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, and the Hittite from before you. I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate, and the animals of the field multiply against you. Little by little I will drive them out from before you, until you have increased and inherit the land. I will set your border from the Red Sea even to the Sea of the Philistines, and from the wilderness to the river, for I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you shall drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. Chapter 24 The Covenant Sealed He said to Moses, Come up to Yahweh, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship from a distance. Moses alone shall come near to Yahweh, but they shall not come near, neither shall the people go up with him. Moses came and told the people all the words of Yahweh and all the ordinances, and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which Yahweh has spoken will we do. Moses wrote all the words of Yahweh and rose up early in the morning, and built an altar under the mountain, and twelve pillars for the twelve tribes of Israel. He sent young men of the children of Israel, who offered burnt offerings, and sacrificed peace offerings of cattle to Yahweh. Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. He took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people, and they said, all that Yahweh has spoken will we do, and be obedient. Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people, and said, Look, this is the blood of the covenant, which Yahweh has made with you, concerning all these words. Then Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel went up. They saw the God of Israel, under his feet was like a paved work of sapphire stone, like the skies for clearness. He didn't lay his hand on the nobles of the children of Israel. They saw God and ate and drank. Moses on the Mountain Yahweh said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and stay here and I will give you the tables of stone with the law and the commands that I have written, that you may teach them. Moses rose up with Joshua, his servant, and Moses went up onto God's mountain. He said to the elders, Wait here for us until we come again to you. Behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever is involved in a dispute can go to them. Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of Yahweh settled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. The seventh day he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. The appearance of the glory of Yahweh was like devouring fire on the top of the mountain 
in the eyes of the children of Israel. Moses entered into the midst of the cloud and went up on the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain forty days and forty nights. Chapter 25 Offerings for the Tabernacle Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they take an offering for me. From everyone whose heart makes him willing, you shall take my offering. This is the offering which you shall take from them, gold, silver, brass, blue, purple, scarlet, fine linen, goat's hair, ram's skins dyed red, sea cow hides, acacia wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil and for the sweet incense, onyx stones, and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastplate. Let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them, according to all that I show you, the pattern of the tabernacle, and the pattern of all of its furniture, even so you shall make it. The Ark of the Covenant They shall make an ark of acacia wood, its length shall be two and a half cubits, its breadth a cubit and a half, and a cubit and a half its height. You shall overlay it with pure gold. You shall overlay it inside and outside, and you shall make a gold molding around it. You shall cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in its four feet. Two rings shall be on the one side of it, and two rings on the other side of it. You shall make poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with gold. You shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark. The poles shall be in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. You shall put the testimony which I shall give you into the ark. The Mercy Seat You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its breadth. You shall make two cherubim of hammered gold. You shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at the one end, and one cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim on its two ends of one piece with the mercy seat. The cherubim shall spread out their wings upward, covering the mercy seat with their wings, with their faces toward one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. There I will meet with you, and I will tell you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim which are on the ark of the testimony, all that I command you for the children of Israel. The Table of Showbread You shall make a table of acacia wood, Two cubits shall be its length, and a cubit its breadth, and one and a half cubits its height. You shall overlay it with pure gold, and make a gold molding around it. You shall make a rim of a hand breadth around it. You shall make a golden molding on its rim around it. You shall make four rings of gold for it and put the rings in the four corners that are on its four feet. The rings shall be close to the rim, for places for the poles to carry the table. You shall make the poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with gold, that the table may be carried with them. You shall make its dishes, its spoons, its ladles, and its bowls to pour out offerings with, 
you shall make them of pure gold. You shall set bread of the presence on the table before me always. The Golden Lampstand You shall make a lampstand of pure gold. Of hammered work shall the lampstand be made, even its base, its shaft, its cups, its buds, and its flowers shall be of one piece with it. There shall be six branches going out of its sides, three branches of the lampstand out of its one side, and three branches of the lampstand out of its other side, three cups made like almond blossoms in one branch, a bud and a flower, and three cups made like almond blossoms in the other branch, a bud and a flower, so for the six branches going out of the lampstand, and in the lampstand four cups made like almond blossoms, its buds and its flowers, and a bud under two branches of one piece with it, and a bud under two branches of one piece with it, and a bud under two branches of one piece with it, for the six branches going out of the lampstand. Their buds and their branches shall be of one piece with it, all of it one beaten work of pure gold. You shall make its lamps seven, and they shall light its lamps to give light to the space in front of it. Its snuffers and its snuff dishes shall be of pure gold. It shall be made of a talent of pure gold with all these accessories. See that you make them after their pattern, which has been shown to you on the mountain. Chapter 26 The Ten Curtains of the Tabernacle Moreover, you shall make the tabernacle with ten curtains, of fine twined linen, and blue, and purple, and scarlet, with cherubim, the work of the skillful workman you shall make them. The length of each curtain shall be twenty-eight cubits, and the breadth of each curtain four cubits. All the curtains shall have one measure. Five curtains shall be coupled together, one to another, and the other five curtains shall be coupled one to another. You shall make loops of blue on the edge of the one curtain from the edge in the coupling. And likewise you shall make in the edge of the curtain that is outmost in the second coupling. You shall make fifty loops in the one curtain. And you shall make fifty loops in the edge of the curtain that is in the second coupling. The loops shall be opposite one to another. You shall make fifty clasps of gold and couple the curtains one to another with the clasps, and the tabernacle shall be a unit. The Eleven Curtains of Goat's Hair You shall make curtains of goat's hair for a covering over the tabernacle. You shall make them eleven curtains. The length of each curtain shall be thirty cubits, and the breadth of each curtain four cubits. The eleven curtains shall have one measure. You shall couple five curtains by themselves, and six curtains by themselves, and shall double over the sixth curtain in the forefront of the tent. You shall make fifty loops on the edge of the one curtain that is outmost in the coupling, and fifty loops on the edge of the curtain which is outmost in the second coupling. You shall make fifty clasps of brass, and put the clasps into the loops, and couple the tent together, that it may be one. The overhanging part that remains of the curtains of the tent, the half curtain that remains, shall hang over the back of the tabernacle. The cubit on the one side, and the cubit on the other side, of that which remains in the length of the curtains of the tent shall hang over the sides of the tabernacle, on this side and on that side, to cover it. You shall make a covering for the tent 
of ram's skins dyed red, and a covering of sea cow hides above. The Boards and Sockets You shall make the boards for the tabernacle of acacia wood, standing up. Ten cubits shall be the length of a board, and one and a half cubits the breadth of each board. There shall be two tenons in each board, joined to one another. Thus you shall make for all the boards of the tabernacle. You shall make the boards for the tabernacle, twenty boards for the south side southward. You shall make forty sockets of silver under the twenty boards, two sockets under one board for its two tenons, and two sockets under another board for its two tenons. For the second side of the tabernacle, on the north side, twenty boards, and there forty sockets of silver, two sockets under one board, and two sockets under another board. For the far part of the tabernacle, westward, you shall make six boards. You shall make two boards for the corners of the tabernacle in the far part. They shall be double beneath and in the same way they shall be whole to its top to one ring. Thus shall it be for them both. They shall be for the two corners. There shall be eight boards, and their sockets of silver, sixteen sockets, two sockets under one board, and two sockets under another board. You shall make bars of acacia wood, five for the boards of the one side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the boards of the other side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the boards of the side of the tabernacle for the far part westward. The middle bar in the midst of the boards shall pass through from end to end. You shall overlay the boards with gold and make their rings of gold for places for the bars and you shall overlay the bars with gold. You shall set up the tabernacle according to the way that it was shown to you on the mountain. The Veil for the Ark You shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen with cherubim. The work of the skillful workman shall it be made. You shall hang it on four pillars of acacia, overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be of gold, on four sockets of silver. You shall hang up the veil under the clasps, and shall bring the ark of the testimony in there within the veil. And the veil shall separate the holy place from the most holy for you. You shall put the mercy seat on the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. You shall set the table outside the veil, and the lampstand over against the table on the side of the tabernacle toward the south, and you shall put the table on the north side. The Curtain for the Door You shall make a screen for the door of the tent, of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen, the work of the embroiderer. You shall make for the screen five pillars of acacia, and overlay them with gold. Their hooks shall be of gold, and you shall cast five sockets of brass for them. Chapter 27 The Bronze Altar You shall make the altar of acacia wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad. The altar shall be four square, and its height shall be three cubits. You shall make its horns on its four corners. Its horns shall be of one piece with it, and you shall overlay it with brass. You shall make its pots to take away its ashes, its shovels, its basins, its flesh hooks, and its firepans. All its vessels you shall make of brass. You shall make a grating for it of network of brass, 
and on the net you shall make four bronze rings in its four corners. You shall put it under the ledge around the altar beneath, that the net may reach halfway up the altar. You shall make poles for the altar, poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with brass. Its poles shall be put into the rings, and the rings shall be on the two sides of the altar when carrying it. You shall make it with hollow planks. They shall make it as it has been shown you on the mountain. The Courtyard You shall make the court of the tabernacle. For the south side, southward, there shall be hangings for the court, a fine twined linen, one hundred cubits long for one side and its pillars shall be twenty, and their sockets twenty, of brass. The hooks of the pillars and their fillets shall be of silver. Likewise for the north side in length there shall be hangings one hundred cubits long, and its pillars twenty, and their sockets twenty, of brass the hooks of the pillars and their fillets of silver for the breadth of the court on the west side shall be hangings of fifty cubits their pillars ten and their sockets ten the breadth of the court on the east side eastward shall be fifty cubits the hangings for the one side of the gate shall be fifteen cubits their pillars three, and their sockets three. For the other side shall be hangings of fifteen cubits, their pillars three, and their sockets three. For the gate of the court shall be a screen of twenty cubits, of blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine twined linen, the work of the embroiderer their pillars four, and their sockets four. All the pillars of the court around shall be filleted with silver, their hooks of silver, and their sockets of brass. The length of the court shall be one hundred cubits, and the breadth fifty everywhere, and the height five cubits of fine twined linen, and their sockets of brass. All the instruments of the tabernacle in all its service, and all its pins, and all the pins of the court, shall be of brass. The Oil for the Lamps You shall command the children of Israel that they bring to you pure olive oil, beaten for the light, to cause a lamp to burn continually. In the tent of meeting, outside the veil which is before the testimony, Aaron and his sons shall keep it in order, from evening to morning, before Yahweh. It shall be a statute forever, throughout their generations, on the behalf of the children of Israel. Chapter 28 Garments for the Priests Bring Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him, near to you from among the children of Israel, that he may minister to me in the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. You shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. You shall speak to all who are wise-hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they make Aaron's garments to sanctify him, that he may minister to me in the priest's office. These are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate, and an ephod, and a robe, and a coat of checkerwork, a turban, and a sash. 
and they shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother and his sons, that he may minister to me in the priest's office. They shall take the gold, and the blue, and the purple, and the scarlet, and the fine linen. The Ephod They shall make the ephod of gold, of blue, and purple, scarlet, and fine twined linen, the work of the skillful workman. It shall have two shoulder straps joined to the two ends of it, that it may be joined together, the skillfully woven band which is on it, that is on him, shall be like its work, and of the same piece, of gold, of blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine twined linen. You shall take two onyx stones, and engrave on them the names of the children of Israel, six of their names on the one stone, and the names of the six that remain on the other stone, in the order of their birth, with the work of an engraver in stone, like the engravings of a signet, you shall engrave the two stones, according to the names of the children of Israel. You shall make them to be enclosed in settings of gold. You shall put the two stones on the shoulder straps of the ephod, to be stones of memorial for the children of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before Yahweh on his two shoulders for a memorial. You shall make settings of gold and two chains of pure gold. You shall make them like cords of braided work, and you shall put the braided chains on the settings. The Breast Piece you shall make a breastplate of judgment, the work of the skillful workman, like the work of the ephod you shall make it, of gold, of blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine twined linen you shall make it. It shall be square and folded double. A span shall be its length of it, and a span its breadth. You shall set in it settings of stones, four rows of stones, a row of ruby, topaz, and beryl shall be the first row, and the second row a turquoise, a sapphire, and an emerald, and the third row a jacinth, an agate, and an amethyst, and the fourth row a chrysolite, an onyx, and a jasper. They shall be enclosed in gold in their settings. The stones shall be according to the names of the children of Israel, twelve according to their names, like the engravings of a signet, every one according to his name. They shall be for the twelve tribes. You shall make on the breastplate chains like cords of braided work of pure gold, you shall make on the breastplate two rings of gold, and shall put the two rings on the two ends of the breastplate. You shall put the two braided chains of gold in the two rings at the ends of the breastplate. The other two ends of the two braided chains you shall put on the two settings, and put them on the shoulder straps of the ephod in its forepart. You shall make two rings of gold, and you shall put them on the two ends of the breastplate, on its edge, which is toward the side of the ephod inward. You shall make two rings of gold, and shall put them on the two shoulder straps of the ephod underneath, in its forepart, close by its coupling, above the skillfully woven band of the ephod. They shall bind the breastplate by its rings to the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue, that it may be on the skillfully woven band of the ephod, and that the breastplate may not swing out from the ephod. Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel 
in the breastplate of judgment on his heart when he goes in to the holy place for a memorial before Yahweh continually. You shall put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be on Aaron's heart when he goes in before Yahweh. And Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel on his heart before Yahweh continually. Additional Priestly Garments you shall make the robe of the ephod all of blue. It shall have a hole for the head in its midst. It shall have a binding of woven work around its hole, as it were the hole of a coat of mail, that it not be torn. On its hem you shall make pomegranates of blue and of purple and of scarlet around its hem and bells of gold between and around them. A golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate, around the hem of the robe. It shall be on Aaron to minister, and its sound shall be heard when he goes in to the holy place before Yahweh, and when he comes out, that he not die. You shall make a plate of pure gold, and engrave on it, like the engravings of a signet, holy to Yahweh. You shall put it on a lace of blue, and it shall be on the sash, on the front of the sash it shall be. It shall be on Aaron's forehead, and Aaron shall bear the iniquity of the holy things, which the children of Israel shall make holy in all their holy gifts and it shall be always on his forehead, that they may be accepted before Yahweh. You shall weave the coat in checker work of fine linen, and you shall make a turban of fine linen, and you shall make a sash, the work of the embroiderer. You shall make coats for Aaron's sons, and you shall make sashes for them, and you shall make headbands for them for glory and for beauty. You shall put them on Aaron your brother, and on his sons with him, and shall anoint them, and consecrate them, and sanctify them, that they may minister to me in the priest's office. You shall make them linen breeches to cover the flesh of their nakedness. From the waist even to the thighs they shall reach, they shall be on Aaron and on his sons when they go in to the tent of meeting or when they come near to the altar to minister in the holy place that they don't bear iniquity and die. It shall be a statute forever to him and to his descendants after him. Chapter 29 Consecration of the Priests This is the thing that you shall do to them, to make them holy, to minister to me in the priest's office. Take one young bull and two rams without blemish, unleavened bread, unleavened cakes mixed with oil, and unleavened wafers anointed with oil. You shall make them of fine wheat flour. You shall put them into one basket, and bring them in the basket, with the bull and the two rams. You shall bring Aaron and his sons to the door of the tent of meeting, and shall wash them with water. You shall take the garments and put on Aaron the coat, the robe of the ephod, the ephod, and the breastplate, and clothe him with the skillfully woven band of the ephod, and you shall set the turban on his head, and put the holy crown on the turban. Then you shall take the anointing oil, and pour it on his head, and anoint him. You shall bring his sons, and put coats on them. You shall clothe them with belts, Aaron and his sons, and bind headbands on them. And they shall have the priesthood by a perpetual statute. 
and you shall consecrate Aaron and his sons. Order of the Sacrifices You shall bring the bull before the tent of meeting, and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the bull. You shall kill the bull before Yahweh at the door of the tent of meeting. You shall take of the blood of the bull and put it on the horns of the altar with your finger. And you shall pour out all the blood at the base of the altar. You shall take all the fat that covers the innards, the cover of the liver, the two kidneys, and the fat that is on them and burn them on the altar. But the flesh of the bull, and its skin, and its dung, you shall burn with fire outside of the camp. It is a sin offering. You shall also take the one ram, and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the ram. You shall kill the ram, and you shall take its blood, and sprinkle it around on the altar. You shall cut the ram into its pieces, and wash its innards and its legs, and put them with its pieces and with its head. You shall burn the whole ram on the altar. It is a burnt offering to Yahweh. It is a pleasant aroma, an offering made by fire to Yahweh. You shall take the other ram, and Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the ram. Then you shall kill the ram, and take some of its blood, and put it on the tip of the right ear of Aaron, and on the tip of the right ear of his sons, and on the thumb of their right hand, and on the big toe of their right foot and sprinkle the blood around on the altar. You shall take of the blood that is on the altar, and of the anointing oil, and sprinkle it on Aaron, and on his garments, and on his sons, and on the garments of his sons with him. And he shall be made holy, and his garments, and his sons, and his sons' garments with him. Also, you shall take some of the ram's fat, the fat tail, the fat that covers the innards, the cover of the liver, the two kidneys, the fat that is on them, and the right thigh, for it is a ram of consecration, and one loaf of bread, one cake of oiled bread, and one wafer out of the basket of unleavened bread that is before Yahweh. You shall put all of this in Aaron's hands, and in his son's hands, and shall wave them for a wave offering before Yahweh. You shall take them from their hands, and burn them on the altar on the burnt offering, for a pleasant aroma before Yahweh. It is an offering made by fire to Yahweh. You shall take the breast of Aaron's ram of consecration and wave it for a wave offering before Yahweh, and it shall be your portion. You shall sanctify the breast of the wave offering and the thigh of the wave offering, which is waved and which is heaved up of the ram of consecration, even of that which is for Aaron, and of that which is for his sons. And it shall be for Aaron and his sons as their portion for ever from the children of Israel. For it is a wave offering. And it shall be a wave offering from the children of Israel of the sacrifices of their peace offerings, even their wave offering to Yahweh. The holy garments of Aaron shall be for his sons after him, to be anointed in them, and to be consecrated in them. Seven days shall the son who is priest in his place put them on, when he comes into the tent of meeting to minister in the holy place. 
food for the priests. You shall take the ram of consecration and boil its flesh in a holy place. Aaron and his sons shall eat the flesh of the ram and the bread that is in the basket at the door of the tent of meeting. They shall eat those things with which atonement was made to consecrate and sanctify them. But a stranger shall not eat of it because they are holy. If anything of the flesh of the consecration or of the bread remains to the morning, then you shall burn the remainder with fire. It shall not be eaten, because it is holy. You shall do so to Aaron and to his sons, according to all that I have commanded you. You shall consecrate them seven days. Every day you shall offer the bull of sin offering for atonement, and you shall cleanse the altar when you make atonement for it, and you shall anoint it to sanctify it. Seven days you shall make atonement for the altar and sanctify it, and the altar shall be most holy, Whatever touches the altar shall be holy. The Daily Offerings Now this is that which you shall offer on the altar. Two lambs a year old, day by day continually. The one lamb you shall offer in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at evening. And with the one lamb a tenth part of an ephah of fine flour mixed with the fourth part of a hen of beaten oil, and the fourth part of a hen of wine for a drink offering. The other lamb you shall offer at evening, and shall do to it according to the meal offering of the morning, and according to its drink offering, for a pleasant aroma, an offering made by fire to Yahweh. It shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tent of meeting before Yahweh, where I will meet with you to speak there to you. There I will meet with the children of Israel, and the place shall be sanctified by my glory. I will sanctify the tent of meeting and the altar. Aaron also, and his sons, I will sanctify, to minister to me in the priest's office. God will dwell among the people. I will dwell among the children of Israel, and will be their God. They shall know that I am Yahweh their God who brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am Yahweh their God. Chapter 30 The Altar of Incense You shall make an altar to burn incense on. You shall make it of acacia wood. Its length shall be a cubit, and its breadth a cubit. It shall be square, and its height shall be two cubits. Its horns shall be of one piece with it. You shall overlay it with pure gold, its top, its sides around it, and its horns. And you shall make a gold molding around it. You shall make two golden rings for it under its molding, on its two ribs, on its two sides you shall make them, and they shall be for places for poles with which to bear it. You shall make the poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with gold. You shall put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat, that is over the testimony, where I will meet with you. 
Aaron shall burn incense of sweet spices on it every morning. When he tends the lamps, he shall burn it. When Aaron lights the lamps at evening, he shall burn it. A perpetual incense before Yahweh throughout your generations. You shall offer no strange incense on it, nor burnt offering, nor meal offering, and you shall pour no drink offering on it. Aaron shall make atonement on its horns once in the year, with the blood of the sin offering of atonement once in the year. He shall make atonement for it throughout your generations. It is most holy to Yahweh. THE ATONEMENT MONEY Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, When you take a census of the children of Israel, according to those who are numbered among them, then each man shall give a ransom for his soul to Yahweh, when you number them, that there be no plague among them when you number them. They shall give this, everyone who passes over to those who are numbered, half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary. The shekel is twenty gerars. Half a shekel for an offering to Yahweh. Everyone who passes over to those who are numbered, from twenty years old and upward, shall give the offering to Yahweh. The rich shall not give more, and the poor shall not give less than the half shekel when they give the offering of Yahweh to make atonement for your souls. You shall take the atonement money from the children of Israel and shall appoint it for the service of the tent of meeting, that it may be a memorial for the children of Israel before Yahweh to make atonement for your souls. The Bronze Basin Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, You shall also make a basin of brass, and its base of brass, in which to wash. You shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar, and you shall put water in it. Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet in it. When they go into the tent of meeting, they shall wash with water, that they not die, or when they come near to the altar to minister, to burn an offering made by fire to Yahweh. So they shall wash their hands and their feet, that they not die, and it shall be a statute forever to them, even to him and to his descendants throughout their generations. THE ANOINTING OIL Moreover, Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Also take fine spices of liquid myrrh, five hundred shekels, and of fragrant cinnamon, half as much, even two hundred and fifty, and of fragrant cane, two hundred and fifty, and of cassia, five hundred, after the shekel of the sanctuary, and a hen of olive oil. You shall make it a holy anointing oil, a perfume compounded after the art of the perfumer. It shall be a holy anointing oil. You shall use it to anoint the tent of meeting, the ark of the testimony, the table and all its articles, the lampstand and its accessories, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils, and the basin with its base. You shall sanctify them, that they may be most holy. Whatever touches them shall be holy. You shall anoint Aaron and his sons, and sanctify them, that they may minister to me in the priest's office. You shall speak to the children of Israel, saying, This shall be a holy anointing oil to me throughout your generations. It shall not be poured on man's flesh, neither shall you make any like it, 
according to its composition. It is holy. It shall be holy to you. Whoever compounds any like it, or whoever puts any of it on a stranger, he shall be cut off from his people. The Incense Yahweh said to Moses, Take to yourself sweet spices, gum resin, and onica, and galbanum, sweet spices with pure frankincense. Of each shall there be an equal weight, and you shall make incense of it, a perfume after the art of the perfumer, seasoned with salt, pure and holy. And you shall beat some of it very small, and put some of it before the testimony in the tent of meeting, where I will meet with you. It shall be to you most holy. The incense which you shall make, according to its composition, you shall not make for yourselves. It shall be to you holy for Yahweh. Whoever shall make any like that, to smell of it, he shall be cut off from his people. End of Section 7 Chapter 31 Bezalel and Aholiab the Craftsman Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Behold, I have called by name Beziel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, in wisdom, and in understanding, and in knowledge, and in all kinds of workmanship, to devise skillful works to work in gold, and in silver, and in brass, and in cutting of stones for setting, and in carving of wood, to work in all kinds of workmanship. I, behold, I have appointed with him Oholiab, the son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan, and in the heart of all who are wise-hearted, I have put wisdom, that they may make all that I have commanded you, the tent of meeting, the ark of the testimony, the mercy seat that is on it, all the furniture of the tent, the table and its vessels, the pure lampstand with all its vessels, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering with all its vessels, the basin, and its base, the finely worked garments, the holy garments for Aaron the priest, the garments of his sons to minister in the priest's office, the anointing oil, and the incense of sweet spices for the holy place. According to all that I have commanded you, they shall do. The Sign of the Sabbath Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Most certainly you shall keep my Sabbaths, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am Yahweh who sanctifies you. You shall keep this Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to Yahweh. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall surely be put to death. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations, for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel.
forever. For in six days Yahweh made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Moses receives the tablets. He gave to Moses, when he finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai, the two tablets of the testimony, stone tablets written with God's finger. Chapter 32 The Golden Calf When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Take off the golden rings, which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them to me. All the people took off the golden rings which were in their ears, and brought them to Aaron. He received what they handed him, and fashioned it with an engraving tool, and made it a molten calf. And they said, These are your gods, Israel, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation, and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to Yahweh. They rose up early on the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Moses informed of Israel's sin. Yahweh spoke to Moses, Go, get down, for your people, who you brought up out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed to it, and said, These are your gods, Israel, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Yahweh said to Moses, I have seen these people, and behold, they are a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, leave me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of you a great nation. Moses begged Yahweh his God, and said, Yahweh, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, that you have brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power, and with a mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians speak, saying, He brought them forth for evil, to kill them in the mountains, and to consume them from the surface of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath, and repent of this evil against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self, and said to them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of the sky, and all this land that I have spoken of I will give to your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. Yahweh repented of the evil which he said he would do to his people. Moses descends with the tablets. Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand tablets that were written on both their sides, on the one side and on the other they were written. The tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, engraved on the tables. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, There is the noise of war in the camp. He said, It isn't the voice of those who shout for victory. Neither is it the voice of those who cry for being overcome, but the noise of those who sing that I hear. Moses breaks the tablets. It happened as soon as he came near to the camp 
that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses' anger grew hot, and he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them beneath the mountain. He took the calf which they had made and burnt it with fire, ground it to powder, and scattered it on the water, and made the children of Israel drink of it. Moses said to Aaron, What did these people do to you, that you have brought a great sin on them? Aaron said, Don't let the anger of my Lord grow hot. You know the people, that they are set on evil. For they said to me, Make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. I said to them, Whoever has any gold, let them take it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. When Moses saw that the people had broken loose, for Aaron had led them loose for a derision among their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Whoever is on Yahweh's side, come to me. All the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. He said to them, Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, Every man put his sword on his thigh and go back and forth from gate to gate throughout the camp, and every man kill his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. The sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about three thousand men. Moses said, Consecrate yourselves today to Yahweh, yes, every man against his son and against his brother, that he may bestow on you a blessing this day. Moses intercedes for Israel. It happened on the next day that Moses said to the people, You have sinned a great sin. Now I will go up to Yahweh. Perhaps I shall make atonement for your sin. Moses returned to Yahweh and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made themselves gods of gold. Yet now, if you will, forgive their sin, and if not, please blot me out of your book which you have written. Yahweh said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Now go, lead the people to the place of which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angels shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I punish, I will punish them for their sin. Yahweh struck the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. Chapter 33 The Command to Leave Sinai Yahweh spoke to Moses, Depart, go up from here you and the people that you have brought up out of the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your seed. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite to a land flowing with milk and honey. For I will not go up in the midst of you, for you are a stiff-necked people, lest I consume you in the way. When the people heard this evil news, they mourned, and no one put on his jewelry. Yahweh said to Moses, Tell the children of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. If I were to go up into your midst for one moment, I would consume you. Therefore now, take off your jewelry from you, that I may know what to do to you. The children of Israel stripped themselves of their jewelry from Mount Horeb onward. The Tent of Meeting 
Now Moses used to take the tent and to pitch it outside the camp, far away from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. It happened that everyone who sought Yahweh went out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. It happened that when Moses went out to the tent, that all the people rose up and stood, everyone at their tent door, and watched Moses until he had gone into the tent. It happened when Moses entered into the tent that the pillar of cloud descended, stood at the door of the tent, and spoke with Moses. All the people saw the pillar of cloud stand at the door of the tent, and all the people rose up and worshipped, everyone at their tent door. Yahweh spoke to Moses face to face, as a man speaks to his friend. He turned again into the camp, but his servant, Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, didn't depart out of the tent. THE GLORY OF THE LORD Moses said to Yahweh, Behold, you tell me, bring up this people, and you haven't let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways, that I may know you so that I may find favor in your sight, and consider that this nation is your people. He said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. He said to him, If your presence doesn't go with me, don't carry us up from here. For how would people know that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Isn't it in that you go with us, so that we are separated? I and your people, from all the people who are on the surface of the earth? Yahweh said to Moses, I will do this thing also that you have spoken, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. He said, Please, show me your glory. He said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and will proclaim the name of Yahweh before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. He said, You cannot see my face, for man may not see me and live. Yahweh also said, Behold, there is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. It will happen while my glory passes by, that I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and will cover you with my hand, until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you will see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Chapter 34 The Tablets Are Replaced Yahweh said to Moses, Chisel two stone tablets like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. Be ready by the morning, and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai, and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you, Neither let anyone be seen throughout all the mountain. Neither let the flocks nor herds feed before that mountain. He chiseled two tablets of stone like the first, and Moses rose up early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai, as Yahweh had commanded him, and took in his hand two stone tablets. Yahweh descended in the cloud and stood with him there, and proclaimed the name of Yahweh. Yahweh passed by before him, and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh, a merciful and gracious God, slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness and truth, keeping loving kindness for thousands, forgiving iniquity and disobedience and sin, 
and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the children's children, on the third and on the fourth generation. Moses hurried and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. He said, If now I have found favor in your sight, Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us. Although this is a stiff-necked people, pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. The Lord renews the covenant. He said, Behold, I make a covenant. Before all your people I will do marvels, such as have not been worked in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among which you are shall see the work of Yahweh, for it is an awesome thing that I do with you. Observe that which I command you this day. Behold, I drive out before you the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Be careful lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where you are going, lest it be for a snare in the midst of you. But you shall break down their altars, and dash in pieces their pillars, and you shall cut down their asherim, for you shall worship no other god. For Yahweh, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. Don't make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, lest they play the prostitute after their gods, and sacrifice to their gods, and one call you, and you eat of his sacrifice, and you take of their daughters to your sons, and their daughters play the prostitute after their gods, and make your sons play the prostitute after their gods. You shall make no cast idols for yourselves, you shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, as I commanded you, at the time appointed in the month Ibib, for in the month Ibib you came out from Egypt. All that opens the womb is mine, and all your livestock that is male, the firstborn of cow and sheep, the firstborn of a donkey, you shall redeem with a lamb, and if you will not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. All the firstborn of your sons you shall redeem. No one shall appear before me empty. Six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. In plowing time and in harvest you shall rest. You shall observe the feast of weeks with the first fruits of wheat harvest and the feast of harvest at the year's end. Three times in the year all your males shall appear before the Lord Yahweh, the God of Israel. For I will drive out nations before you and enlarge your borders. Neither shall any man desire your land when you go up to appear before Yahweh your God, three times in the year. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread, neither shall the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover be left to the morning. You shall bring the first of the first fruits of your ground to the house of Yahweh, your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Yahweh said to Moses, Write you these words, for in accordance with these words I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. He was there with Yahweh forty days and forty nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water. He wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. The Radiant Face of Moses it happened when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mountain, 
that Moses didn't know that the skin of his face shone by reason of his speaking with him. When Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke to them. Afterward, all the children of Israel came near, and he gave them all of the commandments that Yahweh had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses was done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But when Moses went in before Yahweh to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. And he came out and spoke to the children of Israel that which he was commanded. The children of Israel saw Moses' face, that the skin of Moses' face shone. And Moses put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. Chapter 35 The Sabbath Moses assembled all the congregation of the children of Israel and said to them, These are the words which Yahweh has commanded that you should do them. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day there shall be a holy day for you, a Sabbath of solemn rest to Yahweh. Whoever does any work in it shall be put to death. You shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations on the Sabbath day. Materials for the Tabernacle Moses spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which Yahweh commanded, saying, Take from among you an offering to Yahweh. Whoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it, Yahweh's offering. Gold, silver, brass, blue, purple, scarlet, fine linen, goat's hair, ram's skins dyed red, sea cow hides, acacia wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil and for the sweet incense, onyx stones, and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastplate. The Skilled Tabernacle Workmen Let every wise-hearted man among you come and make all that Yahweh has commanded, the tabernacle, its outer covering, its roof, its clasps, its boards, its bars, its pillars, and its sockets, the ark and its poles, the mercy seat, the veil of the screen, the table with its poles and all its vessels, and the showbread, the lampstand also for the light, with its vessels, its lamps, and the oil for the light, and the altar of incense with its poles, the anointing oil, the sweet incense, the screen for the door at the door of the tabernacle, the altar of burnt offering with its grating of brass, its poles and all its vessels, the basin and its base, the hangings of the court, its pillars, their sockets, and the screen for the gate of the court, the pins of the tabernacle, the pins of the court and their cords, the finely worked garments for ministering in the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments of his sons to minister in the priest's office. The people offer gifts. All the congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. They came, every one whose heart stirred him up, and every one whom his spirit made willing, and brought Yahweh's offering for the work of the tent of meeting, and for all of its service, and for the holy garments. They came, both men and women, as many as were willing-hearted, and brought brooches, earrings, signet rings, and armlets, all jewels of gold, 
even every man who offered an offering of gold to Yahweh, everyone with whom was found blue, purple, scarlet, fine linen, goat's hair, ram's skins dyed red, and sea cow hides brought them. Everyone who did offer an offering of silver and brass brought Yahweh's offering. And everyone with whom was found acacia wood for any work of the service brought it. All the women who were wise-hearted spun with their hands and brought that which they had spun, the blue, the purple, the scarlet, and the fine linen. All the women whose hearts stirred them up in wisdom spun the goat's hair. The rulers brought the onyx stones and the stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastplate and the spice and the oil for the light, for the anointing oil and for the sweet incense. The children of Israel brought a freewill offering to Yahweh, every man and woman whose heart made them willing to bring for all the work which Yahweh had commanded to be made by Moses. Bezalel and Oholiab Moses said to the children of Israel, Behold, Yahweh has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. He has filled him with the Spirit of God, in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all kinds of workmanship, and to make skillful works, to work in gold, in silver, in brass, in cutting of stones for setting, and in carving of wood, to work in all kinds of skillful workmanship. He has put in his heart that he may teach, both he and Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan. He has filled them with wisdom of heart, to work all kinds of workmanship, of the engraver, of the skillful workman and of the embroiderer, in blue, in purple, in scarlet, and in fine linen, and of the weaver, even of those who do any workmanship, and of those who make skillful works. Chapter 36 The Tabernacle Underwritten Bezalel and Oholiab shall work with every wise-hearted man, in whom Yahweh has put wisdom and understanding, to know how to work all the work for the service of the sanctuary, according to all that Yahweh has commanded. Moses called Bezalel and Oholiab, and every wise-hearted man, in whose heart Yahweh had put wisdom, even every one whose heart stirred him up to come to the work to do it. And they received from Moses all the offering which the children of Israel had brought for the work of the service of the sanctuary with which to make it. They brought yet to him freewill offerings every morning. All the wise men who performed all the work of the sanctuary, each came from his work which they did. They spoke to Moses, saying, the people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which Yahweh commanded to make. Moses gave commandment, and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, Let neither man nor woman make anything else for the offering for the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing, for the stuff they had was sufficient for all the work to make it, and too much. The construction proceeds. All the wise-hearted men among those who did the work made the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twined linen, blue, purple, and scarlet, with cherubim, the work of the skillful workmen they made them. The length of each curtain was twenty-eight cubits, and the breadth of each curtain four cubits. All the curtains had one measure. He coupled five curtains to one another, and the other five curtains he coupled to one another. He made loops of blue on the edge of the one curtain, from the edge in the coupling. Likewise, he made in the edge of the curtain that was outmost in the second coupling. 
he made fifty loops in the one curtain, and he made fifty loops in the edge of the curtain that was in the second coupling. The loops were opposite one to another. He made fifty clasps of gold, and coupled the curtains one to another with the clasps, so the tabernacle was a unit. The Curtains of Goat's Hair He made curtains of goat's hair for a covering over the tabernacle. He made them eleven curtains. The length of each curtain was thirty cubits, and four cubits the breadth of each curtain. The eleven curtains had one measure. He coupled five curtains by themselves, and six curtains by themselves. He made fifty loops on the edge of the curtain that was outmost in the coupling. And he made fifty loops on the edge of the curtain which was outmost in the second coupling. He made fifty clasps of brass to couple the tent together, that it might be a unit. The Covering of Skins He made a covering for the tent of ram's skins dyed red and a covering of sea cow hides above. The Boards and Sockets He made the boards for the tabernacle of acacia wood, standing up. Ten cubits was the length of a board, and a cubit and a half the breadth of each board. Each board had two tenons, joined one to another. He made all the boards of the tabernacle this way, he made the boards for the tabernacle, twenty boards for the south side southward. He made forty sockets of silver under the twenty boards, two sockets under one board for its two tenons, and two sockets under another board for its two tenons. For the second side of the tabernacle, on the north side, he made twenty boards, and there forty sockets of silver, two sockets under one board, and two sockets under another board. For the far part of the tabernacle, westward, he made six boards. He made two boards for the corners of the tabernacle in the far part. They were doubled beneath, and in the same way they were all the way to its top, to one ring. He did thus to both of them in the two corners. There were eight boards, and their sockets of silver, sixteen sockets, under every board two sockets. The Bars He made bars of acacia wood, five for the boards of the one side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the boards of the other side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the boards of the tabernacle for the hinder part westward. He made the middle bar to pass through in the midst of the boards from the one end to the other. He overlaid the boards with gold, and made their rings of gold for places for the bars, and overlaid the bars with gold. The Veil He made the veil of blue, purple, scarlet, and fine twined linen, with cherubim. He made it the work of a skillful workman. He made four pillars of acacia for it, and overlaid them with gold. Their hooks were of gold. He cast four sockets of silver for them. The Curtain for the Door He made a screen for the door of the tent, of blue, purple, scarlet, and fine twined linen, the work of an embroiderer, and the five pillars of it with their hooks. He overlaid their capitals and their fillets with gold and their five sockets were of brass. Chapter 37 Constructing the Ark Bezalel made the ark of acacia wood. Its length was two and a half cubits, and its breadth a cubit and a half, and a cubit and a half its height. He overlaid it with pure gold, inside and outside, and made a molding of gold for it around it. He cast four rings of gold for it, in its four feet, even two rings on its one side and two rings on its other side. 
he made poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. He put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to bear the ark. He made a mercy seat of pure gold. Its length was two and a half cubits, and a cubit and a half its breadth. He made two cherubim of gold. He made them of beaten work at the two ends of the mercy seat, one cherub at the one end and one cherub at the other end. He made the cherubim of one piece with the mercy seat at its two ends. The cherubim spread out their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, with their faces toward one another. The faces of the cherubim were toward the mercy seat. The Table of Showbread He made the table of acacia wood. Its length was two cubits, and its breadth was a cubit, and its height was a cubit and a half. He overlaid it with pure gold and made a gold molding around it. He made a border of a handbreadth around it and made a golden molding on its border around it. He cast four rings of gold for it and put the rings in the four corners that were on its four feet. The rings were close by the border, the places for the poles to carry the table. He made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold to carry the table. He made the vessels which were on the table, its dishes, its spoons, its bowls, and its pitchers with which to pour out of pure gold. The Lampstand He made the lampstand of pure gold. He made the lampstand of beaten work, its base, its shaft, its cups, its buds, and its flowers were of one piece with it. There were six branches going out of its sides, three branches of the lampstand out of its one side, and three branches of the lampstand out of its other side, three cups made like almond blossoms in one branch, a bud and a flower, and three cups made like almond blossoms in the other branch, a bud and a flower. So for the six branches going out of the lampstand. In the lampstand were four cups made like almond blossoms, its buds and its flowers, and a bud under two branches of one piece with it, and a bud under two branches of one piece with it, and a bud under two branches of one piece with it, for the six branches going out of it. Their buds and their branches were of one piece with it. The whole thing was one beaten work of pure gold. He made its seven lamps and its snuffers and its snuff dishes of pure gold. He made it of a talent of pure gold with all its vessels. The Altar of Incense He made the altar of incense of acacia wood. It was square. Its length was a cubit, and its breadth a cubit. Its height was two cubits. Its horns were of one piece with it. He overlaid it with pure gold. Its top, its sides around it, and its horns. He made a gold molding around it. He made two golden rings for it under its molding crown, on its two ribs, on its two sides, for places for poles with which to carry it. He made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. He made the holy anointing oil and the pure incense of sweet spices after the art of the perfumer. Chapter 38 The Altar of Burnt Offerings he made the altar of burnt offering of acacia wood. It was square. Its length was five cubits. Its breadth was five cubits. And its height was three cubits. He made its horns on its four corners. Its horns were of one piece with it, and he overlaid it with brass. 
he made all the vessels of the altar, the pots, the shovels, the basins, the forks, and the firepans. He made all its vessels of brass. He made for the altar a grating of a network of brass, under the ledge around it beneath, reaching halfway up. He cast four rings for the four ends of brass grating, to be places for the poles. He made the poles of acacia wood, and overlaid them with brass. He put the poles into the rings on the sides of the altar, with which to carry it. He made it hollow with planks. The Bronze Basin he made the basin of brass and its base of brass out of the mirrors of the ministering women who ministered at the door of the tent of meeting. The Tabernacle Courtyard He made the court. For the south side, southward, the hangings of the court were of fine twined linen, one hundred cubits. Their pillars were twenty, and their sockets twenty, of brass. The hooks of the pillars and their fillets were of silver. For the north side, one hundred cubits, their pillars twenty, and their sockets twenty, of brass. The hooks of the pillars and their fillets of silver. For the west side were hangings of fifty cubits, their pillars ten, and their sockets ten. The hooks of the pillars and their fillets of silver. For the east side, eastward, fifty cubits. The hangings of the one side were fifteen cubits, their pillars three, and their sockets three, and so for the other side. On this hand and that hand by the gate of the court were hangings of fifteen cubits, their pillars three, and their sockets three. All the hangings around the court were of fine twined linen. The sockets for the pillars were of brass, the hooks of the pillars and their fillets were of silver, and the overlaying of their capitals of silver, and all the pillars of the court were filleted with silver. The screen for the gate of the court was the work of the embroiderer, of blue, purple, scarlet, and fine twined linen. Twenty cubits was the length, and the height in the breadth was five cubits, like to the hangings of the court, their pillars were four, and their sockets four, of brass, their hooks of silver, and the overlaying of their capitals and their fillets of silver. All the pins of the tabernacle and around the court were of brass. The Cost of the Tabernacle This is the amount of material used for the tabernacle, even the tabernacle of the testimony as they were counted, according to the commandment of Moses, for the service of the Levites, by the hand of Ithamar, the son of Aaron the priest. Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, made all that Yahweh commanded Moses. With him was Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan, an engraver and a skillful workman, and an embroiderer in blue, in purple, in scarlet, and in fine linen. All the gold that was used for the work and all the work of the sanctuary, even the gold of the offering, was twenty-nine talents and seven hundred thirty shekels, after the shekel of the sanctuary. The silver of those who were numbered of the congregation was one hundred talents and one thousand seven hundred seventy-five shekels, after the shekel of the sanctuary, a bekah a head, that is, half a shekel, after the shekel of the sanctuary, for every one who passed over to those who were numbered, from twenty years old and upward, for six hundred three thousand five hundred fifty men. The one hundred talents of silver were for casting the sockets of the sanctuary, and the sockets of the veil, one hundred sockets for the one hundred talents, a talent for a socket. Of the one thousand seven hundred seventy-five shekels, he made hooks for the pillars, overlaid their capitals, and made fillets for them. 
The brass of the offering was seventy talents and two thousand four hundred shekels. With this he made the sockets for the door of the tent of meeting, the bronze altar, the bronze grating for it, all the vessels of the altar, the sockets around the court, the sockets of the gate of the court, all the pins of the tabernacle, and all the pins around the court. Chapter 39 The Ephod Of the blue, purple, and scarlet they made finely worked garments for ministering in the holy place, and made the holy garments for Aaron, as Yahweh commanded Moses. He made the ephod of gold, blue, purple, scarlet, and fine twined linen. They beat the gold into thin plates and cut it into wires to work it in the blue, in the purple, in the scarlet, and in the fine linen, the work of the skillful workmen. They made shoulder straps for it, joined together. At the two ends it was joined together, the skillfully woven band that was on it, with which to fasten it on, was of the same piece, like its work, of gold, of blue, purple, scarlet, and fine twined linen, as Yahweh commanded Moses. They worked the onyx stones, enclosed in settings of gold, engraved with the engravings of a signet, according to the names of the children of Israel. He put them on the shoulder straps of the ephod to be stones of memorial for the children of Israel, as Yahweh commanded Moses. The Breast Piece He made the breastplate, the work of a skillful workman, like the work of the ephod, of gold, of blue, purple, scarlet, and fine twined linen. It was square. They made the breastplate double. Its length was a span, and its breadth was a span, being double. They set in it four rows of stones. A row of ruby, topaz, and beryl was the first row, and the second row a turquoise, a sapphire, and an emerald, and the third row a jacinth, an agate, and an amethyst, and the fourth row a chrysolite, an onyx, and a jasper. They were enclosed in gold settings. The stones were according to the names of the children of Israel, twelve, according to their names, like the engravings of a signet, everyone according to his name for the twelve tribes. They made on the breastplate chains, like cords, of braided work of pure gold, they made two settings of gold and two gold rings and put the two rings on the two ends of the breastplate. They put the two braided chains of gold in the two rings at the ends of the breastplate. The other two ends of the two braided chains they put on the two settings and put them on the shoulder straps of the ephod in its front. They made two rings of gold and put them on the two ends of the breastplate on its edge, which was toward the side of the ephod inward. They made two rings of gold and put them on the two shoulder straps of the ephod underneath, in its front, close by its coupling, above the skillfully woven band of the ephod. They bound the breastplate by its rings to the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue, that it might be on the skillfully woven band of the ephod, and that the breastplate might not come loose from the ephod, as Yahweh commanded Moses. Additional Priestly Garments He made the robe of the ephod of woven work, all of blue. The opening of the robe in its midst was like the opening of a coat of mail, with a binding around its opening, that it should not be torn. They made on the skirts of the robe pomegranates of blue, purple, scarlet, and twined linen. They made bales of pure gold and put the bales between the pomegranates around the skirts of the robe, between the pomegranates, a bale and a pomegranate, a bale and a pomegranate, around the skirts of the robe, 
to minister in, as Yahweh commanded Moses. They made the coats of fine linen of woven work for Aaron and for his sons, and the turban of fine linen, and the linen headbands of fine linen, and the linen breeches of fine twined linen, and the sash of fine twined linen, and blue and purple and scarlet, the work of the embroiderer, as Yahweh commanded Moses. They made the plate of the holy crown of pure gold, and wrote on it a writing, like the engravings of a signet, Holy to Yahweh. They tied to it a lace of blue, to fasten it on the turban above, as Yahweh commanded Moses. Moses approves the work. Thus all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting was finished. The children of Israel did according to all that Yahweh commanded Moses, so they did. They brought the tabernacle to Moses, the tent, with all its furniture, its clasps, its boards, its bars, its pillars, its sockets, the covering of ram's skins dyed red, the covering of sea cow hides, the veil of the screen, the ark of the testimony with its poles, the mercy seat, the table, all its vessels, the showbread, the pure lampstand, its lamps, even the lamps to be set in order, all its vessels, the oil for the light, the golden altar, the anointing oil, the sweet incense, the screen for the door of the tent, the bronze altar, its grating of brass, its poles, all of its vessels, the basin and its base, the hangings of the court, its pillars, its sockets, the screen for the gate of the court, its cords, its pins, all the instruments of the service of the tabernacle for the tent of meeting, the finely worked garments for ministering in the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments of his sons to minister in the priest's office. According to all that Yahweh commanded Moses, so the children of Israel did all the work. Moses saw all the work, and behold, they had done it as Yahweh had commanded. Even so had they done it. And Moses blessed them. Chapter 40 The Tabernacle Set Up Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, On the first day of the first month you shall raise up the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. You shall put the ark of the testimony in it, and you shall screen the ark with the veil. You shall bring in the table, and set in order the things that are on it. You shall bring in the lampstand, and light its lamps. You shall set the golden altar for incense before the ark of the testimony, and put the screen of the door to the tabernacle. You shall set the altar of burnt offering before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. You shall set the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar, and shall put water therein. You shall set up the court around it, and hang up the screen of the gate of the court. You shall take the anointing oil, and anoint the tabernacle, and all that is in it, and shall make it holy, and all its furniture, and it will be holy. You shall anoint the altar of burnt offering, with all its vessels, and sanctify the altar, and the altar will be most holy. You shall anoint the basin and its base, and sanctify it. You shall bring Aaron and his sons to the door of the tent of meeting, and shall wash them with water. You shall put on Aaron the holy garments, and you shall anoint him, and sanctify him that he may minister to me in the priest's office. You shall bring his sons and put coats on them. You shall anoint them as you anointed their father, 
that they may minister to me in the priest's office. Their anointing shall be to them for an everlasting priesthood throughout their generations. Moses did so. According to all that Yahweh commanded him, so he did. It happened in the first month, in the second year, on the first day of the month, that the tabernacle was raised up. Moses raised up the tabernacle and laid its sockets and set up its boards and put in its bars and raised up its pillars. He spread the covering over the tent and put the roof of the tabernacle above on it, as Yahweh commanded Moses. He took and put the testimony into the ark, and set the poles on the ark, and put the mercy seat above on the ark. He brought the ark into the tabernacle, and set up the veil of the screen, and screened the ark of the testimony, as Yahweh commanded Moses. He put the table in the tent of meeting, on the side of the tabernacle northward, outside of the veil. He set the bread in order on it before Yahweh, as Yahweh commanded Moses. He put the lampstand in the tent of meeting, opposite the table, on the side of the tabernacle southward. He lit the lamps before Yahweh, as Yahweh commanded Moses. He put the golden altar in the tent of meeting before the veil, and he burnt incense of sweet spices on it, as Yahweh commanded Moses. He put up the screen of the door to the tabernacle. He set the altar of burnt offering at the door of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting, and offered on it the burnt offering and the meal offering, as Yahweh commanded Moses. He set the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar, and put water therein with which to wash. Moses, Aaron, and his sons washed their hands and their feet there when they went into the tent of meeting, and when they came near to the altar, they washed, as Yahweh commanded Moses. He raised up the court around the tabernacle and the altar and set up the screen of the gate of the court. So Moses finished the work. The Glory of the Lord then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of Yahweh filled the tabernacle. Moses wasn't able to enter into the tent of meeting because the cloud stayed on it, and Yahweh's glory filled the tabernacle. When the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward throughout all their journeys. But if the cloud wasn't taken up, then they didn't travel until the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of Yahweh was on the tabernacle by day, and there was fire in the cloud by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. End of Section 8 Leviticus Chapter 1 Laws for Burnt Offerings Yahweh called to Moses and spoke to him out of the tent of meeting, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and tell them, When any one of you offers an offering to Yahweh, you shall offer your offering of the livestock, from the herd and from the flock. If his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it at the door of the tent of meeting, that he may be accepted before Yahweh. He shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. He shall kill the bull before Yahweh, Aaron's sons, the priests, shall present the blood and sprinkle the blood around on the altar that is at the door of the tent of meeting. He shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. The sons of Aaron, the priest, shall put fire on the altar. 
and lay wood in order on the fire. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall lay the pieces, the head, and the fat in order on the wood that is on the fire which is on the altar. But its innards and its legs he shall wash with water. The priest shall burn the whole on the altar for a burnt offering, an offering made by fire of a pleasant aroma to Yahweh. If his offering is from the flock, from the sheep, or from the goats, for a burnt offering, he shall offer a male without blemish. He shall kill it on the north side of the altar before Yahweh. Aaron's sons, the priests, shall sprinkle its blood around on the altar. He shall cut it into its pieces with its head and its fat. The priests shall lay them in order on the wood that is on the fire which is on the altar. But the innards and the legs he shall wash with water. The priest shall offer the whole and burn it on the altar. It is a burnt offering, an offering made by fire of a pleasant aroma to Yahweh. If his offering to Yahweh is a burnt offering of birds, then he shall offer his offering of turtle doves or of young pigeons. The priest shall bring it to the altar and wring off its head and burn it on the altar, and its blood shall be drained out on the side of the altar, and he shall take away its crop with its filth and cast it beside the altar on the east part in the place of the ashes. He shall tear it by its wings, but shall not divide it apart. The priest shall burn it on the altar, on the wood that is on the fire. It is a burnt offering, an offering made by fire, of a pleasant aroma to Yahweh. Chapter 2 Laws for Grain Offerings when anyone offers an offering of a meal offering to Yahweh, his offering shall be a fine flour, and he shall pour oil on it and put frankincense on it. He shall bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests, and he shall take his handful of its fine flour and of its oil with all its frankincense, and the priest shall burn its memorial on the altar, an offering made by fire of a pleasant aroma to Yahweh. That which is left of the meal offering shall be Aaron's and his son's. It is a most holy thing of the offerings of Yahweh made by fire. When you offer an offering of a meal offering baked in the oven, it shall be unleavened cakes of fine flour mixed with oil, or unleavened wafers anointed with oil. If your offering is a meal offering of the griddle, it shall be of unleavened fine flour mixed with oil. You shall cut it in pieces and pour oil on it. It is a meal offering. If your offering is a meal offering of the pan, it shall be made of fine flour with oil. You shall bring the meal offering that is made of these things to Yahweh, and it shall be presented to the priest, and he shall bring it to the altar. The priest shall take from the meal offering its memorial, and shall burn it on the altar, an offering made by fire of a pleasant aroma to Yahweh. That which is left of the meal offering shall be Aaron's and his son's. It is a thing most holy of the offerings of Yahweh made by fire. No meal offering which you shall offer to Yahweh shall be made with yeast. For you shall burn no yeast nor any honey as an offering made by fire to Yahweh. As an offering of first fruits, you shall offer them to Yahweh. 
but they shall not ascend for a pleasant aroma on the altar. Every offering of your meal offering you shall season with salt. Neither shall you allow the salt of the covenant of your God to be lacking from your meal offering. With all your offerings you shall offer salt. If you offer a meal offering of first fruits to Yahweh, you shall offer for the meal offering of your first fruits grain in the ear, parched with fire, bruised grain of the fresh ear. You shall put oil on it and lay frankincense on it. It is a meal offering. The priest shall burn as its memorial part of its bruised grain and part of its oil, along with all its frankincense. It is an offering made by fire to Yahweh. Chapter 3 Laws for Peace Offerings If his offering is a sacrifice of peace offerings, if he offers it from the herd, whether male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before Yahweh. He shall lay his hand on the head of his offering, and kill it at the door of the tent of meeting. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall sprinkle the blood around on the altar. He shall offer of the sacrifice of peace offerings an offering made by fire to Yahweh. The fat that covers the innards, and all the fat that is on the innards, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is on them, which is by the loins, and the cover on the liver, with the kidneys, he shall take away. Aaron's sons shall burn it on the altar, on the burnt offering, which is on the wood, that is on the fire. It is an offering made by fire, of a pleasant aroma, to Yahweh. If his offering for a sacrifice of peace offerings to Yahweh is from the flock, male or female, he shall offer it without blemish. If he offers a lamb for his offering, then he shall offer it before Yahweh, and he shall lay his hand on the head of his offering, and kill it before the tent of meeting. And Aaron's sons shall sprinkle its blood around on the altar. He shall offer from the sacrifice of peace offerings an offering made by fire to Yahweh. Its fat, the entire tail fat, he shall take away close to the backbone. And the fat that covers the inwards, and all the fat that is on the inwards, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is on them, which is by the loins, and the cover on the liver, with the kidneys, he shall take away. The priest shall burn it on the altar. It is the food of the offering made by fire to Yahweh. If his offering is a goat, then he shall offer it before Yahweh, and he shall lay his hand on its head and kill it before the tent of meeting. And the sons of Aaron shall sprinkle its blood around on the altar. He shall offer from it as his offering, an offering made by fire to Yahweh, the fat that covers the innards, and all the fat that is on the innards, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is on them, which is by the loins, and the cover on the liver, with the kidneys, he shall take away. The priest shall burn them on the altar. It is the food of the offering made by fire for a pleasant aroma. All the fat is Yahweh's. It shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations and all your dwellings that you shall eat neither fat nor blood. Chapter 4 Laws for Sin Offerings Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, 
If anyone sins unintentionally in any of the things which Yahweh has commanded not to be done, and does any one of them, if the anointed priest sins so as to bring guilt on the people, then let him offer for his sin, which he has sinned, a young bull without blemish to Yahweh for a sin offering. He shall bring the bull to the door of the tent of meeting before Yahweh, and he shall lay his hand on the head of the bull, and kill the bull before Yahweh. The anointed priest shall take some of the blood of the bull, and bring it to the tent of meeting. The priest shall dip his finger in the blood, and sprinkle some of the blood seven times before Yahweh before the veil of the sanctuary. The priest shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar of sweet incense before Yahweh, which is in the tent of meeting, and he shall pour out all of the rest of the blood of the bull at the base of the altar of burnt offering, which is at the door of the tent of meeting. He shall take all the fat of the bull of the sin offering off of it, the fat that covers the innards, and all the fat that is on the innards, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is on them, which is by the loins, and the cover on the liver, with the kidneys, he shall take away. As it is taken off of the bull of the sacrifice of peace offerings, the priest shall burn them on the altar of burnt offering. The bull's skin, all its flesh, with its head, and with its legs, its innards, and its dung, even the whole bull shall he carry forth outside the camp to a clean place where the ashes are poured out, and burn it on wood with fire. Where the ashes are poured out, it shall be burned. If the whole congregation of Israel sins, and the thing is hidden from the eyes of the assembly, and they have done any of the things which Yahweh has commanded not to be done, and are guilty. When the sin in which they have sinned is known, then the assembly shall offer a young bull for a sin offering, and bring it before the tent of meeting. The elders of the congregation shall lay their hands on the head of the bull before Yahweh, and the bull shall be killed before Yahweh. The anointed priest shall bring of the blood of the bull to the tent of meeting, and the priest shall dip his finger in the blood, and sprinkle it seven times before Yahweh, before the veil. He shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar, which is before Yahweh, that is in the tent of meeting and the rest of the blood he shall pour out at the base of the altar of burnt offering, which is at the door of the tent of meeting. All its fat he shall take from it, and burn it on the altar. Thus shall he do with the bull, as he did with the bull of the sin offering, so shall he do with this. And the priest shall make atonement for them, and they shall be forgiven. He shall carry forth the bull outside the camp, and burn it as he burned the first bull. It is the sin offering for the assembly. When a ruler sins, and unwittingly does any one of all the things which Yahweh his God has commanded not be done, and is guilty, if his sin, in which he has sinned, is made known to him, he shall bring as his offering a goat, a male without blemish. He shall lay his hand on the head of the goat, and kill it in the place where they kill the burnt offering before Yahweh. It is a sin offering. The priest shall take some of the blood of the sin offering with his finger, and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering. He shall pour out the rest of its blood at the base of the altar of burnt offering. All its fat he shall burn on the altar, like the fat of the sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall make atonement for him concerning his sin, and he will be forgiven. 
If any one of the common people sins unwittingly in doing any of the things which Yahweh has commanded not to be done, and is guilty, if his sin which he has sinned is made known to him, then he shall bring for his offering a goat, a female without blemish, for his sin which he has sinned. He shall lay his hand on the head of the sin offering, and kill the sin offering in the place of burnt offering. The priest shall take some of its blood with his finger, and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering, and the rest of its blood he shall pour out at the base of the altar. All its fat he shall take away, like the fat is taken away from off of the sacrifice of peace offerings, and the priest shall burn it on the altar for a pleasant aroma to Yahweh. And the priest shall make atonement for him, and he will be forgiven. If he brings a lamb as his offering for a sin offering, he shall bring a female without blemish. He shall lay his hand on the head of the sin offering, and kill it for a sin offering, in the place where they kill the burnt offering. The priest shall take some of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering, and all the rest of its blood he shall pour out at the base of the altar. All its fat he shall take away, like the fat of the lamb is taken away from the sacrifice of peace offerings, and the priest shall burn them on the altar, on the offerings of Yahweh made by fire and the priest shall make atonement for him concerning his sin that he has sinned, and he will be forgiven. Chapter 5 Sins Requiring a Sin Offering If anyone sins, in that he hears the voice of adjuration, he being a witness, whether he has seen or known, if he doesn't report it, then he shall bear his iniquity. Or if anyone touches any unclean thing, whether it is the carcass of an unclean animal, or the carcass of unclean livestock, or the carcass of unclean creeping things, and it is hidden from him, and he is unclean, then he shall be guilty. Or if he touches the uncleanness of man, whatever his uncleanness is with which he is unclean, and it is hidden from him, when he knows of it, then he shall be guilty. Or if anyone swears rashly with his lips to do evil, or to do good, whatever it is that a man might utter rashly with an oath, and it is hidden from him, when he knows of it, then he shall be guilty of one of these. It shall be, when he is guilty of one of these, he shall confess that in which he has sinned, and he shall bring his trespass offering to Yahweh, for his sin which he has sinned, a female from the flock, a lamb or a goat, for a sin offering and the priest shall make atonement for him concerning his sin. If he can't afford a lamb, then he shall bring his trespass offering for that in which he has sinned, two turtle doves, or two young pigeons, to Yahweh, one for a sin offering, and the other for a burnt offering. He shall bring them to the priest, who shall first offer the one which is for the sin offering, and wring off its head from its neck, but shall not sever it completely. He shall sprinkle some of the blood of the sin offering on the side of the altar, and the rest of the blood shall be drained out at the base of the altar. It is a sin offering. He shall offer the second for a burnt offering, according to the ordinance, and the priest shall make atonement for him concerning his sin, which he has sinned, and he shall be forgiven. But if he can't afford two turtle doves, 
or two young pigeons. Then he shall bring his offering for that in which he has sinned, the tenth part of an ephah of fine flour for a sin offering. He shall put no oil on it, neither shall he put any frankincense on it, for it is a sin offering. He shall bring it to the priest, and the priest shall take his handful of it as the memorial portion, and burn it on the altar, on the offerings of Yahweh made by fire. It is a sin offering. The priest shall make atonement for him concerning his sin that he has sinned in any of these things, and he will be forgiven, and the rest shall be the priests as the meal offering. Laws for Guilt Offerings Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, If anyone commits a trespass and sins unwittingly in the holy things of Yahweh, then he shall bring his trespass offering to Yahweh, a ram without blemish from the flock, according to your estimation, in silver by shekels, after the shekel of the sanctuary, for a trespass offering. He shall make restitution for that which he has done wrong in the holy thing, and shall add a fifth part to it, and give it to the priest, and the priest shall make atonement for him with the ram of the trespass offering, and he will be forgiven. If anyone sins, and does any of the things which Yahweh has commanded not to be done, though he didn't know it, yet he is guilty, and shall bear his iniquity. He shall bring a ram without blemish from of the flock, according to your estimation, for a trespass offering to the priest, and the priest shall make atonement for him concerning the thing in which he sinned and didn't know it, and he will be forgiven. It is a trespass offering. He is certainly guilty before Yahweh. Chapter 6 Sins Requiring a Guilt Offering Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, If anyone sins and commits a trespass against Yahweh and deals falsely with his neighbor in a matter of deposit or of bargain or of robbery or has oppressed his neighbor, or has found that which was lost, and dealt falsely therein, and swearing to a lie, in any of all these things that a man does, sinning therein, then it shall be, if he has sinned, and is guilty, he shall restore that which he took by robbery, or the thing which he has gotten by oppression, or the deposit which was committed to him, or the lost thing which he found, or anything about which he has sworn falsely, he shall restore it even in full, and shall add a fifth part more to it. To him to whom it belongs, he shall give it, in the day of his being found guilty. He shall bring his trespass offering to Yahweh, a ram without blemish from the flock, according to your estimation for a trespass offering to the priest. The priest shall make atonement for him before Yahweh, and he will be forgiven concerning whatever he does to become guilty. The Burnt Offering Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Command Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the law of the burnt offering. The burnt offering shall be on the hearth, on the altar, all night, until the morning, and the fire of the altar shall be kept burning on it. The priest shall put on his linen garment, and he shall put on his linen breeches upon his body, and he shall remove the ashes from where the fire has consumed the burnt offering on the altar, and he shall put them beside the altar. He shall take off his garments, and put on other garments, and carry the ashes outside the camp 
to a clean place. The fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not go out, and the priest shall burn wood on it every morning, and he shall lay the burnt offering in order upon it, and shall burn on it the fat of the peace offerings. Fire shall be kept burning on the altar continually. It shall not go out. THE GRAIN OFFERING This is the law of the meal offering. The sons of Aaron shall offer it before Yahweh, before the altar. He shall take from there his handful of the fine flour of the meal offering, and of its oil, and all the frankincense which is on the meal offering, and shall burn it on the altar for a pleasant aroma, as its memorial to Yahweh. That which is left of it, Aaron and his sons shall eat. It shall be eaten without yeast in a holy place. They shall eat it in the court of the tent of meeting. It shall not be baked with yeast. I have given it as their portion of my offerings made by fire. It is most holy as the sin offering and as the trespass offering. Every male among the children of Aaron shall eat of it, as their portion forever throughout their generations, from the offerings of Yahweh made by fire. Whoever touches them shall be holy. Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, This is the offering of Aaron and of his sons, which they shall offer to Yahweh, in the day when he is anointed, the tenth part of an ephah of fine flour for a meal offering perpetually, half of it in the morning, and half of it in the evening. It shall be made with oil in a griddle. When it is soaked, you shall bring it in. You shall offer the meal offering in baked pieces for a pleasant aroma to Yahweh. The anointed priest that will be in his place from among his sons shall offer it. By a statute forever, it shall be wholly burnt to Yahweh. Every meal offering of a priest shall be wholly burned. It shall not be eaten. The Sin Offering Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, This is the law of the sin offering. In the place where the burnt offering is killed, the sin offering shall be killed before Yahweh. It is most holy. The priest who offers it for sin shall eat it. It shall be eaten in a holy place, in the court of the tent of meeting. Whatever shall touch its flesh shall be holy. When there is any of its blood sprinkled on a garment, you shall wash that on which it was sprinkled in a holy place. But the earthen vessel in which it is boiled shall be broken, and if it is boiled in a bronze vessel, it shall be scoured and rinsed in water. Every male among the priests shall eat of it, it is most holy. No sin offering of which any of the blood is brought into the tent of meeting to make atonement in the holy place shall be eaten. It shall be burned with fire. Chapter 7 The Guilt Offering This is the law of the trespass offering. It is most holy. In the place where they kill the burnt offering, he shall kill the trespass offering, and its blood he shall sprinkle around on the altar. He shall offer all of its fat, the fat tail, and the fat that covers the innards, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is on them, which is by the loins, and the cover on the liver, with the kidneys, shall he take away, and the priest shall burn them on the altar for an offering made by fire to Yahweh. It is a trespass offering. 
every male among the priests may eat of it. It shall be eaten in a holy place. It is most holy. As is the sin offering, so is the trespass offering. There is one law for them. The priest who makes atonement with them shall have it. The priest who offers any man's burnt offering, even the priest shall have for himself the skin of the burnt offering which he has offered. Every meal offering that is baked in the oven, and all that is dressed in the pan and on the griddle, shall be the priest's who offers it. Every meal offering, mixed with oil or dry, belongs to all the sons of Aaron, one as well as another. The Peace Offering This is the law of the sacrifice of peace offerings, which one shall offer to Yahweh. If he offers it for a thanksgiving, then he shall offer with the sacrifice of thanksgiving unleavened cakes mixed with oil, and unleavened wafers anointed with oil, and cakes mixed with oil. With cakes of leavened bread he shall offer his offering with the sacrifice of his peace offerings for thanksgiving. Of it he shall offer one out of each offering for a heave offering to Yahweh. It shall be the priests who sprinkles the blood of the peace offerings. The flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offerings for thanksgiving shall be eaten on the day of his offering. He shall not leave any of it until the morning. But if the sacrifice of his offering is a vow or a free will offering, it shall be eaten on the day that he offers his sacrifice and on the next day what remains of it shall be eaten. But what remains of the flesh of the sacrifice on the third day shall be burned with fire. If any of the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offerings is eaten on the third day, it will not be accepted. Neither shall it be imputed to him who offers it. It will be an abomination and the soul who eats any of it will bear his iniquity. The flesh that touches any unclean thing shall not be eaten. It shall be burned with fire. As for the flesh, every one who is clean may eat it. But the soul who eats of the flesh of the sacrifice of peace offerings that belongs to Yahweh, having his uncleanness on him, that soul shall be cut off from his people. When anyone touches any unclean thing, the uncleanness of man, or an unclean animal, or any unclean abomination, and eats some of the flesh of the sacrifice of peace offerings which belong to Yahweh, that soul shall be cut off from his people. Fat and Blood Forbidden. Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, You shall eat no fat of bull, or sheep, or goat, the fat of that which dies of itself, and the fat of that which is torn of animals, may be used for any other service, but you shall in no way eat of it. For whoever eats the fat of the animal, of which men offer an offering made by fire to Yahweh, even the soul who eats it shall be cut off from his people. You shall not eat any blood, whether it is of bird or of animal, in any of your dwellings. Whoever it is who eats any blood, that soul shall be cut off from his people. THE PRIEST'S PORTION Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, He who offers the sacrifice of his peace offerings to Yahweh 
shall bring his offering to Yahweh out of the sacrifice of his peace offerings. With his own hands he shall bring the offerings of Yahweh made by fire. He shall bring the fat with the breast, that the breast may be waved for a wave offering before Yahweh. The priest shall burn the fat on the altar, but the breast shall be Aaron's and his son's. The right thigh you shall give to the priest for a heave offering out of the sacrifices of your peace offerings. He among the sons of Aaron, who offers the blood of the peace offerings and the fat, shall have the right thigh for a portion. For the waved breast and the heaved thigh I have taken from the children of Israel out of the sacrifices of their peace offerings, and have given them to Aaron the priest and to his sons as their portion forever from the children of Israel. This is the anointing portion of Aaron and the anointing portion of his sons out of the offerings of Yahweh made by fire in the day when he presented them to minister to Yahweh in the priest's office, which Yahweh commanded to be given them of the children of Israel, in the day that he anointed them. It is their portion forever throughout their generations. This is the law of the burnt offering, of the meal offering, and of the sin offering, and of the trespass offering, and of the consecration and of the sacrifice of peace offerings, which Yahweh commanded Moses in Mount Sinai, in the day that he commanded the children of Israel to offer their offerings to Yahweh in the wilderness of Sinai. Chapter 8 Moses Consecrates Aaron and His Sons Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garments, and the anointing oil, and the bull of the sin offering, and the two rams, and the basket of unleavened bread, and assemble all the congregation at the door of the tent of meeting. Moses did as Yahweh commanded him, and the congregation was assembled at the door of the tent of meeting. Moses said to the congregation, This is the thing which Yahweh has commanded to be done. Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. He put the coat on him, tied the sash on him, clothed him with the robe, put the ephod on him, and he tied the skillfully woven band of the ephod on him and fastened it to him with it. He placed the breastplate on him, and in the breastplate he put the Urim and the Thummim. He set the turban on his head, and on the turban, in front, he set the golden plate, the holy crown, as Yahweh commanded Moses. Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was in it, and sanctified them. He sprinkled it on the altar seven times, and anointed the altar and all its vessels, and the basin and its base to sanctify them. He poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to sanctify him. Moses brought Aaron's sons and clothed them with coats and tied sashes on them and put headbands on them, as Yahweh commanded Moses. The Priest's Sin Offering he brought the bull of the sin offering, and Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the bull of the sin offering. He killed it, and Moses took the blood and put it around on the horns of the altar with his finger and purified the altar and poured out the blood at the base of the altar and sanctified it to make atonement for it. He took all the fat that was on the innards and the cover of the liver and the two kidneys and their fat, and Moses burned it on the altar. But the bull, and its skin, and its flesh, and its dung, he burned with fire outside the camp, as Yahweh commanded Moses. 
the priest's burnt offering. He presented the ram of the burnt offering, and Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the ram. He killed it, and Moses sprinkled the blood around on the altar. He cut the ram into its pieces, and Moses burned the head and the pieces and the fat. He washed the innards and the legs with water, and Moses burned the whole ram on the altar. It was a burnt offering for a pleasant aroma. It was an offering made by fire to Yahweh, as Yahweh commanded Moses. The Ram of Consecration He presented the other ram, the ram of consecration, and Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the ram. He killed it, and Moses took some of its blood, and put it on the tip of Aaron's right ear, and on the thumb of his right hand, and on the great toe of his right foot. He brought Aaron's sons, and Moses put some of the blood on the tip of their right ear, and on the thumb of their right hand, and on the great toe of their right foot. And Moses sprinkled the blood around on the altar. He took the fat, and the fat tail, and all the fat that was on the innards, and the cover of the liver, and the two kidneys, and their fat, and the right thigh. And out of the basket of unleavened bread that was before Yahweh, he took one unleavened cake, and one cake of oiled bread, and one wafer, and placed them on the fat, and on the right thigh. He put all these in Aaron's hands, and in his son's hands, and waved them for a wave offering before Yahweh. Moses took them from their hands and burned them on the altar on the burnt offering. They were a consecration for a pleasant aroma. It was an offering made by fire to Yahweh. Moses took the breast and waved it for a wave offering before Yahweh. It was Moses' portion of the ram of consecration, as Yahweh commanded Moses. Moses took some of the anointing oil and some of the blood which was on the altar, and sprinkled it on Aaron, on his garments, and on his sons, and on his sons' garments with him, and sanctified Aaron, his garments, and his sons, and his sons' garments with him. Moses said to Aaron and to his sons, Boil the flesh at the door of the tent of meeting, and there eat it, and the bread that is in the basket of consecration, as I commanded, saying, Aaron and his sons shall eat it. What remains of the flesh and of the bread you shall burn with fire. You shall not go out from the door of the tent of meeting seven days, until the days of your consecration are fulfilled, for he shall consecrate you seven days. What has been done this day, so Yahweh has commanded to do, to make atonement for you. You shall stay at the door of the tent of meeting day and night seven days, and keep Yahweh's command that you don't die, for so I am commanded. Aaron and his sons did all the things which Yahweh commanded by Moses. Chapter 9 The First Offerings of Aaron It happened on the eighth day that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel, and he said to Aaron, Take a calf from the herd for a sin offering, and a ram for a burnt offering, without blemish, and offer them before Yahweh. You shall speak to the children of Israel, saying, Take a male goat for a sin offering, and a calf and a lamb, both a year old, without blemish, for a burnt offering, and a bull and a ram for peace offerings, to sacrifice before Yahweh, and a meal offering mixed with oil, for today Yahweh appears to you. They brought what Moses commanded before the tent of meeting, and all the congregation drew near and stood before Yahweh. Moses said, This is the thing which Yahweh commanded that you should do, and the glory of Yahweh shall appear to you. Moses said to Aaron, Draw near to the altar, and offer your sin offering, and your burnt offering, 
and make atonement for yourself and for the people, and offer the offering of the people, and make atonement for them, as Yahweh commanded. The Sin Offering So Aaron drew near to the altar, and killed the calf of the sin offering, which was for himself. The sons of Aaron presented the blood to him, and he dipped his finger in the blood, and put it on the horns of the altar, and poured out the blood at the base of the altar. But the fat, and the kidneys, and the cover from the liver of the sin offering, he burned upon the altar, as Yahweh commanded Moses. The flesh and the skin he burned with fire outside the camp. The Burnt Offering He killed the burnt offering, and Aaron's sons delivered the blood to him, and he sprinkled it around on the altar. They delivered the burnt offering to him, piece by piece, and the head, and he burned them upon the altar. He washed the innards and the legs, and burned them on the burnt offering on the altar. The Offerings for the People He presented the people's offering, and took the goat of the sin offering which was for the people, and killed it, and offered it for sin, like the first. He presented the burnt offering, and offered it according to the ordinance. He presented the meal offering, and filled his hand from there, and burned it upon the altar, besides the burnt offering of the morning. He also killed the bull and the ram, the sacrifice of peace offerings, which was for the people. And Aaron's sons delivered to him the blood, which he sprinkled around on the altar, and the fat of the bull and of the ram, the fat tail, and that which covers the innards, and the kidneys, and the cover of the liver. And they put the fat upon the breasts, and he burned the fat on the altar. And the breasts and the right thigh Aaron waved for a wave offering before Yahweh, as Moses commanded. Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them. And he came down from offering the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings. Moses and Aaron blessed the people. Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting and came out and blessed the people. And the glory of Yahweh appeared to all the people. There came forth fire from before Yahweh and consumed the burnt offering and the fat upon the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. Chapter 10 The Sin of Nadab and Abihu Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered strange fire before Yahweh, which he had not commanded them. And fire came forth from before Yahweh and devoured them and they died before Yahweh. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what Yahweh spoke of, saying, I will show myself holy to those who come near me, and before all the people I will be glorified. Aaron held his peace. Moses called Mishael and Elzaphan, the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said to them, Draw near, carry your brothers from before the sanctuary out of the camp. So they drew near and carried them in their coats out of the camp, as Moses had said. Moses said to Aaron and to Eleazar and to Ithamar his sons, Don't let the hair of your heads go loose, neither tear your clothes, that you don't die, and that he not be angry with all the congregation. But let your brothers the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning which Yahweh has kindled. You shall not go out from the door of the tent of meeting, lest you die, for the anointing oil of Yahweh is on you. They did according to the word of Moses. Restrictions for Priests 
Yahweh spoke to Aaron, saying, Drink no wine, nor strong drink, you nor your sons with you, when you go into the tent of meeting, that you don't die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, and that you are to make a distinction between the holy and the common, and between the unclean and the clean, and that you are to teach the children of Israel all the statutes which Yahweh has spoken to them by Moses. Moses spoke to Aaron and to Eleazar and to Ithamar, his sons who were left. Take the meal offering that remains of the offerings of Yahweh made by fire, and eat it without yeast beside the altar, for it is most holy. And you shall eat it in a holy place, because it is your portion and your son's portion of the offerings of Yahweh made by fire. For so I am commanded, the waved breast and the heaved thigh you shall eat in a clean place, you and your sons and your daughters with you, for they are given as your portion and your son's portion out of the sacrifices of the peace offerings of the children of Israel. The heaved thigh and the waved breast they shall bring with the offerings made by fire of the fat to wave it for a wave offering before Yahweh, and it shall be yours and your sons with you as a portion forever, as Yahweh has commanded. Moses diligently inquired about the goat of the sin offering, and behold, it was burned. And he was angry with Eleazar and with Ithamar, the sons of Aaron who were left, saying, Why haven't you eaten the sin offering in the place of the sanctuary, since it is most holy? and he has given it you to bear the iniquity of the congregation, to make atonement for them before Yahweh. Behold, its blood was not brought into the inner part of the sanctuary. You certainly should have eaten it in the sanctuary as I commanded. Aaron spoke to Moses, Behold, this day they have offered their sin offering and their burnt offering before Yahweh, and such things as these have happened to me. And if I had eaten the sin offering today, would it have been pleasing in the sight of Yahweh? When Moses heard that, it was pleasing in his sight. Chapter 11 Clean and Unclean Animals Yahweh spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying to them, Speak to the children of Israel saying, These are the living things which you may eat among all the animals that are on the earth. Whatever parts the hoof, and is cloven-footed, and chews the cud among the animals, that you may eat. Nevertheless, these you shall not eat of those that chew the cud, or of those who part the hoof. The camel, because he chews the cud, but doesn't have a parted hoof. He is unclean to you. The coney, because he chews the cud, but doesn't have a parted hoof. He is unclean to you. The hare, because she chews the cud, but doesn't part the hoof. She is unclean to you. The pig, because he has a split hoof and is cloven-footed but doesn't chew the cud, he is unclean to you. Of their flesh you shall not eat, and their carcasses you shall not touch. They are unclean to you. These you may eat of all that are in the waters. Whatever has fins and scales in the waters, in the seas and in the rivers, that you may eat. All that don't have fins and scales in the seas and in the rivers, of all that move in the waters, and of all the living creatures that are in the waters, they are an abomination to you, and you detest them. You shall not eat of their flesh, and you shall detest their carcasses. Whatever has no fins nor scales in the waters, that is an abomination to you. 
These you shall detest among the birds. They shall not be eaten. They are an abomination. The eagle, and the vulture, and the black vulture, and the red kite, any kind of black kite, any kind of raven, the horned owl, the screech owl, and the gull, any kind of hawk, the little owl, the cormorant, the great owl, the white owl, the desert owl, the osprey, the stork, any kind of heron, the hoopoe, and the bat, all flying insects that walk on all fours are an abomination to you, yet you may eat these. Of all winged creeping things that go on all fours, which have legs above their feet, with which to hop on the earth, even of these you may eat, any kind of locust, any kind of katydid, any kind of cricket, and any kind of grasshopper. But all winged creeping things which have four feet are an abomination to you. By these you will become unclean. Whoever touches the carcass of them shall be unclean until the evening. Whoever carries any part of their carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the evening. Every animal which parts the hoof and is not cloven-footed, nor chews the cud, is unclean to you. Everyone who touches them shall be unclean. Whatever goes on its paws, among all animals that go on all fours, they are unclean to you. Whoever touches their carcass shall be unclean until the evening. He who carries their carcass shall wash his clothes, and be unclean until the evening. They are unclean to you. These are they which are unclean to you among the creeping things that creep on the earth, the weasel, the rat, any kind of great lizard, the gecko and the monitor lizard, the wall lizard, the skink and the chameleon. These are they which are unclean to you among all that creep. Whoever touches them when they are dead shall be unclean until the evening. On whatever any of them falls when they are dead, it shall be unclean. Whether it is any vessel of wood or clothing or skin or sack, whatever vessel it is with which any work is done, it must be put into water, and it shall be unclean until the evening. Then it will be clean. Every earthen vessel into which any of them falls, all that is in it shall be unclean, and you shall break it. All food which may be eaten, that on which water comes, shall be unclean and all drink that may be drunk in every such vessel shall be unclean. Everything whereupon part of their carcass falls shall be unclean. Whether oven or range for pots, it shall be broken in pieces. They are unclean and shall be unclean to you. Nevertheless, a spring or a cistern in which water is gathered shall be clean, but that which touches their carcass shall be unclean. If part of their carcass falls on any sowing seed which is to be sown, it is clean, but if water is put on the seed and part of their carcass falls on it, it is unclean to you. If any animal of which you may eat dies, he who touches its carcass shall be unclean until the evening. He who eats of its carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the evening. He also who carries its carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the evening. Every creeping thing that creeps on the earth is an abomination. It shall not be eaten.
whatever goes on its belly, and whatever goes on all fours, or whatever has many feet, even all creeping things that creep on the earth, them you shall not eat, for they are an abomination. You shall not make yourselves abominable with any creeping thing that creeps, neither shall you make yourselves unclean with them, that you should be defiled thereby. For I am Yahweh your God. Sanctify yourselves therefore and be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any kind of creeping thing that moves on the earth. For I am Yahweh who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. This is the law of the animal and of the bird and of every living creature that moves in the waters, and of every creature that creeps on the earth, to make a distinction between the unclean and the clean, and between the living thing that may be eaten, and the living thing that may not be eaten. Chapter 12 Purification After Childbirth Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, If a woman conceives and bears a male child, then she shall be unclean seven days, as in the days of her monthly period she shall be unclean. In the eighth day the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. She shall continue in the blood of purification Thirty-three days. She shall not touch any holy thing, nor come into the sanctuary, until the days of her purifying are completed. But if she bears a female child, then she shall be unclean two weeks, as in her period. And she shall continue in the blood of purification sixty-six days. When the days of her purification are completed, for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring to the priest at the door of the tent of meeting a year-old lamb for a burnt offering, and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering. And he shall offer it before Yahweh and make atonement for her, and she shall be cleansed from the fountain of her blood. This is the law for her who bears whether a male or a female. If she cannot afford a lamb, then she shall take two turtle doves or two young pigeons, the one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. And the priest shall make atonement for her, and she shall be clean. End of section 9 Chapter 13 Laws About Leprosy Yahweh spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, When a man shall have a rising in his body's skin, or a scab, or a bright spot, and it becomes in the skin of his body the plague of leprosy, then he shall be brought to Aaron the priest, or to one of his sons, the priests. And the priest shall examine the plague in the skin of the body. And if the hair in the plague has turned white, and the appearance of the plague is deeper than the body's skin, it is the plague of leprosy. And the priest shall examine him, and pronounce him unclean. If the bright spot is white, in the skin of his body, and its appearance isn't deeper than the skin, and its hair hasn't turned white, then the priest shall isolate the infected person for seven days. The priest shall examine him on the seventh day, and, behold, if in his eyes the plague is arrested, and the plague 
hasn't spread in the skin. Then the priest shall oscillate him for seven more days. The priest shall examine him again on the seventh day. And behold, if the plague has faded, and the plague hasn't spread in the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him clean. It is a scab. He shall wash his clothes and be clean. But if the scab spreads on the skin, after he has shown himself to the priest for his cleansing, he shall show himself to the priest again. The priest shall examine him. And behold, if the scab has spread on the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is leprosy. When the plague of leprosy is in a man, then he shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall examine him. Behold, if there is a white rising in the skin, and it has turned the hair white, and there is raw flesh in the rising, it is a chronic leprosy in the skin of his body, and the priest shall pronounce him unclean. He shall not isolate him, for he is unclean. If the leprosy breaks out all over the skin, and the leprosy covers all the skin of the infected person, from his head even to his feet, as far as it appears to the priest, then the priest shall examine him. And, behold, if the leprosy has covered all his flesh, he shall pronounce him clean of the plague. It has all turned white. He is clean. But whenever raw flesh appears in him, he shall be unclean. The priest shall examine the raw flesh and pronounce him unclean. The raw flesh is unclean. It is leprosy. Or, if the raw flesh turns again, and is changed to white. Then he shall come to the priest, and the priest shall examine him. And, behold, if the plague has turned white, then the priest shall pronounce him clean of the plague. He is clean. When the body has a boil on its skin, and it has healed, and in the place of the boil there is a white rising, or a bright spot, reddish-white. Then it shall be shown to the priest, and the priest shall examine it. And behold, if its appearance is lower than the skin, and its hair has turned white, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is the plague of leprosy. It has broken out in the boil. But if the priest examines it, and, behold, there are no white hairs in it, and it isn't deeper than the skin, but is dim, then the priest shall isolate him seven days. If it spreads in the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is a plague. But if the bright spot stays in its place, and hasn't spread. It is the scar from the boil, and the priest shall pronounce him clean. Or, when the body has a burn from fire on its skin, and the raw flesh of the burn becomes a bright spot, reddish-white or white, then the priest shall examine it. And behold, if the hair in the bright spot has turned white, and its appearance is deeper than the skin. It is leprosy. It has broken out in the burning, and the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is the plague of leprosy. But if the priest examines it, and, behold, there is no white hair in the bright spot, and it isn't lower than the skin, but is faded, then the priest shall isolate him seven days. The priest shall examine him on the seventh day, 
if it has spread in the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is the plague of leprosy. If the bright spot stays in its place and hasn't spread in the skin, but is faded, it is the swelling from the burn, and the priest shall pronounce him clean, for it is the scar from the burn. When a man or a woman has a plague on the head or on the beard, then the priest shall examine the plague, and behold, if its appearance is deeper than the skin, and the hair in it is yellow and thin, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is an itch. It is leprosy of the head or of the beard. If the priest examines the plague of itching, and behold, its appearance isn't deeper than the skin, and there is no black hair in it, then the priest shall isolate him, the person infected with itching, seven days. On the seventh day, the priest shall examine the plague. And behold, if the itch hasn't spread, and there is no yellow hair in it, and the appearance of the itch isn't deeper than the skin, then he shall be shaved, but he shall not shave the itch. And the priest shall shut him up, who has the itch, seven more days. On the seventh day, the priest shall examine the itch. And behold, if the itch hasn't spread in the skin, and its appearance isn't deeper than the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him clean. He shall wash his clothes and be clean. But if the itch spreads in the skin after his cleansing, then the priest shall examine him. And behold, if the itch has spread in the skin, the priest shall not look for the yellow hair. He is unclean. But if in his eyes the itch is arrested and black hair has grown in it, the itch is healed. He is clean the priest shall pronounce him clean. When a man or a woman has bright spots in the skin of the body, even white bright spots, then the priest shall examine them. And behold, if the bright spots on the skin of their body are a dull white, it is a harmless rash. It has broken out in the skin. He is clean. If a man's hair has fallen from his head, he is bald. He is clean. If his hair has fallen off from the front part of his head, he is forehead bald. He is clean. But if there is in the bald head or the bald forehead a reddish-white plague it is leprosy breaking out in his bald head or his bald forehead. Then the priest shall examine him, and, behold, if the rising of the plague is reddish-white in his bald head or in his bald forehead, like the appearance of leprosy in the skin of the flesh, he is a leprous man. He is unclean the priest shall surely pronounce him unclean. His plague is on his head. The leper in whom the plague is shall wear torn clothes, and the hair of his head shall hang loose. He shall cover his upper lip, and shall cry, Unclean! Unclean! All the days in which the plague is in him, he shall be unclean. He is unclean. He shall dwell alone. Outside of the camp shall be his dwelling. Mildewed Clothing The garment also that the plague of leprosy is in, whether it is a woolen garment or a linen garment, whether it is in warp or woof, of linen 
or of wool, whether in a skin or in anything made of skin. If the plague is greenish or reddish in the garment or in the skin or in the warp or in the woof or in anything made of skin, it is the plague of leprosy and shall be shown to the priest. The priest shall examine the plague and isolate the plague seven days. He shall examine the plague on the seventh day. If the plague has spread in the garment, either in the warp or in the woof or in the skin, whatever use the skin is used for, the plague is a destructive mildew. It is unclean. He shall burn the garment, whether the warp or the woof, in wool or in linen, or anything of skin in which the plague is. For it is a destructive mildew. It shall be burned in the fire. If the priest examines it, and, behold, the plague hasn't spread in the garment, either in the warp or in the woof, or in anything of skin, then the priest shall command that they wash the thing in which the plague is, and he shall isolate it seven more days. Then the priest shall examine it, after the plague is washed. And behold, if the plague hasn't changed its color, and the plague hasn't spread, it is unclean. You shall burn it in the fire. It is a mildewed spot, whether the bareness is inside or outside. If the priest looks, and behold, the plague has faded after it is washed, then he shall tear it out of the garment, or out of the skin, or out of the warp, or out of the woof. And if it appears again in the garment, either in the warp or in the woof, or in anything of skin. It is spreading. You shall burn with fire that in which the plague is, the garment, either the warp or the woof, or whatever thing of skin it is, which you shall wash. If the plague has departed from them, then it shall be washed the second time, and it will be clean. This is the law of the plague of mildew in a garment of wool or linen, either in the warp or the woof, or in anything of skin, to pronounce it clean or to pronounce it unclean. Chapter 14 Cleansing the Leper Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, this shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go forth out of the camp. The priest shall examine him, and behold, if the plague of leprosy is healed in the leper, then the priest shall command them to take for him who is to be cleansed two living clean birds and cedar wood, and scarlet, and hyssop. The priest shall command them to kill one of the birds in an earthen vessel over running water. As for the living bird, he shall take it, and the cedar wood, and the scarlet, and the hyssop, and shall dip them and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. He shall sprinkle on him who is to be cleansed from the leprosy seven times, and shall pronounce him clean, and shall let the living bird go into the open field. He who is to be cleansed shall wash his clothes, and shave off all his hair, and bathe himself in water, and he shall be clean. After that, he shall come into the camp, but shall dwell outside his tent seven days. It shall be on the seventh day that he shall shave all his hair off his head, and his beard, and his eyebrows, 
even all his hair he shall shave off. He shall wash his clothes, and he shall bathe his body in water. Then he shall be clean. On the eighth day he shall take two male lambs without blemish, and one ewe lamb, a year old, without blemish, and three-tenths of an ephah of fine flour for a meal offering, mingled with oil and one log of oil. The priest who cleanses him shall set the man who is to be cleansed and those things before Yahweh at the door of the tent of meeting. The priest shall take one of the male lambs and offer him for a trespass offering with the log of oil and wave them for a wave offering before Yahweh. He shall kill the male lamb in the place where they kill the sin offering and the burnt offering, in the place of the sanctuary. For as the sin offering is the priest's, so is the trespass offering. It is most holy. The priest shall take some of the blood of the trespass offering, and the priest shall put it on the tip of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed, and on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot. The priest shall take some of the log of oil, and pour it into the palm of his own left hand. The priest shall dip his right finger in the oil that is in his left hand, and shall sprinkle some of the oil with his finger seven times before Yahweh. The priest shall put some of the rest of the oil that is in his hand on the tip of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed, and on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot, upon the blood of the trespass offering. The rest of the oil that is in the priest's hand he shall put on the head of him who is to be cleansed, and the priest shall make atonement for him before Yahweh. The priest shall offer the sin offering, and make atonement for him who is to be cleansed, because of his uncleanness. And afterward he shall kill the burnt offering, and the priest shall offer the burnt offering and the meal offering on the altar. The priest shall make atonement for him, and he shall be clean. If he is poor, and can't afford so much, then he shall take one male lamb for a trespass offering to be waved, to make atonement for him, and one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour mingled with oil, for a meal offering, and a log of oil, and two turtle doves, or two young pigeons, such as he is able to afford and the one shall be a sin offering, and the other a burnt offering. On the eighth day he shall bring them for his cleansing to the priest, to the door of the tent of meeting, before Yahweh. The priest shall take the lamb of the trespass offering, and the log of oil, and the priest shall wave them for a wave offering before Yahweh. He shall kill the lamb of the trespass offering. The priest shall take some of the blood of the trespass offering and put it on the tip of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed and on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot. The priest shall pour some of the oil into the palm of his own left hand and the priest shall sprinkle with his right finger some of the oil that is in his left hand seven times before Yahweh. Then the priest shall put some of the oil that is in his hand on the tip of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed, and on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot, on the place of the blood of the trespass offering. The rest of the oil that is in the priest's hand he shall put on the head of him who is to be cleansed, to make atonement for him before Yahweh. 
he shall offer one of the turtle doves or of the young pigeons, such as he is able to afford. Even such as he is able to afford, the one for a sin offering, and the other for a burnt offering, with the meal offering. The priest shall make atonement for him who is to be cleansed before Yahweh. This is the law for him in whom is the plague of leprosy, who is not able to afford the sacrifice for his cleansing. Signs of Home Contamination Yahweh spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, When you have come into the land of Canaan, which I give to you for a possession, and I put a spreading mildew in a house in the land of your possession, then he who owns the house shall come and tell the priest, saying, There seems to me to be some sort of plague in the house. The priest shall command that they empty the house before the priest goes in to examine the plague, that all that is in the house not be made unclean. And afterward, the priest shall go in to inspect the house. He shall examine the plague, and behold, if the plague is in the walls of the house with hollow streaks, greenish or reddish, and it appears to be deeper than the wall, then the priest shall go out of the house to the door of the house, and shut up the house seven days. The priest shall come again on the seventh day, and look. If the plague has spread in the walls of the house, then the priest shall command that they take out the stones in which is the plague, and cast them into an unclean place outside of the city and he shall cause the inside of the house to be scraped all over, and they shall pour out the mortar that they scraped off outside of the city into an unclean place. They shall take other stones and put them in the place of those stones, and he shall take other mortar and shall plaster the house. If the plague comes again and breaks out in the house, after he has taken out the stones, and after he has scraped the house, and after it was plastered, then the priest shall come in and look. And behold, if the plague has spread in the house, it is a destructive mildew in the house. It is unclean. He shall break down the house, its stones, and its timber, and all the house's mortar, he shall carry them out of the city into an unclean place. Moreover, he who goes into the house while it is shut up shall be unclean until the evening. He who lies down in the house shall wash his clothes, and he who eats in the house shall wash his clothes. Cleansing a Home if the priest shall come in and examine it, and behold, the plague hasn't spread in the house after the house was plastered, then the priest shall pronounce the house clean, because the plague is healed. To cleanse the house, he shall take two birds, and cedar wood, and scarlet, and hyssop, he shall kill one of the birds in an earthen vessel over running water. He shall take the cedar wood, and the hyssop, and the scarlet, and the living bird, and dip them in the blood of the slain bird, and in the running water, and sprinkle the house seven times. He shall cleanse the house with the blood of the bird, and with the running water, with the living bird, with the cedar wood, with the hyssop, and with the scarlet. But he shall let the living bird go out of the city into the open field. So shall he make atonement for the house, and it shall be clean. This is the law for any plague of leprosy, and for an itch, and for the destructive mildew of a garment, and for a house, and for a rising, and for a scab, 
and for a bright spot, to teach when it is unclean and when it is clean. This is the law of leprosy. Chapter 15 The Uncleanness of Men Yahweh spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and tell them, When any man has a discharge from his body, because of his discharge he is unclean, this shall be his uncleanness in his discharge, whether his body runs with his discharge, or his body has stopped from his discharge. It is his uncleanness. Every bed whereon he who has the discharge lies shall be unclean, and everything he sits on shall be unclean. Whoever touches his bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. He who sits on anything whereon the man who has the discharge set shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. He who touches the body of him who has the discharge shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the evening. If he who has the discharge spits on him who is clean, then he shall wash his clothes, and bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the evening. Whatever saddle he who has the discharge rides on shall be unclean. Whoever touches anything that was under him shall be unclean until the evening. He who carries those things shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. Whoever he who has the discharge touches without having rinsed his hands in water, he shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the evening. The earthen vessel, which he who has the discharge touches, shall be broken, and every vessel of wood shall be rinsed in water. The Cleansing of Men When he who has a discharge is cleansed of his discharge, then he shall count to himself seven days for his cleansing, and wash his clothes, and he shall bathe his flesh in running water, and shall be clean. On the eighth day he shall take two turtle doves, or two young pigeons, and come before Yahweh to the door of the tent of meeting, and give them to the priest and the priest shall offer them, the one for a sin offering, and the other for a burnt offering. The priest shall make atonement for him before Yahweh for his discharge. If any man has an emission of semen, then he shall bathe all his flesh in water, and be unclean until the evening. Every garment and every skin whereon the semen is, shall be washed with water, and be unclean until the evening. If a man lies with a woman, and there is an emission of semen, they shall both bathe themselves in water, and be unclean until the evening. The Uncleanness of Women if a woman has a discharge, and her discharge in her flesh is blood, she shall be in her impurity seven days, and whoever touches her shall be unclean until the evening. Everything that she lies on in her impurity shall be unclean. Everything also that she sits on shall be unclean. 
whoever touches her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening whoever touches anything that she sits on shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening if it is on the bed or on anything whereon she sits when he touches it he shall be unclean until the evening if any man lies with her and her monthly flow is on him he shall be unclean seven days and every bed whereon he lies shall be unclean if a woman has a discharge of her blood many days not in the time of her period or if she has a discharge beyond the time of her period all the days of the discharge of her uncleanness shall be as in the days of her period she is unclean every bed whereon she lies all the days of her discharge shall be to her as the bed of her period and everything whereon she sits shall be unclean as the uncleanness of her period whoever touches these things shall be unclean and shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening the cleansing of women but if she is cleansed of her discharge then she shall count to herself seven days and after that she shall be clean on the eighth day she shall take two turtle doves or two young pigeons and bring them to the priest to the door of the tent of meeting the priest shall offer the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering and the priest shall make atonement for her before yahweh for the uncleanness of her discharge thus you shall separate the children of israel from their uncleanness so they will not die in their uncleanness when they defile my tabernacle that is in their midst this is the law of him who has a discharge and of him who has an emission of semen so that he is unclean thereby and of her who has her period and of a man or woman who has a discharge and of him who lies with her who is unclean chapter 16 the law of atonement yahweh spoke to moses after the death of the two sons of aaron when they drew near before yahweh and died and yahweh said to moses tell aaron your brother not to come at all times into the most holy place within the veil before the mercy seat which is on the ark lest he die for i will appear in the cloud on the mercy seat herewith shall aaron come into the sanctuary with a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering he shall put on the holy linen coat and he shall have the linen breeches on his body and shall put on the linen sash and he shall be clothed with the linen turban they are the holy garments he shall bathe his body in water and put them on he shall take from the congregation of the children of israel two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering aaron shall offer the bull of the sin offering which is for himself and make atonement for himself and for his house he shall take the two goats and set them before yahweh at the door of the tent of meeting aaron shall cast lots for the two goats one lot for yahweh and the other lot for the scapegoat aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell for yahweh and offer him 
for a sin offering. But the goat, on which the lot fell for the scapegoat, shall be presented alive before Yahweh, to make atonement for him, to send him away for the scapegoat into the wilderness. The Sin Offering for the Priest Aaron shall present the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself, and shall make atonement for himself and for his house, and shall kill the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself. He shall take a censer full of coals of fire from off the altar before Yahweh, and two handfuls of sweet incense beaten small, and bring it within the veil. And he shall put the incense on the fire before Yahweh, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony, so that he will not die. He shall take some of the blood of the bull, and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east, and before the mercy seat he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. The Sin Offering for the People Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, that is for the people, and bring his blood within the veil, and do with his blood as he did with the blood of the bull, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat and he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions, even all their sins. And so he shall do for the tent of meeting that dwells with them in the midst of their uncleanness. No one shall be in the tent of meeting when he enters to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out and has made atonement for himself and for his household and for all the assembly of Israel. He shall go out to the altar that is before Yahweh and make atonement for it and shall take some of the bull's blood and some of the goat's blood and put it around on the horns of the altar. He shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times, and cleanse it, and make it holy from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. The Scapegoat When he has made an end of atoning for the holy place, the tent of meeting, and the altar, he shall present the live goat. Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel, and all their transgressions, even all their sins. And he shall put them on the head of the goat, and shall send him away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. The goat shall carry all their iniquities on himself to a solitary land, and he shall let the goat go in the wilderness. Aaron shall come into the tent of meeting, and shall take off the linen garments, which he put on when he went into the holy place, and shall leave them there. Then he shall bathe himself in water in a holy place, and put on his garments, and come out and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people and make atonement for himself and for the people. The fat of the sin offering he shall burn on the altar. He who lets the goat go for the scapegoat shall wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in water, and afterward he shall come into the camp. The bull for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in, to make atonement in the holy place, shall be carried forth outside the camp, and they shall burn their skins, their flesh, and their dung with fire. 
He who burns them shall wash his clothes, and bathe his flesh in water, and afterward he shall come into the camp. THE DAY OF ATONEMENT It shall be a statute to you forever. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls, and shall do no kind of work, the native-born, or the stranger who lives as a foreigner among you. For on this day shall atonement be made for you, to cleanse you from all your sins, you shall be clean before Yahweh. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest to you, and you shall afflict your souls. It is a statute forever. The priest who is anointed and who is consecrated to be priest in his father's place shall make the atonement and shall put on the linen garments, even the holy garments. Then he shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make atonement for the tent of meeting, and for the altar, and he shall make atonement for the priests, and for all the people of the assembly. This shall be an everlasting statute for you, to make atonement for the children of Israel once in the year because of all their sins. It was done as Yahweh commanded Moses. Chapter 17 The Place of Sacrifice Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his sons and to all the children of Israel, and say to them, this is the thing which Yahweh has commanded. Whatever man there is of the house of Israel, who kills a bull, or lamb, or goat, in the camp, or who kills it outside the camp, and hasn't brought it to the door of the tent of meeting, to offer it as an offering to Yahweh, before the tabernacle of Yahweh, Blood shall be imputed to that man. He has shed blood, and that man shall be cut off from among his people. This is to the end that the children of Israel may bring their sacrifices, which they sacrifice in the open field, that they may bring them to Yahweh, to the door of the tent of meeting, to the priest, and sacrifice them for sacrifices of peace offerings to Yahweh. The priest shall sprinkle the blood on the altar of Yahweh at the door of the tent of meeting, and burn the fat for a pleasant aroma to Yahweh. They shall no more sacrifice their sacrifices to the goat idols, after which they play the prostitute. This shall be a statute forever to them throughout their generations. You shall say to them, Any man there is of the house of Israel, or of the strangers who live as foreigners among them, who offers a burnt offering or sacrifice, and doesn't bring it to the door of the tent of meeting to sacrifice it to Yahweh, that man shall be cut off from his people. Eating of blood forbidden. Any man of the house of Israel, or of the strangers who live as foreigners among them, who eats any kind of blood, I will set my face against that soul who eats blood, and will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by reason of the life. Therefore, I have said to the children of Israel, No person among you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger who lives as a foreigner among you eat blood. Whatever man there is of the children of Israel or of the strangers who live as foreigners among them, 
who takes in hunting any animal or bird that may be eaten. He shall pour out its blood and cover it with dust. For as to the life of all flesh, its blood is with its life. Therefore I said to the children of Israel, You shall not eat the blood of any kind of flesh, for the life of all flesh is its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off. Every person that eats what dies of itself, or that which is torn by animals, whether he is native-born or a foreigner, he shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. Then he shall be clean. But if he doesn't wash them or bathe his flesh, then he shall bear his iniquity. Chapter 18 Unlawful Sexual Relations Yahweh said to Moses, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, I am Yahweh your God. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt, where you lived. And you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan, where I am bringing you. Neither shall you walk in their statutes. You shall do my ordinances, and you shall keep my statutes, and walk in them. I am Yahweh your God. You shall, therefore, keep my statutes and my ordinances, which, if a man does, he shall live in them. I am Yahweh. None of you shall approach anyone who are his close relatives to uncover their nakedness. I am Yahweh. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father, nor the nakedness of your mother. She is your mother. You shall not uncover her nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife. It is your father's nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your sister, the daughter of your father, or the daughter of your mother, whether born at home or born abroad. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your son's daughter, or of your daughter's daughter, even their nakedness. For theirs is your own nakedness, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife's daughter, conceived by your father, since she is your sister. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's sister. She is your father's near kinswoman. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your mother's sister, for she is your mother's near kinswoman. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's brother, you shall not approach his wife. She is your aunt. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your daughter-in-law. She is your son's wife. You shall not uncover her nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your brother's wife. It is your brother's nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of a woman and her daughter. You shall not take her son's daughter, or her daughter's daughter, to uncover her nakedness. They are near kinswomen. It is wickedness. You shall not take a wife to her sister, to be a rival, to uncover her nakedness, while her sister is yet alive. You shall not approach a woman to uncover her nakedness, as long as she is impure by her uncleanness. You shall not lie carnally with your neighbor's wife and defile yourself with her. You shall not give any of your children to sacrifice to Molech. Neither shall you profane the name of your God. I am Yahweh. You shall not lie with a man as with a woman. 
That is detestable. You shall not lie with any animal to defile yourself with it. Neither shall any woman give herself to an animal to lie down with it. It is a perversion. Don't defile yourselves in any of these things. For in all these, the nations which I am casting out before you were defiled. The land was defiled. Therefore, I punish its iniquity. And the land vomited out her inhabitants. You, therefore, shall keep my statutes and my ordinances, and shall not do any of these abominations, neither the native-born nor the stranger who lives as a foreigner among you. For all these abominations have the men of the land done that were before you, and the land became defiled. That the land not vomit you out also when you defile it, as it vomited out the nation that was before you. For whoever shall do any of these abominations, even the souls that do them, shall be cut off from among their people. Therefore, you shall keep my requirements that you do not practice any of these abominable customs which were practiced before you, and that you do not defile yourselves with them. I am Yahweh, your God. Chapter 19 Idolatry Forbidden Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel, and tell them, You shall be holy, for I, Yahweh your God am holy. Each one of you shall respect his mother and his father. You shall keep my Sabbaths. I am Yahweh your God. Don't turn to idols, nor make molten gods for yourselves. I am Yahweh your God. When you offer a sacrifice of peace offerings to Yahweh, you shall offer it so that you may be accepted. It shall be eaten the same day you offer it, and on the next day. And if anything remains until the third day, it shall be burned with fire. If it is eaten at all on the third day, it is an abomination. It will not be accepted. But everyone who eats it shall bear his iniquity, because he has profaned the holy thing of Yahweh, and that soul shall be cut off from his people. Love your neighbor. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field, neither shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall not glean your vineyard, neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the foreigner. I am Yahweh your God. You shall not steal. You shall not lie. You shall not deceive one another. You shall not swear by my name falsely and profane the name of your God. I am Yahweh. You shall not oppress your neighbor nor rob him. The wages of a hired servant shall not remain with you all night until the morning. You shall not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear your God. I am Yahweh. You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor show favoritism to the great. 
but you shall judge your neighbor in righteousness. You shall not go up and down as a slanderer among your people. You shall not endanger the life of your neighbor. I am Yahweh. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yahweh. Keep my decrees. You shall keep my statutes. You shall not cross-breed different kinds of animals. You shall not sow your field with two kinds of seed. Neither shall there come upon you a garment made of two kinds of material. If a man lies carnally with a woman who is a slave girl, pledged to be married to another man and not ransomed or given her freedom, they shall be punished. They shall not be put to death, because she was not free. He shall bring his trespass offering to Yahweh, to the door of the tent of meeting, even a ram for a trespass offering. The priest shall make atonement for him with the ram of the trespass offering before Yahweh, for his sin which he has committed. And the sin which he has committed shall be forgiven him. When you come into the land, and have planted all kinds of trees for food, then you shall count their fruit as forbidden. Three years shall they be forbidden to you. It shall not be eaten. But in the fourth year, all its fruit shall be holy, for giving praise to Yahweh. In the fifth year you shall eat its fruit, that it may yield its increase to you. I am Yahweh, your God. You shall not eat any meat with the blood still in it. Neither shall you use enchantments, nor practice sorcery. You shall not cut the hair on the sides of your heads. Neither shall you clip off the edge of your beard. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor tattoo any marks on you. I am Yahweh. Don't profane your daughter to make her a prostitute, lest the land fall to prostitution and the land become full of wickedness. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am Yahweh. Don't turn to those who are mediums, nor to the wizards. Don't seek them out to be defiled by them. I am Yahweh, your God. You shall rise up before the gray head, and honor the face of an old man, and you shall fear your God. I am Yahweh. If a stranger lives as a foreigner with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. The stranger who lives as a foreigner with you shall be to you as the native born among you and you shall love him as yourself. For you lived as foreigners in the land of Egypt. I am Yahweh, your God. You shall do no unrighteousness in judgment, in measures of length, of weight, or of quantity. You shall have just balances, just weights, a just ephah, and a just hen. I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. You shall observe all my statutes and all my ordinances 
and do them. I am Yahweh. Chapter 20 Punishments for Disobedience Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Moreover, you shall tell the children of Israel, Any one of the children of Israel, or of the strangers who live as foreigners in Israel, who gives any of his seed to Molech, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. I also will set my face against that person, and will cut him off from among his people, because he has given of his seed to Molech, to defile my sanctuary, and to profane my holy name. If the people of the land all hide their eyes from that person, when he gives of his seed to Molech, and don't put him to death, then I will set my face against that man, and against his family, and will cut him off, and all who play the prostitute after him, to play the prostitute with Molech from among their people. The person that turns to those who are mediums, and to the wizards, to play the prostitute after them, I will even set my face against that person, and will cut him off from among his people. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am Yahweh your God. You shall keep my statutes and do them. I am Yahweh who sanctifies you. For everyone who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. He has cursed his father or his mother. His blood shall be upon him. Punishments for Sexual Immorality the man who commits adultery with another man's wife, even he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. The man who lies with his father's wife has uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. If a man lies with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have committed a perversion. Their blood shall be upon them. If a man lies with a male, as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination they shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. If a man takes a wife and her mother, it is wickedness. They shall be burned with fire, both he and they, that there be no wickedness among you. If a man lies with an animal, he shall surely be put to death and you shall kill the animal. If a woman approaches any animal and lies down with it, you shall kill the woman and the animal. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. If a man takes his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, and sees her nakedness, and she sees his nakedness. It is a shameful thing, and they shall be cut off in the sight of the children of their people. He has uncovered his sister's nakedness. He shall bear his iniquity. If a man lies with a woman having her monthly period, and uncovers her nakedness, he has made naked her fountain, 
and she has uncovered the fountain of her blood. And both of them shall be cut off from among their people. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your mother's sister, nor of your father's sister, for he has made naked his close relative. They shall bear their iniquity. If a man lies with his uncle's wife, he has uncovered his uncle's nakedness. They shall bear their sin. They shall die childless. If a man takes his brother's wife, it is an impurity. He has uncovered his brother's nakedness. They shall be childless. Keep all my decrees. You shall, therefore, keep all my statutes and all my ordinances, and do them, that the land where I am bringing you to dwell may not vomit you out. You shall not walk in the customs of the nation which I am casting out before you, for they did all these things, and therefore I abhorred them. But I have said to you, You shall inherit their land, and I will give it to you to possess it, a land flowing with milk and honey. I am Yahweh, your God, who has separated you from the peoples. You shall, therefore, make a distinction between the clean animal and the unclean and between the unclean fowl and the clean. And you shall not make yourselves abominable by animal or by bird or by anything with which the ground teems, which I have separated from you as unclean for you. You shall be holy to me, for I, Yahweh, am holy and have set you apart from the peoples, that you should be mine. A man or a woman that is a medium or is a wizard shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. End of Section 10